Uh, very good morning to everyone. Uh, this is Anushma from the team of organizers of National Online Training Program on Conservation, Management and Utilization of Horticulture Genetic Resources for Livelihood and Nutritional Security. We are on the third day of this five days training program now. We hope that the lectures were very much beneficial to you and we profusely thank all of you for your kind support and cooperation in the smooth conduct of this program. Today, we will be listening to 10 more interesting lectures like on pollen cryopreservation, chemical perspectives in HGRs, exploration, seed conservation, virus indexing, genomics in HGR, etc. Now I would request Dr. P. E. Rajshekaran, our beloved course leader, to start today's session with his lecture on the topic on pollen cryopreservation. Sir, please. Good morning, everybody. Thanks to Anushma and uh, I will be, for the next uh, half an hour, I will be talking on the pollen crop preservation. And uh, introduction, I already, in the introductory lecture, I already uh, told about this uh, pollen crop preservation. For the last 36 years, uh, we have been uh, involved in the pollen crop preservation and we established leadership in this uh, area. And I would like to share uh, our experience with you in this uh, area of uh, pollen crop preservation. In this lecture, I would like to cover the following. Uh, I would like to cover the following. Uh, some of you may not be knowing what is uh, crop preservation and uh, uh, pollen crop preservation, what is the methodology and logistics we uh, follow. And uh, I'll be showing some of the protocols developed in different uh, horticultural crops. Then we did the uh, technology transfer in the pollen crop preservation for some of the seed companies. And I will be showing some uh, case studies on how we developed the uh, protocols for uh, pollen crop preservation. As uh, all of you know, you can see the, uh, you know, pollen is a crucial stage of the plant life that without pollen, there will not be any seed. And uh, uh, Sheila McCormick, uh, one of the celebrated uh, authority on uh, uh, male gamete fight. Uh, she, in one of her uh, <clears throat> publication, uh, has shown uh, the beauty of the pollen. You can see on the left side and on the right side. Uh, uh, also, you can see the beauty of the uh, pollen. One of the Australian uh, uh, plant biologists, uh, Professor Bruce Knox, is having an opinion that uh, our knowledge of uh, pollen, the gold dust that carries the male germline of flowering plants is vital for sexual reproduction and seed formation as come of an age. Means uh, we have now a lot of information on the male gametophyte uh, that is uh, on pollen. Now, coming to the definition of cryo preservation, cryo preservation is defined as a viable freezing of uh, biological material and their subsequent storage at ultra low temperature. The advantage of cryo preservation is whatever you uh, cryo preserve, it will remain as such for an indefinite period. We call it as a suspended animation. And for this purpose, we use uh, liquid nitrogen and the temperature is minus 196 degrees centigrade. Why liquid nitrogen? Because the nitrogen is inert and the availability of uh, nitrogen in atmosphere is 78%. Uh, and uh, you should have only one method to uh, make the, uh, uh, the ni uh, nitrogen gas as uh, liquid. And uh, uh, another advantage is no ex situ conservation uh, you know, for uh, long term other than crop preservation is available so far. So these are the advantage of uh, crop preservation. That's why all over the world now, crop preservation is a, a, a chosen method for uh, long term conservation ex situ. And uh, coming to the pollen crop preservation, uh, which are the factors which affect the pollen storage? Uh, they are mainly temperature, uh, moisture. When you collect the uh, pollen, the pollen contains a lot of moisture. In uh, some cases, say for example, in the case of uh, sucucarbitaceous pollen, you have to reduce the moisture content. 
and uh, uh, for that you should give a pretreatment or most we use the silica gel for pretreatment then we go for the storage in liquid nitrogen now uh, coming to the cryogenic technology uh, cryopreservation is the applied aspect of uh, cryogenic technology and it is a live conservation of biological material at uh, ultra low temperature as I told you at uh, minus uh, 90, 196 degrees centigrade. It ensures uh, safe and uh, cost effective long term conservation of plant genetic resources and it improves the safety standards of conservation. But there is a well, and there is a requirement of well defined protocols for uh, different gene pools to conserve in liquid nitrogen that is correct preservation. What is the advantage of uh, pollen crop preservation? Some of you may not be uh, knowing what are the advantage of uh, crop preservation. The uh, pollen is also called the nuclear genetic diversity and uh, it is uh, not having much cytoplasm. It contains only the, the uh, nucleus and it is highly uh, compact, occupies less space in the storage containers and it requires least quarantine problems. Uh, exchange of uh, material in the form of pollen is uh, preferred because uh, there is uh, not much quarantine problems are there and uh, only there are reports that uh, some virus diseases are transmitted to pollen. Otherwise it is uh, safe to transfer pollen from uh, one continent to another continent or one uh, country to the other con uh, country. So it facilitates the global exchange of a nuclear genetic diversity in the form of pollen. And there are already reports that the countries are exchanging pollen, especially in the case of uh, uh, tree species, because there is a long juvenile phase, which uh, is difficult for uh, you know, the uh, material to get established in uh, different countries. Again, coming to the advantage of uh, pollen crop preservation, Basically, it used for the intercrossing of asynchronously uh, flowering genotype. In breeding, this is a problem that uh, they use different uh, <coughs> genotypes, and these genotypes flower at different times. So, to overcome the inter, uh, the asynchrony in the flowering, uh, we use the pollen crop preservation. Then, uh, now the hybrid seed production is normally done by using the male sterile populations and uh, male sterile population can be perpetuated by the uh, pollen, you, uh, pollen of the male parent. And uh, it improves the breeding efficiency by uh, having a uh, clear stock of uh, pollen which can be uh, used uh, for pollination at different places at different times. And it also, you can avoid the growing of male parents uh, every season otherwise for uh, the uh, pollen, you have to grow the pollen parent every time. And as I told you, uh, you can have a multi-location breeding by using this uh, uh, pollen crab bank. And now most of the hybrid seed com companies, especially in uh, vegetable, uh, they use this uh, technique for uh, hybrid seed production. And I will be telling more about in the uh, coming slides. But of course, there are some limitations like, uh, as I mentioned, pollen is not, not having much cytoplasm. So if any uh, gene transferred to the cytoplasm, you cannot get uh, through pollen. Then uh, there are uh, some reports that through pollen, the viruses are uh, getting transmitted. Then uh, what is the genetic stability of the cryopsis or pollen? But we found that uh, there is no problem of genetic stability. The pollen cryostodes remain as uh, <coughs> viable and uh, fertile and, and is able to do its duty that is uh, transferring the male gamete to the female counterpart. But uh, always we suggest that more research is uh, required in these uh, areas. Now, uh, I will go to the methodology we followed for uh, crop preserving pollen. Uh, you have to collect pollen in a viable uh, state and we used to do the viability assessment in the lab. We bring the uh, flower uh, from the field to the lab and uh, we do the uh, collection of pollen in the lab. 
then we do the vi viability assessment and we uh, develop protocols for the viability assessment in vitro then we do the packing uh, for cryo preservation normally we transfer the pollen into a gelatin capsule and this gelatin capsule is kept in uh, laminated aluminium pouches and these pouches are sealed air air tightly from all the four sides and then we directly plunge this into the liquid nitrogen cryo containers then you can retain the uh, cryopreserved pollen for uh, the period on which you want and uh, if you wanted to take out the process is called towing bringing the uh, temperature into the room temperature and this is a slow process it may take half an hour to one hour then we use this pollen for uh, uh, pollination and we get the fruit and uh, seed set that is ultimate uh, test for the fertility of the cryopreserved pollen and uh, uh, for the collection and viability assessment these are the protocols for follow to avoid the uh, contamination we used to uh, bag the flowers when it uh, uh, in the bud stage itself then uh, collection is done mostly by tapping the flowers on the petri plates and uh, we used to get the we, sh we should get the pollen free from other debris and if you are collecting pollen from different uh, plants or different flowers it is better to bulk and consolidate the pure, uh, pure pollen then uh, mostly the in vitro germination test is carried out by brew baker and uh, salts media it is uh, brew baker and uh, quacks media uh, normally we use uh, 6 to 25 percent sucrose and uh, uh, kno3 mgso4 and uh, uh, bor boron in the in the media then uh, once the germination is done uh, we do the staining used uh, uh, using alexander stain and uh, by that uh, we can uh, stop the pollen germination and uh, you can view this pollen under the microscope and uh, you can estimate the germination profiles of the pollen and uh, by using alexander stain you can distinguish pollen into uh, three categories that is one is germinated with the pollen tube and then one is uh, non germinated and the next one is uh, sterile pollen sterile pollen will not germinate whatever uh, media you use but the non germinated pollen if it uh, falls on the fertile stigma it may germinate then uh, the uh, packing procedure is uh, given in this slide that we enclose the pollen in butter paper. Now we are not even using the um, <clears throat> gelatin capsule. You can enclose the pollen in butter paper. Then uh, you uh, keep this uh, butter paper in the laminated aluminum pouches, seal air tightly on all the sides and uh, uh, lodge this in a canister of the liquid nitrogen cryo tank and uh, complete immersion is uh, uh, accomplished by uh, putting this in the liquid nitrogen containers then uh, uh, as i mentioned earlier you can uh, retain this pollen in uh, liquid nitrogen containers for uh, uh, how much time you want there is no uh, there is guarantee that uh, if you keep it for a long time also you get uh, uh, the uh, <clears throat> pollen with uh, viable and fertile and uh, ultimate test is the uh, seed formation by using this pollen and uh, uh, in cryopreserved pollen uh, using cryopreserved pollen we have established that uh, we can get uh, the uh, fruit and seed set as in the case of uh, fresh pollen so the uh, logistic we use for uh, pollen crop preservation is given here that laminated aluminum pouches gelatin capsules then this is a mechanical steerer which you use for uh, the sealing of the aluminum uh, laminated aluminum pouches on for all the four sides and these are the canisters wherein we uh, lodge the aluminum pouch with pollen and uh, these canisters are fitted with uh, uh, perforated lids on both sides by that you can have the silicon nitrogen in contact with the pollen always and uh, uh, coming to the if you see this as a technology these are the components of the technology uh, initially the methods for pollen collection and uh, here we should uh, make sure that we get a quality pollen then the viability assessment to know the initial viability and this normally done in uh, laboratory using uh, the 
uh, <clears throat> brubaker salt and uh, sucrose and uh, we normally do the hanging drop method then packing and storage which i was showing uh, previously and the uh, post storage viability also done exactly the same way we do the pre storage viability then of course uh, we developed a database because our uh, samples are more than 700 now and we offer uh, regular training for uh, this uh, pollen crop preservation for different uh, stakeholders. So what are the information required for uh, doing this uh, pollen crop preservation? Information on pollen uh, floral biology of the species is very critical. And uh, if you have this, you can collect the pollen at the right stage with uh, the in initial uh, high, viability, high viability, then the shedding time of the pollen, that is the anthesis. And then sometimes we you, uh, notice that variation uh, due to the genotype and environment. Then collection procedures also we have to standardize for a different crops or species. Then viability te test uh, we do for different uh, uh, species are different, and that also we have to, we have we are standardized now. Then the receptivity of the female counterpart, and sometimes we notice that there is some incompatibility between the species when do the uh, pollination. And uh, pollen can be uh, classified into three categories. There's binuclear pollen, which is having thicker exine can withstand considerable desiccation time and greater longevity. In case of trinuclear pollen, it's having a thinner exine with the sensitive, which are sensitive to desiccation and having a short uh, uh, longevities. In uh, you can classify the pollen depending on the nuclear condition is given here. The mango, citrus, uh, citrus have, having both uh, bi and trinucleate and jackfruit papaya grapes. Uh, luckily, uh, most of the species in horticulture uh, are having binuclear pollen. It's easy to uh, conserve uh, uh, under conservation. Then these are the families which are having uh, trinuclear pollen. This pollen are difficult to conserve uh, uh, under crop preservation because uh, as I mentioned, having thinner exine and uh, their life uh, span is uh, sometimes half an hour to one hour. Uh, so it is uh, difficult to go. But there are some reports in uh, Gramini, the pollen is successfully crop preserved following uh, uh, different uh, protocols. So uh, uh, now we'll go to the protocols developed. Uh, we have, uh, uh, as I mentioned, we have uh, uh, pollen with uh, longer longevity. Then some of them are short-lived. Then some of them are having medium lifespan. And uh, you can see the classification here. And uh, uh, as I mentioned, you can use the Alexander stain or other stains for uh, understanding the uh, <clears throat> stainability of the pollen. And uh, as I mentioned, Alexander stain can distinguish pollen into three categories. Then uh, pollen vigor is very important, which uh, 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 having a say in the uh, seed set and fruit set. Then uh, test for vigor, we do the in vitro germination and uh, uh, sometimes in viable germination. And uh, the uh, classification, as I mentioned, in the two cells and three cells, it is uh, the viability is uh, different and two cell will get uh, longer uh, viability and uh, in three cell we get a shorter viability. And uh, at present we are having uh, more than 700 collections of uh, pollen cryopreserve uh, under liquid nitrogen and uh, this we classified into fruits, vegetables, ornamental and medicine plants and uh, we have uh, standardized a protocol for more than 100 species. Uh, as I mentioned here, you know, we have uh, the history of 38 years of cryo preservation and uh, we tested uh, uh, 23 years after cryo preservation in tomato and we found it is uh, setting and I will be showing the uh, fruit and seed and uh, this. And uh, we developed a database also because uh, when the number of samples uh, exceeded uh, more, we developed a, uh, a database for, uh, you know, the tracking the Metal in the uh, curve bank. So now uh, this uh, slide shows the uh, pollen germinated after cryopreservation in tomato. 
and uh, uh, we did the uh, crop, uh, we did the pollination using crapuser pollen you can see here it is a, a set of fruit and seed then the uh, different combinations we tried in all combinations we got the fruit set and seed set and you see here the uh, different combinations and uh, another interesting uh, aspect is we as uh, dr pratib was telling now to overcome the problem of uh, climate change and the biotic and abiotic stress we have to look for genes in the wild relatives and uh, tomato is one crop their wild relatives are extensively used to get the uh, <coughs> resistant lines and uh, here you can see the uh, wild relative of uh, uh, tomato and you can see the we uh, extracted the pollen and germinated and uh, cryo preserved and you can see here the uh, same that is uh, uh, after uh, collection we did the same studies also and we found uh, the cryo preserved one and the uh, no, uh, fresh one having uh, same uh, character after uh, cryo preservation and here you can see another species of uh, uh, tomato then uh, the SEM, uh, then Solanum pimpinelli folio. And uh, uh, now this pollen is available with, with us and uh, the breeder can use it uh, if you, she want, he, he or she wanted to transfer the uh, <coughs> trait from the wild relative to the cultivated species. So these are the main advantage of uh, having crab preservation. And uh, you can see here the, uh, the germination of fresh and carapacer pollen, there is uh, not much difference. And the uh, after uh, the crossing, the information also given here. And uh, earlier we did uh, in uh, tomato, the uh, use the pollen for, uh, after 26 years, we use for the uh, brinjal pollen and we got the fruit set. And you can see the fruit set and seed set. And in brinjal, then in uh, uh, Ilium sepa, in solanum integrifolium, then uh, we use the uh, different uh, wild species of, uh, and in fact, we are having a pollen cryo bank for the brinjal wild species. We have more than uh, 15 species of uh, wild relatives of brinjal cryo preserve, and you can see the uh, viability. And we use this for uh, pollination also. We got the, uh, fruit set and seed set. Then in Momordica also we did, and you can see different species, the germination and the percentage of germination. And this uh, we did in uh, chilies. See how we did this. And in uh, chilies, you see the germination profiles and this uh, different species of Alia, uh, wild relatives. Then in bitter gut, then Mamardika Sabanguleta, Mamardika Daika, then in Gherkin, uh, Bottle Got, in uh, Watermelon, then in Musk Melon, in Bottle Got, then in Cucumber, Bindi, in Okra. And you see the uh, process of uh, developing the uh, protocol. And as I mentioned in my introductory lecture, this pollen crab I'm featured in the Limca book of records. And if you if anybody wanted to know more information, we have a chapter in the book edited by Dr. Barbara Reed on plant crab preservation, and chapter 17 is on uh, conservation of uh, uh, crab preservation of pollen. Then another uh, chapter you can see in the conservation of tropical plant species, the edited by Professor M. Norma. S. Chuck Chin and Barbara Reed, and both are uh, the volume published by Springer. And uh, in our website also, we have given the information on uh, crop preservation of pollen. And uh, as I mentioned, now we have transferred this technology through uh, to five seed companies like VNR Seeds, Rasi Seeds, Indo-American Indo Hybrid Seeds, Seedworks, and uh, Nanums. These two we have done this year, and uh, uh, we started the technology transfer in 2016 onwards. And you can see the people who took the training from us. 
and how this training for uh, one week and it is uh, uh, exclusively for uh, you know the field level and the lab uh, practical training and uh, not much uh, theory is given here and if you want to know more about crab preservation these are the uh, books available and uh, these are the different cryobiological system and this is our uh, uh, pollen cry bank and uh, the uh, advantage in the uh, of pollen cry preservation is it very effective and efficient economically feasible and uh, tested and proven and uh, protocols are simple and uh, uh, effective in uh, retaining genes and under uh, safe custody and it is eco friendly so thank you very much thank you sir for that informative lecture it was very interesting to listen uh, we could listen to uh, you could cover the methodologies of cry preservation in various crop and protocols developed at iha various case studies in uh, across the crops and the practical applications of cry preservation through the technology transfer uh, so we have a few queries in yes this uh, dr ajit has asked are there any short videos on the procedure of pollen cry preservation Available. Yes, I think uh, we have uh, one uh, video developed, and uh, I think uh, later on I can share that with you. There is no issues. One more question is there, sir. Uh, could you please explain about Alexander staining of pollen? Yeah, what I can do is uh, uh, this paper on uh, pollen stain. It is a versatile stain developed by Dr. Alexander by uh, doing research. Uh, for two years and uh, it can be used not only for pollen can be used for uh, uh, fungi then bacteria and uh, i will share the uh, paper with you uh, in your email uh, i have the uh, paper with you and uh, i will scan it and share uh, with you in your mail and uh, just give me one day today i will scan and share with you, all of you thank you sir Uh, are there any other queries if none uh, dear participants we have a short quiz for this session of lecture three days sir please post this yeah the link is already posted you can respond please respond to the mcqs posted in the google forms shared by sridhar gudam sir we'll have 2 to 2 to 3 minutes for answering this question Shrita sir,
See, the biggest fallen crab bank, people believe it is in USA. It is not in USA, it is in India. Because we have that uh, attitude problem that we don't have uh, any good things in India. Rest of all the questions they answered uh, correctly, I think. Yeah. Sir, it is IHR or IHR? Yes. Yeah. But people don't believe in it. Yes, we have already got 62, yes. uh, 66 responses. Thank you so much for that timely action. Now, uh, our next speaker is Dr. Prakash Patil, the project coordinator <coughs> of ACRP Fruits. Let me have a brief introduction to Patil, sir. Dr. Prakash Patil is coordinating nine fruit crops at 50 ICR ACRP centers located in different parts of the country. During his career of 26 years at IAHR, he has been serving in scientific fields specialized in plant tissue culture and germplasm management, besides his major role of coordination of the programs of ACRP. Dr. Patil is associated in compilation of various reports pertaining to various review committees. In addition, he was the chief executive office of business entrepreneurship and startup support through technology in horticulture, that is best hot facility at IHR, a technology business incubator of IHR for, for a period of six months. His major contributions include identification of promising pumelo and banana varieties, improving the micropropagation protocol for large-scale multiplication of banana germplasm, conservation of ba banana germplasm under in vitro conditions, developing protocols for in vitro colonial propagation of papaya, mm -hmm. micropropagation of brinjal and tomato, etc. Patil sir has been actively associated with the progress of ACRP fruit centers for the cause of fruit crops in development in India. Under his able guidance, ACRP fruits has bagged Chaudhary Devi Lal Outstanding ACRP Award from ICAR during 2016. Dr. Patil has ordered and edited more than 100 publications, including technical bulletins and book chapters. He is the recipient of H. S. Mehta Memorial Young Scientist Award, year 2010. Also, he is a fellow of AIPUB 2007, conferred by the Association of Association for the Improvement in Production and Utilization of Banana, and he is also a fellow of Chai by the Confederation of Horticulture Association of India. He is an honorary fellow member uh, in the year 2021 for the Society for Biotic and Environmental Research, Kowai Tripura. With this brief background, I would request Dr. Prakash Patil, sir, to make his presentation on genetic resources in fruits and overview of ACRP. Sir, please. Thank you, Dr. Anishma. Uh, am I audible? Yes, sir. Uh, is my slide, I'll uh, just share. Whether my first slide is visible? Not yet, sir. Is it? Uh, okay, again, I'll share the screen. Yes, sir. Now it is coming, sir. Uh, is it visible now? Yes, sir. Now it is visible. PowerPoint mode? Yes, sir. Okay. Okay. Good morning. Uh, uh, respected uh, the director, IHR, and uh, uh, course coordinators, all uh, resource persons, and uh, team members associated with organizing our national online training program at IHR with the help of various research persons across the country and above all uh, distinguished uh, participants who, who have joined online from different parts of the uh, uh, research system. Welcome to all of you and uh, very good morning. My topic is genetic resource in fruits. Uh, since 22nd, I think 22nd, 23rd, two days you have been given information. Uh, I, my topic is slightly, what is, uh, is being done? An overview of uh, ASRP and fruits, what is being done under this uh, project? Uh, I'll be covering in a short around 10 points uh, in 20 minutes, uh, 20 to 25 minutes, five minutes we'll have a discussion. Before that, many of you maybe in a two to three slides, I'll be covering what is a CRIP, why it is required, why a CRIP is basic questions, what is that we are going to do, in what way, uh, fifth point is, it is related to germplasm augmentation for food crops, how we do exploration or survey, 
and what is the status of the PGR collection in food crops in this project, and uh, the being vegetatively propagated uh, material which we are dealing mostly for barring uh, papaya, what are the ways to eliminate the duplicate accessions, and uh, characterization. I think you would have been hearing since yesterday or day for yesterday, and what is the, uh, how we are going to manage the genetic resources at the end, what is the take home message of my, uh, these LN points. This project, as uh, my colleague Dr. Anish Ma is telling, it is being spread over 50 centers, 20 ICA based centers, 14 ICR institutes, four CA based and in private, and even in one government of our natural projects. All together, we have 50 centers with a human resource strength of 304. If below, if you see nine crops banana, citrus, gava, papaya, grapes, lychee, jackfruit mango and sapota. So most of the major food crops we are covering and the red color fonts are number of locations it has been uh, operated. And this is one project wherein we, we always uh, deal with uh, team members. Uh, at Bengaluru, we'll be dealing uh, mango, gava, papaya, sapota and jackfruit. Another four crops <clears throat> is being done by banana by National Research Center for Banana, citrus by CCRI Nagpur, Grapes by NRC Grapes uh, Pune, Lichi for NRC Lichi uh, Mujapurpur. We link together uh, as a team mode, we will be working and you will appreciate at the end of this lecture how this team is helping in the uh, PGR activities. And uh, just uh, one uh, point is why we need a CRIP. In the National Agriculture Research System, I call it as an, uh, uh, a, a vehicle, you can say, a car. If a car has to start, it cannot go with the fourth gear, step four, if you see here. So you have to, any the vehicle has to start with first gear, and then only as the speed picks up, it will go. Same is the method. When we transfer the technology to the farmers, it cannot directly go from the inventor. So it has to go from inventor to feasibility testing, because the agriculture field is influenced by the environmental factor that has to be tested. That I call as a second step where the project plays, our project plays a major role. And third scale is upscaling. Uh, are the large scale demonstrations before it goes to the communities or farmers. That is called FLDR of KVKs across the country will be taking from the crypt tested technologies and they demonstrate to the farmers of that reason. That makes us yes, fourth gear is the one where farmer can implement the technology without any uh, the uh, worry that it is proven and it will go. That's how it, this project works. And this project has a more, four major objectives. Release of varieties mainly through multi-location testing. Second point is the point which we are discussing today. If you see maintaining safety duplicates besides evaluation and augmentation of the germplasm with national active germplasm site. That's how the NAGSR we are linked together. This is the point in the out of four objectives the ACRIP is doing with relation to PGR. Another two is input use of technology and assessment of plant health, pest and disease management technology. So I will be deliberating more. What is that second point we are doing in PGR? See, we strengthen the NEHS in germplasm collection, conservation, and characterization. These centers located across different centers, a location, uh, they will strengthen with the NEHS activity. And they will also help in the trade specific evaluation. Let us understand that it is a natural phenotyping. Uh, we don't have and that uh, these being the perennial crops, it is very difficult for us to uh, evaluate at one go, it, it needs. And uh, apart from this, we also plan to have a core connection at the national level. Why we have to do this? To ensure effective conservation of the diversity, as I said, augmentation of germplasm. And further, I think yesterday also Dr. Karnakaran made Documentation of the available diversity for future use. We, it may be for breeding, it may be for the direct farmers use. And this is how, how this project, in this project, PGR activity, how NAGS is the one custodian of the all diversity in the country. That is a focal point. They will be knowing what are the areas or uh, they will have a uh, gaps identified and what traits we need. I think the other day, Dr. Sankaran had given which crops, what traits have been identified. One of my publications he had shared in that and he was telling and over and above, if any additional information needs to be, those are the things uh, given by the core in the Institute and we as a group in different centers, we explore. 
why we we uh, have a better is uh, i'll give you a common example if a one person is from delhi if i go to delhi i cannot see which market where is the strength if i join a hand with the delhi localite they will say that as this market has this kind of product if we go together what is required is my demand what is available is known to him so that's why our uh, the collections will be very nice in the same way, diversity i cannot see what is the diversity available in northeastern region if i join hands with the person who is staying that's why even community participation in genplasm conservation or exploration is really good because they will be knowing in and out so if i go from here to arunachal pradesh i will not be able to explore if i join hands with the person who is staying over there he will take me to the place where lot of diversity is there then i have a chance to select what i need that's how this acrip and nags work together and then we will find it and we would have seen one uh, arrow mark reverse red color what is that safety duplicate duplicate so th- after that we will identify is it based on that i will identify is it available that has to be conserved where it has to be conserved that will uh, come to know at then i think these are the one which we identified based on the curator demand what is required in different crops like in banana we identified around eight characters it may be disease or fissure mildew is a major problem as in leaf spot or wilt other uh, processing quality or like this these are the things what a breeder requires and we have identified if you see reasons to be surveyed this is the one which has been given by different localities they say that these are areas we have that's how we will be joining in a team mode and we will be able to uh, explore the collections in a better way uh and same is the case with mango gava if you see earlier we used to say trait specific but the question now is what is the trait we need second point is which are the regions available that one if you see second column 1 2 3 4 if you see fourth is anthocyanins peel color in mango pulp texture weight and tss where are it is available i see uh, third point if you see western tripura northeastern region major things we have given much importance whether do you have in these kind of uh, the point especially arunachal pradesh and uh, many of the north eastern tripura uh, these are the places where we will have a diversity we need to explore so these the things that's how the acrip centers crop curators and the national research, the institutes work together and identify the traits and to be surveyed similarly i will be uh, sharing the information with respect to citrus and with respect to jackfruit and uh, you may be seeing you see right side jackfruit lot of areas are there so we have distributed one person cannot it is a team effort if you say that uh, i am working on jackfruit or dr karnakarni is working on jackfruit do you expect the team or me to collect the entire country it is not possible we can guide we can join hands together and see that we will be able to consolidate explore the possibility second point what we made is do we need to explore all the these spots every year there is a question in case of perennial crops we have drawn a plan why not once in 5 years see if you west bengal i am 24 parkan sugli kuchpur these are the places we identified these places we planned we need to revisit these places not next year maybe after 4 to 5 years gap let us cover entire areas and then go back i i don't think we will be able to get the variant every year so that's a way we are planning and see that the diversity areas are covered proper material is collected and then it will be documented it is passport like a, we we as an individual will have a passport same is applies to not only human being it is a plant material live, any living material it may be animal plant bacteria whatever it is that data is important to give an identity yes this and this material is this, this is the custodian nbpgr is the national custodian who maintains and gives this passport if you and me wants to passport we will not there is one authority same is the case with the plant uh, material they are the custodians with they, they will record all these things and now it has been uh, still uh, channelized that uh, the passport data will not be given immediately earlier they used to give maybe 10 years back now there are certain riders curator has to certify they have to maintain they have to say that this is different then only the new number will be given that is to avoid an unwanted uh, entry and really the material what we say is really distinct and this is the status of collections if you see banana around 1400 
Out of that, we have almost characterized more than 50 to 60 percent citrus around 400, grape 200, and gava 389, jack 200, uh, almost around 300. Litchi, it is an exotic material introduced, and you will may not have much. 93, mango around uh, almost 2000, or even it is up to 5000, you can say. But I uh, will come to know is it really 5000 or what is that where we, we have to go? Papaya 135, support 140. And you may be puzzled this number, uh, different speakers may be giving. I'm sure by this time you would have heard two, three speakers on different crop. They would have also given one number. I am also giving one number. What is that we need to? We will we'll keep, I, I'll keep that question uh, uh, on pause you know, at this. And what is that we have characterized, how we have evaluated, and to what extent? The major thing is, what is that we are going to do it? When so much resources are invested, we need to utilize the material. And this is even when I said the master, it is a distribution. Who maintains where? If I say citrus 483, where it is out there? These are our centers located in different parts of the country. This is the number. Same is the case with grape. And similarly, case with the Gava uh, 389, where is what? Bangalore has 68, Lucknow has 90, rest other places, even Udaipur in Rajasthan, they also have almost uh, on par with national institutes. If you go to Jackfruit, you see Jorath has almost 81. Uh, Western Kannara, Kerala is a hotspot, they have. And I have not added Bangalore here because it is not part of a crypt. Here also we have around 80. That's the reason I was telling it is not 278, it may be around 500. And same is the case with papaya. Papaya, not much, mostly Tamil Nadu and Karnataka, to some extent in Maharashtra, we are maintaining. And even uh, earlier, they were maintaining at uh, IRA New Delhi, but now uh, it's not that much, around 100 plus. And the support is 140. But support also, it is uh, not really 140. It's all a duplicate. I'll come to know it, it is around 50. Uh, uh, that once you come to. Know. And mango collection, I was telling 1797. If you see, there are still many organizations. If you total it, it comes to 5,000 plus, or it may be still more. And the uh, other day, Dr. Shankaran was also sharing. Database is also there. Uh, the CISS Lucknow has developed, Dr. Rajan. And uh, if you look there also, there are many things. Uh, that, that is a kind of uh, uh, the, uh, information we have. Now the question is, uh, I'll see, you would have seen, I was telling that so many numbers are there. The question is, if you go on adding, there will be many numbers. Only a number is happening. I'll take a common example of uh, mango. Alfonso, I am also maintaining. Lucknow is also maintaining. Rauri is also maintaining. Vengurle is also maintaining. Sangharad is also maintaining. Like that. In reality, it is only one accession. So these kind of old materials, NPPs are used to give the accession number. But that's what they are telling. Now they have become very rigid. There are certain channelized system is there, and uh, they will be taking. I made an hypothetical uh, example. If you see, you may be seeing different uh, colors. There are four columns. If you see in first column, at the total I have written, as per that, I was telling, you know, like that. It sees three, but in reality, it is one. If you see same color. If you go to second column, how many colors are there? There are uh, the four types of colors are there. One is, in, in reality, there may be only three types, uh, purple, orange, and uh, light orange. But if you go uh, still by genomic, if you see inside number RRNN, capital RRNN, so that is, if you go further details, what is that detail? Characterization. If you go for the characterization character, it may be why we are doing characterization. Descriptors are there. I'll be showing all those descriptors, if you superimpose, you may come to know that the materials are same. If you see here, capital R, R, small, capital N, small n. So like that, if it is there, there may be something which is same. It's capital R, R, capital N, N. You, you may see here in this second column. Actually, they are different. One is maintained in Jalga Maharashtra. Another one is maintained in Bihar. They say they are different. If you see at the both the places, if you see the char characterization data, the characterization data is overlapping. So that is one. So we need to remove such duplicate. See, now having earlier two decades or three decades, what we did is we started collecting the material. Now a stage has come. We cannot have the sufficient field gene bank. It's very difficult to maintain. We need to have core collection. We need to remove so that you free the space. What is that to be done? So we have, when you have characterized, 
relook those characterized data and see what is that. So capital R or capital N, N, they say they are different. After looking the characterization data, that's the reason inside. You will be able to say that it is possible. Next third is molecular characterization. Also able to give some more sites, then you will be able to still eliminate. So that's the reason like that I have made an hypothetical cases for just for an understanding. Don't think that these are genes. No, just for an understanding purpose. If you see total, it is coming to 20. Just by superimposing characterization data, we may come back to 10. So that's how we can free the space occupied by 10 accession. That is the order of the day today in the field gene bank. We need to really look why not remove duplicates and go for the core collection. This is one, one step we can do it so that we'll be able to do it. And this is the first success we have made in uh, the NRC Banana's help, thanks to the team from NRC Banana. They have almost completed 1,400 total collection has been 2,100. Still they are looking. It is only just by morphological superimposing characters, by just removing the names, synonyms, still superimposing the all the descriptor character has not been done. It is only by name and some super superficial characters. Based on that, they could eliminate 273. I'm sure if you superimpose, now next target is we need to have, because when you are looking for anonymous data, we need to have some kind of tools to use, uh, eliminate such things. What is the way that we are planning to do in collaboration with the NBPGR, how best will be. The serials, they are able to do it. When it comes to perennial crops, there are inbuilt difficulties. We have taken as a case study banana, we'll be able to do. In the same way, we need to do for all so that we'll be able to eliminate. You would have seen these kind of descriptors. Why these descriptors, I'm just showing it. We have collected, we have characterized, documents are available. So what? What is next day is to be done by us. Just documenting is not the end of the story. That's one way, definitely. A repository of information is mandatory because the information is permanent. Human being is not permanent in the system. So that has to happen, that's happened. Next step, what is to be done? How best do we have to use that information collected? We have all these characters you would have seen. I was telling descriptors, 138 banana or whatever you are seeing. Supporter descriptor is down there, but IHR developed 133 various plant character, food character, biochemical character. Now the question is, use these characters, documented character and superimpose. Can you eliminate any such things? Many descriptors would have been published. I'm, I'm not discouraging this. This is a good idea. But we have done only one step. What is next to be done? That's why I written what is next. Just documenting is one success. Second thing, make use of the, these material and try to eliminate the duplicate based on the available information. And this is how we try to collect the information. What is the area we have surveyed and it's just for information may not be. But our best target is remove the duplicates, use the characterization data, and my, uh, my understanding is those who are involved in PGR activities, please have to look what is that is available rather than because if you come, it may be uh, new for you, but uh, 10 years back, somebody would have already collected that material. That's the reason visiting those, uh, the material is uh, very important. I think in the inaugural session, Honorable Dr. Parada sir has made a mention. You need to really visit the material information what has he said the two declarations agrobiodiversity congress declaration why is the many things have come out we need to revisit just uh, don't start with the beginning you are something has been done in years together so such information you use and make use of and uh, that will help so uh, the end of the day if you do it i am sure this coordinated effort will help conservation of the diversity at the national level because you cannot have Safety duplicate, why you are using? Today you see Tamil Nadu is flooded, Karnataka is flooded. If everything gets lost in the fields in bank, what is that? So in such cases, if you have safety duplicate, I'm sure if banana goes from Tamil Nadu or NRC banana, we have duplicate. Maharashtra we have, Bihar we have, West Bengal. Next day only we'll be able to recoup that last material and the National Active Germplasm site will have the material, whatever they have. That's how this coordinated effort is helping to conserve the diversity. And uh, that's how we'll be able to share the resources. And also we'll be able to having the state specific evaluation and different reasons. The conditions, what is available in Karnataka, Tamil Nadu, BR, West Bengal, Assam is different. 
phenotyping, natural phenotyping can be possible. And that helps us to select the desirable types so that it can be used for the breeding purpose. And overall, uh, the major point is we need to mine the available germplasm. First, the, my, uh, the uh, balance sheet for the PGR activity in the fruit crops is look what has happened and go for what is to be done and what is required. It is not only, uh, I think uh, Parodasar was making mention, that is not only crop duration or yield. There are many points we need to really mine those characters. We are not really look these material with lens. That kind of uh, the looking through microscope is required for these material rather than just uh, looking for TSS, acidity, fruit size. That's fine, it is there, we are not denying. That's the ultimate. But now to bring the breakthrough, we need to really look into the lenses and see that what best will be make, uh, make uh, use of the available diversity and what is missing. For that missing, if you have a, a clear idea, you will be your exploration will be more specific. And at the end, I'll take this opportunity to thank all the scientists of my team, 300 plus. It is because of them, we'll be able to maintain such duplicate material and other partners and different locations who are also helping us. And at my unit and ICR headquarters who are always helping with this project to deliver this, uh, this task. With these few points, I once again thank the organizers and my director for giving this uh, opportunity uh, to share my ideas and uh, uh, discuss with all members. Thank you. Or, uh, I learned at this stage. If there are any query, I, I'll be looking for the chat box. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for that very brief and informative presentation. We could get an overview of activities of AACRP, the germplasm augmentation process under AACRP going on, the status of germplasm collection in different fruit crops across the country, and the ways to avoid duplication among the collections. Thank you, sir. Uh, dear participants, we will have a set of questions as quiz for this session also. Uh, Sridhar, sir, kindly post the multiple choice questions link in the chat box. Yeah, we got. Yeah, we got the uh, Google form link. Participants, kindly respond to the questions. We'll have two to three minutes for the uh, answering of the session. <laughs> The link is shared in the chat box. Please go through. Sridhar sir, could you show the responses? The questions also, can you just show it? Show the answer, uh, Sridhar.
most of them answered correctly i think uh, there is a lot of interest in uh, fruit i think dr uh, patil was very well covered the subject and uh, responses are also very high that yeah, is uh, very very eight, eight, eight even responses so far almost 90 percent 90 percent yeah Thank you, Sridhar sir. Uh, Patil sir, thank you so much for sparing your valuable time with us amidst your busy schedule, sir. Thank you so much. If any other queries are posted, we will communicate to you and get the response, sir. Thank you. Thank, thank you, sir. You. Dear participants, in this series of lectures, next we are going to listen to one of the Star Wars in fighter chemistry in the country, Dr. K. V. Radha Krishnan. Uh, Dr. K. V. Radha Krishnan is the professor in Academy of Scientific and Innovative Research, New Delhi, and is also a senior principal scientist and HOD of organic chemistry, NIST. In addition to his doctoral degree in organic chemistry, Sir has three postdoc fellowships from Tohoku University, Japan. Molecumetics Institute, USA, and NPG Research Institute, North Carolina, USA. Sir has taken keen interest in the fields of bioprospecting of medicinal plants, homogeneous and heterogeneous catalysis for industrially important molecules, synthetic carbohydrate, carbohydrate chemistry, and development of novel synthetic methodologies for sustainable chemistry. Uh, Sir is a recipient of Chemical Research Society of India Bronze Medal in Chemical Sciences for the year 2016 and he has also bagged first rank in the Master of Human Resources Management from University of Kerala in 2016. Dr. Radhakrishnan serves to be a visiting faculty in many institutions like Cochin University, Indian Institute of Science Education Research Trivandrum, URCA Reims, France and University of Uvas Kulia. Finland. Sir has guided over 35 PhD and 150 postgraduate scholars. Currently, he is mentoring six PhD and PG, six PhD students. To his account, there are about 135 research papers, six books, book chapters, one US patent and four Indian patents file. Sir, it's a proud privilege to have you here. Sir, now the floor is yours, please, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Shinshu. So, uh, may I share the slides first? Yeah, yeah. You can share, sir. Can you see? Yeah, yes, sir. Put it in the presentation mode, sir. So, now it's uh, presentation mode. Okay. Okay, thank you. So uh, I have uh, 25 minutes, isn't it? Yes. So, so that means uh, 11, I will start. Yeah, yeah, no so first of all, um, uh, let me thank IAHR, Dr. P. Rajsegren team for inviting me for this uh, lecture. I think this is the first time I am talking to horticulturists, uh, um, especially the agriculture people, ICAM. So uh, let me tell you as uh, already as uh, introduced, I am a synthetic organic chemist uh, with passion in botany. <laughs> so um, I'll be talking about the scientific validation for future technological developments in food and health security of India. So that is something which I am passionate about uh, in addition to our ongoing activities in organic chemistry. So coming to, um, the biodiversity. So India's uh, biodiversity related to food and health security. When you look at it, uh, all of you know that we, we are uh, re really rich in terms of the biodiversity. But are we really making use of it? That is something which I want to ask. Are we really making use of the biodiversity? Instead of uh, utilizing our biodiversity for food and health security, we are always looking to the West for many things. So, and um, our work was, is mainly uh, on uh, related to 
uh, the western guts uh, not uh, not just western guts the majority since we are in kerala uh, we are close uh, we, we have this rich uh, the hottest hot spot of biodiversity western guts so uh, we are looking at different aspects uh, uh, related to the food and health and uh, can we develop nutraceuticals and how to utilize this traditional knowledge for a better life for our society so uh, when uh, we or uh, when we all think about uh, food and health security or the, uh, in general uh, about plants so the information and knowledge on the chemistry the availability pattern of biochemical compounds is still uh, not uh, done in detail especially when it comes to the uh, things related to the traditional traditionally uh, used uh, i mean uh, food crops or medicinal plants and so on because that that, that type of research was so uh, so much uh, up to 1970s in 70s but slowly it stopped and uh, it all went to the type of uh, public getting publications high impact uh, cite, uh, publication citations and so on so when we do uh, it, it's a laborious process but we thought let us uh, take that challenge so the reason for getting into is because uh, whether it is in ayurveda or traditional uh, uh, knowledge folk remedies or folk food uh, habits and all those things tribal food habits so the ecology of the so uh, such plant species and the nutrition value of of these things are very important and unfortunately uh, this uh, this is uh, awfully inadequate today so the reason for it is we are losing our own traditional knowledge on these food crops and many things the root cause of the crisis is the loss of knowledge base relating to our biodiversity relating to our folk remedies relating to our traditional knowledge hello 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 sir you so, can continue no problem Okay. okay so uh, the root cause of the problem which we are facing regarding the food and health security of india is the knowledge erosion erosion of traditional knowledge which was which, which which was there which was existing existing in our country and this knowledge erosion is happening much faster than the resource erosion and we are more worried about our health and many things but we look at western countries for the solution so that is uh, really pathetic because we have our own food uh, materials uh, if you just look at millets itself there is so many different types of millets but we focus on oats and corn flakes and many other things uh, uh, and flax seeds and so, so many other things so the uh, what i want to tell you in in my talk is this traditional knowledge uh, of our country is a locally available low input technology which can provide useful hints for future technological development so when we take up such uh, projects it has to be a multidisciplinary activity you cannot just sit in 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 the lab in your room and talk about it you had to have a multidisciplinary team for example if you look at uh, our activity of phytochemistry it is just not this phytochemistry this multidisciplinary chemistry biology interface which can uh, lead to the nutraceuticals functional foods herbal products phytopharmaceuticals and so on it it, it is based on a multidisciplinary activity where we have botanist sociologists uh, and biochemists cancer biologists and so many people coming together so uh, then only we can have a very good output which is useful uh, for the society so uh, the way we do is uh, we select uh, different families and then we, we go for the analysis scheme of profiling of each of these families and we take or select all these plants based on traditional knowledge or for, uh, traditional knowledge it is not just uh, folk remedies or ayurveda any traditional knowledge it can be an oral traditional knowledge which your grandmother uh, grandmother or grandfather knows and uh, right now you are not aware of it so we go for 
validating that scientific uh, the knowledge, uh, uh, scientific validation, so that it can come as a product or a, a service to the society. So, uh, for example, I just want to tell you about the Sindhi Bereshi family. In fact, uh, we are so rich with several types of uh, uh, species, uh, uh, genus and uh, species in Sindhi Bereshi. So, uh, I'm just giving some examples which we uh, uh, investigated in our lab. So, we have investigated almost all Purkuma species available in Kerala and Assam and uh, some of the Sindhi species like Sindhi Bereshi. So all these things, uh, one thing you have to notice, uh, these are all um, short term crops, like uh, six, seven months. And the interesting thing on, in all these things is, uh, and uh, um, forgive me for the structures in this one, just, just to convey, these are all a rich source of different types of chemical intermediates or phytomolecules, okay? And these phytomolecules are really required for pharmaceutical industry and many other industries. So if we have to have an alternate source of these phytochemicals, which are required for our uh, pharmaceutical industry or development of a new drug, we cannot depend uh, for a long time on petroleum resources. We have to have a renewable resource for all this, and it has to come from herbs. And, and now, right, uh, nowadays, uh, different types of uh, genetic uh, modifications for enhancing the production of these phytochemicals is also available. So that is what I'm trying to tell. And I have uh, highlighted one of these uh, uh, compounds called serum bond, which we are using uh, so much from Sinjibar serum. But, and we found that it is so wonderful compound. It can be transformed into several compounds. And it is so within seven months, you can get a good yield of uh, Rhizome, and from rhizome you can get uh, one from one kilogram of uh, dry weight you can get 40 to 50 gram of serum bone, which is a very important starting material for a number of uh, uh, molecules. So same is true for many tree species also. You look at Dicterocarpaceae uh, family. So these are trees which were available in our um, uh, what do you call um, sacred groves of uh, Kerala and many parts of India. But we cut it all, all of it for rubber, uh, planting rubber trees and so many things. And when you when it comes to Dicterocarpaceae family, if you look at Pateri indica, Hopia punga, Vitica chinensis, Hopia pariflora, if you make a, uh, 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 just like in the rubber tree, if you put a mark with a knife and you can see uh, within a day, you, you can see a resin come, coming out of it. And it has used in folk remedies and many other things. And what is in there? So in this family, it is a, a rich source of many phytomolecules. So you don't just look at fruits and vegetables or something which can be commercially exploited. You have to find out what is in it and then go for exploiting the potential. And some of the things I have highlighted here, vinifarin, apelopsin, isomelopsin, and all those things. And countries like Germany and many other countries are utilizing, and they are, they are getting these molecules from some of the plants uh, through the literature uh, studies, and also uh, they are getting some samples, I don't know how, but uh, these are all produced in kilogram scale in some, some countries. But as an Indian, we are not aware of it or we are we don't want to be aware of it so when it comes back as a, some other product we will be excited so the same is the case in the case of white asia family of course uh, wine is uh, uh, cultivated in many parts of india and also in um, uh, france and anywhere but there are many other uh, plants in this family which is not exploited like uh, ambulosis indica, sisecodrangularis is one of the things which is being exploited because of its uh, uh, very good use in uh, joint uh, health. Uh, so look at these molecules. So these are uh, mo uh, these are all molecules like um, uh, um, resveratrol. So when you look at uh, uh, Dicterocarpaceae family and Vitaceae family, and most of the compounds, excluding the flavonoids, uh, most of the compounds in these plants are based on um, resveratrol. So the resveratrol undergoes dimer, trimer, tetramer, hexamer, like that. So very interesting compounds. So, and it is not just um, 
Vitaceae or some other family. There are families of plants like Samarabisha family, which, can, which are uh, uh, of significance in, in our health, especially anti-inflammatory plants. So for example, Kosi indica, this is a uh, uh, this is uh, so much, this was available so much in uh, beach areas of uh, Kerala, but right now it is in, in an endangered thing. Like uh, uh, people have cut it because uh, now uh, every house is separated with a, a brick wall. Okay, and uh, another one is Elanthus trifisa, and this is a, it's a highly anti-inflammatory plant. You boil, take the leaves and boil it in water and take bath. You can get rid of most of the problems, inflammations in your body, especially with respect to the rheumatic uh, uh, inflammations and all. And look at these molecules. So these are the molecules which are isolated in our lab. So there are so many different type of, uh, uh, I mean, uh, wonderful molecules lying there. Uh, don't cut these trees and um, uh, herbs just because it doesn't need any, uh, give any fruits or flower. And another one is the banana. Just now uh, we, we are listening to uh, talk on banana and uh, many other fruits. So uh, Musa bulbisiana, the seeded banana, if you look at it. So uh, what, what is the use? Can we make use of the seeds other than the, what is practiced in Assam? So of course we can make use of it. And the seeds are a rich source of the flavonoid called epiferol. And when we worked on the uh, rhizomes of this banana, and we found that when this rhizome is infected, it is uh, producing some other chemicals to fight the infections. And then uh, the, the, uh, these are the compounds, angioferinone, irinone, amylinone, and all those things. So that means if you have a knowledge on and the molecules produced the by the plant for fighting the infections or fighting the insect attack or fighting uh, the fungal attack, you will get an idea how to make a, a better insecticide for this attack. The same is the case with sweet potato or many other uh, things. So, uh, and coming to some of the uh, forgotten um, medicinal plants like Celastrus paniculatus, uh, and Dr. Raj Shagarin is working on this right now. So, Celastrus paniculatus is known as Jodhismadi, uh, and uh, which is used in memory enhancing and and also for skin inflammation, especially for uh, steam depression patients, which is a common now, right, uh, nowadays. So it is a rich source of different types of uh, and, uh, the CNS active molecules called agarafurans, which I have shown here. I'm not explaining because uh, uh, this organic chemistry. So we were able to isolate so many new compounds from it, and we are right now doing the uh, CNS uh, neuroprotective uh, efficiency screening of all, all these molecules in vivo. And then coming to uh, our uh, family called Mauritia family, especially in Kerala, if you look at Mauritia is a, a rich family, uh, starting from the jackfruit, the biggest one, but it is not just jackfruit. There are many other uh, species available, uh, which is used as food, Atrocarpus camansi, which is a uh, native of uh, Papua New Guinea, and then Lakucha on in the Northern Kerala, Atacarpus altilis or breadfruit, Atacarpus hirsutus. What is so great in these plants? There is so much great, I mean, wonder in these uh, fruits. Uh, I'll say not just fruits, the bark. And uh, I want to uh, say here, if you see this more, um, if you, if these type of fruits, including the fruit is part of your daily diet, then you can get rid of most of the problems. Your immunity can be enhanced. The reason is it is a rich source of different types of flavonoids. And you can see here, you see this, this, uh, these molecules have a, a broom-like thing. In, in addition to this phenolic uh, uh, skeleton, you can have, it's a, this is a broom, along, which is along with the phenol, it is scavenging radicals from our body. So not only that, and uh, if you look at uh, Atacarpus hirsutus, which is used mainly for timber, it has a rich uh, uh, knowledge for, uh, on folk remedies. And we have recently developed a multi-drug, uh, uh, found out a molecule which is effective against multi-drug resistant strains of staph aureus based on the folk remedies. And this is just no um, patented. So uh, we are working on it, how we can utilize it further. So th there is a rich um, knowledge available. We have to go deep into it. 
So another family is the Menis Parmeshi family, which is a very uh, visible right now because of COVID, because most of these species, especially Tidospora cordifolia, is being exploited so much in COVID fighting. So uh, not only that, uh, there are compounds from this uh, family, uh, especially the Cosinium henastatum, Tinospora cordifolia, Cyclea peltata, Cuminata, and the duplicate Tinospora cordifolia. It is being used as a duplicate. Tinospora crispa is, uh, uh, is uh, rich in alkaloid content. Okay, and right now some of the compounds uh, like tetrandrin uh, uh, from this uh, this family is being investigated is in clinical trials against COVID-19. So. So the, uh, what I want to tell you is, we have a treasure with us. Be aware of the treasure. Have an idea about the treasure with you. And that will give wonders. And it will be, the, I mean, it will lead to be, uh, getting benefit for the society and economic progress. And the same is the case with the Mirstikeshi family. Mirstikeshi family, when, it, when you, um, I just want to focus on Western guts. Miristica fragrance is the one which is being cultivated, but there are many other species in, in the forest, like Malabarica, Medbedomi, Fatwa, uh, Miristica drobogari, etc. So when we, we did it mainly to find out whether it is uh, um, uh, the fragrance and the other wild varieties are related uh, uh, phytochemically, it is not at all. Actually, the fragrance is totally different from Malabarica, Bedomi, Fatwa, and Trobagari and other species. Because in fragrance, um, the, the uh, majority of the molecules are lignans and many other things, which helps us in fighting antimicrobial infections and viral infections and so on. Whereas in the, uh, uh, the wild species, Malabarica and all, this is this type of uh, uh, acyl phenols are the major ones. Some of them are highly allergic and highly toxic. Also, if it is toxic, it is really good. As a medicinal chemist, I get excited. If it is toxic, how can we tune it towards making a very good uh, active molecule? This is also one of the plant having a molecule which is being now patented for uh, or its action on multi drug resistant bacteria, SK pathogens. So, and then there are some wonders. This is from Assam, Delinea family, Delinea indica. I would like to tell you about Delinea indica. It's called elephant apple because elephant like it because it is for enjoy, taste. It is not just elephant, we, uh, we can also eat it. it it's a sort tasting. Uh, elephant like it because on, when an elephant takes it, uh, when it comes out, uh, goes through the uh, its elementary canal and comes out, then only it germinate faster. So we, uh, th there is a traditional knowledge existing in Assam where uh, it is used in curing oral ulcers. So whatever oral ulcers, it's not a, a vitamin B deficiency. So we went in, in, into it and we did a chemoprofiling, uh, isolated molecules, characterized it and found that it has betulinic acid and major and many other things and which is responsible for its wonderful activity. Like that, there are several plants. I, I'm not going deep into Philandeshi family, Bridal Eretosa, Stipularis. And then you get, uh, take the Mahogany family, Meliesha family. We are always talking about uh, neem trees, neem trees and all. There are many other wonder uh, plants in this family. Cipetasia basifera, which is used in folk remedies, especially in fighting poisons. And Aphenomexis polystachia, which is used in Ayurveda for treating uh, Spleen disorders, aphenomaxis polystachia. It is not just uh, spleen disorders. This one, uh, aphenomaxis polystachia, I'm telling you, many people are cutting it, saying that it is of no use. But it's a wonder plant, I will tell you, it, with, with, uh, if from our preliminary, preliminary results, it's a wonder plant, anti inflammatory, not only anti inflammatory, it can be used in uh, neuro problems also. And look at these molecules. And uh, as an organic chemist, I get excited. But when I see the NMR first, I get. Uh, exhausted but after solving the structure i get excited so the, so that is it and another uh, family is the nictanginaceae family of uh, mirabilis jalap and so uh, bougainville and on and you are fascinated about the flavors but you look look down you look at the rhizomes and in folk remedies these rhizomes are used in making an oil for band healing you can get 
seventy percent of brain healing. And because you had to get what deep into it, it has a rich source of rotenoids, molecules called rotenoids. And from white variety itself, we were able to uh, isolate around five new molecules, along with uh, several uh, no, uh, um, uh, unknown molecules. So, so these are some of the things which we had deployed. Are we aware of these folk remedies? Are we aware of the traditional knowledge? Why don't we make use of it? Not just flowers. Why, why don't we make use of the rhizomes and make a ban oil? I mean, uh, as a cure for ban oil, and you can get rid of even any scar after uh, you uh, by using this. So, uh, uh, like that, there are several like Carocarpus marsupium, Butium monotherium, which you may all already know. Yeah. And then the biggest family, the Strache family, if you look at Vernonia anthelmintica, is well used in Ayurveda. But other than that, how much it is used as a product? Any, uh, any, anybody look at it for utilizing or for uh, getting into as a product? Not at all. And the another one, Vernonia cinerea, it, it has wonder compounds. It is not even studied. Uh, we, we have finished, just now finished. But are we ready to take up these challenges for the benefit of humankind, not just for Indians? because this knowledge is only available in our Indian tradition knowledge. So uh, coming to, uh, I, I just, I will take two more minutes, five, two, three minutes to see how we are isolating characterizing. So plant collection is the first thing you need wonderful students and team to do it. Uh, once you collect bark leaf or whatever it is, you dry it at 40 degree in an, um, uh, where we are just circulating uh, air. And depending on the type of molecules, we select the extraction procedure. It may be a cold extraction or hot extraction. And we have to make sure that uh, the compounds are not getting decomposed during the extraction process of heating or something. We, uh, and then once we uh, uh, take it and then uh, the residue, we do a chuck column. We usually do and then uh, precipitation and so on. We make use of the thing like flash columns. And if it is not separable, uh, usually through precipitation, we go for recycling HPLC, preparative analytical or HPTLC just for uh, profiling. So th there are different types of uh, uh, chromatography techniques which are used for identification. And the characterization of these molecules, because uh, when we start with 50 kilogram compounds, you may be getting a very little compound. Uh, and uh, th some of them will be in milligram scale. So you had to characterize. So you had to uh, have uh, all types of characterization uh, procedures, uh, like uh, if it is the pure compound melting point, IR, UV, chromophore identification, HRMS for molecular mass identification, and uh, element analysis we studied in plus two, uh, CHN uh, analysis. And then the final structural characterization comes to NMR. It is just like MRI. So, and you had to find out the relative configuration of on, on each carbon and through uh, optical rotation, absolute configuration through single crystal XRT uh, and also circular dichroism. So I, I will just take you uh, two minutes. Uh, high resolution mass spectroscopy gives an idea about uh, the molecular weight and also it gives an idea about the structure of the molecule because when you give a high ion uh, um, energy, uh, highly energetic ion beam into it, it decomposes and it cleaves at some points one by one. So by looking at the cleaving points, you can identify the molecule. So uh, especially for uh, compounds like this from Vatica chinensis, it's a very complex molecule. You, you have to analyze each fragment to identify. So and in, in, in uh, NMR, uh, we always talk about proton NMR and carbon NMR. And we had to, uh, to have a full characterization, you have to depend on different types of uh, two dimensional NMR techniques like uh, HMQC and all those things, which I will explain. So this is a proton NMR of a compound and implemented and carbon NMR. And, and then you have different types of techniques like depth uh, technique to identify uh, which, are, which are the carbons having only one proton attached, three proton attached, two proton attached, or no proton attached. So this is called a depth technique. And another one is, uh, 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 you can also identify 
this proton is there and which is its neighboring proton neighboring proton in the neighboring carbon so you uh, you can find out whether this proton is interacting with the neighbor neighboring proton proton interaction through a two dimensional nmr spectroscopy and then you can also find out which proton is connected to which carbon through hmqc experiments hmqc a two di two dimensional and uh, and and another thing is so now you know about uh, after getting an idea who is your neighbor then you have got who is your next neighbor neighbor's neighbor okay so so you can that means you can get up information up to three carbons or four carbons through a two dimension uh, nmr hmbc and after all doing all those things how does it look in space are are they interacting through the space then that has to come from uh, Uh, no see nuclear or hosser effect spectroscopy and finally if you are lucky you will get a crystal and then you can get a crystal that uh, uh, for absolute relative configuration so uh, so you had to stitch in together all this data to get the final idea about a molecule structure so uh, to, uh, if uh, and also the sometimes for example Uh, when when you work on the dietary carpet and white ash dietary carpet always gives compounds with optical rotation plus whereas white ash gives compounds with optical rotation minus so it has both families are having uh, same compounds but uh, the opposite uh, uh, i mean the mirror images so that is shown here so in such cases we have to go for uh, for example plus uh, hopiapinol from white ash family minus from Uh, what are indica of that other carpacea, which you had to um, identify through circle dichroism and uh, uh, single crystal. So it's a really uh, wonderful and uh, essential oils you can analyze through GCMS. And um, uh, time is up now. So, so what I want to tell you is, it is not just uh, uh, food products and things. Uh, these molecules and these uh, short-term crops has to. Yeah, because we have we cannot depend on petroleum sources for a long time, and this uh, abundant phyto molecules has to become a resource for or chemical intermediates required for pharmaceutical industry and many things. So th there are a lot of things, and we have to have research going on in this direction to utilize it for uh, for food and health security of India. And of course, wh while doing it, you have to do a uh, Um, parallelly, the biological evaluation in vitro in vivo. Oh, it's over now. So, so th th this is the expertise in our um, uh, uh, section uh, on like um, phytochemicals and microbial natural products, and uh, we are uh, actually developing this. Not so it, it doesn't happen just by sitting at home, um, in the lab alone. We have to interact with tribals, uh, traditional healers, and also we need to have. motivated young and dynamic students and so we can do like this um, uh, i mean by doing research alone or we can uh, have a team so that we can have wonderful results so let us come together and go together as a dynamic team uh, so thank you very much for your patience thank you thank you sir thank you sir for that uh, exciting and much informative talk on the scientific validation for future technologies technological developments in food health security in india sir i'm sure that it was such an illuminating talk that could arouse interest and curiosity in most of the participants on the importance of chemo profiling and scientific validation of traditional knowledges in the locally available biodiversity sir it was an eye opening session in the bio prospecting of indigenous species which we were not never thought of earlier thank you very much sir once again we look forward to hear from you more in the future time too thank you sir binu binu thank you thank you thank you for giving me an opportunity to talk to a different type of audience like horticulture uh, so there are two queries or appreciation message in the chat box i'll read that uh, dr ajit woman has asked Uh, what is your opinion about of efficacy of hydroxy citric acid from garcinia species as there are some contradicting reports uh, if you just take it just as a hydroxy citric acid it may not be good so you take it as a uh, plant product you put it in resum uh, that um, garcinia cambogia and take it it is good 
uh, anything um, uh, if you take in excess amount uh, it is problem because dose determines the toxicity so uh, garcinia cambogia is very good for health if you uh, use it as a uh, in your daily diet diet uh, in curries and all as a soaring agent it is good but that, that doesn't mean that you can take hydroxy citric acid alone and uh, take its benefit it is not possible because it in herbal remedies and all it is a synergistic activity which is uh, 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 giving uh, the desired action and also always we have to remember that dose determines the toxicity so uh, if you uh, i have no uh, idea how it will be if you take just hydroxy citric acid alone especially if you are taking uh, um, uh, blood loosening agents like uh, acitrom and ecospirin and dot it will have um, i mean adverse effects sir another Any message sorry sir another message from dr binu matthew uh, sir is telling i have been working on ethno medicinal plants among garo tribe meghalaya for several years uh, sir your presentation was an eye opener and it has opened up new dimensions to think and formulate his research uh, yeah thanking you and one more question sir uh, is your team working on phytochemicals of perocarpus centalinus yes we uh, in fact we have worked on more than 140 plants i have just uh, uh, listed some of the things which are used uh, in horticulture and mainly fruit crops and all those things uh, medicinal I, i selected only some examples so terocarpus sandalinus uh, we didn't work so much into it but we were in need of some molecules from it so we isolated those molecules that so once again i thank you sir once once sir as always uh, uh, you are inspiring us and i have uh, two three uh, queries one is uh, uh, you know which is the plant which uh, you were excited most in working and uh, which is the molecule which excited you most because i think uh, you have worked on an array of plants and the molecules uh, so you would have come across some uh, challenges and some uh, which you were excited so i thought uh, Uh, I would like to know that which is the molecule excited yeah, molecule okay. and the plant so, uh, plants so I cannot say that uh, in, uh, because it, it depends because we are working parallelly on cancer diabetes and neuro so in neuro I, I am so much excited about the celastus paniculatus okay. I have collected some samples from you that's why I so and uh, <laughs> uh, so and uh, I'm right now working on in the in your area i am working on nardostachys jedamensi and uh, sarcostema acidum somelada in your area where we have uh, uh, collaborations and uh, and the moraceae family the artocarpus hirsutus and other plants and uh, hirsutus altilis and uh, camansia are wonderful and uh, artocarpus hirsutus uh, i collected uh, the bark from the nearby somel and collect extracted things and it turned out to be two two patents which we are going for further with the icmr for mdr active compounds so like that there are several plants are uh, really good actually we have a team of people uh, connected from different institutes working on and uh, when it comes to antiviral we have now uh, uh, work going on in antiviral evaluation of minispermacea family plants especially cyclia peltata and the lacora acuminata which is not even looked at in detail so yeah. which has a wonder plant a wonder molecules and i was uh, interested to know see the plants which are growing in some niche areas you worked on some of the plants which are working on niche areas and if you remove from the niche area and put it in some uh, agro biodiversity uh, area Uh, mm. you know for example you cultivate uh, what will be its uh, chemical composition will vary or the same or it, uh, it will vary it, it will vary sir so for example if you take delini indica which is uh, we uh, we are able to uh, find out the mechanism of action against oral cancer delini indica elephant apple so we, we collected it from assam the same is available in kerala also but the one collected in assam is having more uh, compounds and activity and when it grows in western ghats uh, it has betulinic acid but many other things are uh, missing okay. and it uh, when we collected from assam ecology and the geography and the soil microbiology is very important and um, assam had a fungal metabolite which is produced uh, uh, 
uh, uh, uh, found in very big amount in uh, when we collected from asa that molecule is known as pamaromycin so uh, but that is not there in uh, the one collected from uh, kerala so we we are also uh, looking at the geographical variations ecological variations yeah. and all of the phytochemicals chemo profile yeah another and what we found is we had to have a parallelly biology students also working so uh, now um, along with collaborations with different people we have a, my group team is uh, um, i have a chemistry phd students and biology students to, working together yeah then only it is so, possible yeah uh, one possible. last query is uh, you know uh, as ajit vaman uh, already mentioned see uh, this uh, uh, chemicals you isolated and take it as a medicine so we'll have some yes. side effects or uh, if you take that uh, plant say for example the fruit or the leaf or the stem if you take you don't have much side effect but especially in ayurveda they do like that but when you isolate the chemical and take it as a medicine uh, you will have the side effects what you say from if you your... want to develop a molecular medicine approach hmm. then we have to go for the molecules and uh, sometimes the amount of uh, compound isolated may be in very little amount then uh, in in such cases we are synthesizing those molecules in the lab okay but if you want to develop a herbal product based on classical knowledge okay no problem no yeah. uh, everything has its own uh, merits and demerits yeah okay uh, because these are all different branches of uh, health uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. science so so thank you very much and it was a exciting you, session and uh, you know uh, you give 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 you are giving a lot of food for thought and uh, uh, you know uh, is for inspiration for all the participants there are more than 150 participants online and the different parts of the country it was and uh, i would like to thank you for uh, coming online for uh, you know uh, inspiring all these people thank you once again thank you thank you sir you are my motivator so thank you <laughs> thank you sir thank you sir thank you so much thank you thank you with radha krishnan sir's lecture we have completed our first module on genetic resources in horticultural crops diversity distribution and utilization and we are moving on to the second module that is methods and tools for conservation and management of horticultural genetic resources one of the major phases in the genetic resource management is the exploration for collection of valuable genetic resources today we have got dr s p ahlavat sir to enlighten us on the principles and methods in germplasm exploration and collection let me introduce dr ahlavat sir uh, dr ahlavat is presently coordinating the plant exploration and germplasm collection program at the national level in the capacity of head division of plant exploration and germplasm collection at icar npgr new delhi Sir has more than 26 years of research experience by serving as scientist in various institutions like ICR headquarters ICR Kafri Chansi IARA regional station Karnal state forest research institute Itanagar Arunachal Pradesh etc Sir has worked on breeding and improvement in wheat moong bean and indigenous agroforestry species Dr Ahlavat sir is teaching advanced courses to the students of IARA and guided six students of msc agriculture he has published over 70 research papers in referee journals and received brandis prize in the year 2009 with great pleasure sir i would request you to apprise your participants on exploration thank you sir thank you dr ansuma <laughs> am i correct no sir it's anushma anushma okay sir and uh, good morning dr sekhran thank you sir coming online okay. always a pleasure to see you thank you to me also so all the participants are scientists scientists and uh, students and uh, working in different ओके सर सो डॉक्टर अनुष्मा आपकी आवाज ज्यादा क्लियर है डॉक्टर साहब की नहीं थी ओके सो देयर मस्ट बी सम अदर लेक्चर आल्सो आफ्टर मी यस सर फॉलो टू योर प्रेजेंटेशन इज बाय डॉक्टर वीना गुप्ता ऑन सीड कंजर्वेशन सर 
seed conservation at what time uh, next 11:30 session once you finish it you have 30 minutes sir don't worry you have 30 minutes sir <laughs> okay and 30 is already so please tell to dr vina or should i tell to ring her no problem sir we are in we are, we are in touch sir okay. okay you are in touch okay i am starting sharing my screen <clears throat> Uh, is it clear yes sir please make it in okay. the slide show okay how to do that yeah a slide so i have done it is it no sir for okay, us ma? it is not coming sir but at my screen it is showing in the full sir, view sir you stop sharing and again uh, you share it after uh, stop sharing again okay. you do yeah. okay 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 So you try sharing your screen rather the PPT. Okay. Share the screen. Not yet. No, sir. Anyway, let us. So no problem, sir. You can go now. ahead with this only. We can see the slides. Yeah, there won't be much to. So, uh, coming to the my lecture, we are talking about the topic is exploration principles and methods of exploration and general collection. So, the, in that regard, I would start from the diversity PGR, which we are dealing that exists at the three levels. means at the genetic diversity uh, in the inside in the plants or the species and species level of diversity you know as this there are several plant species crops which we are dealing with and ecosystem level diversity so we are deal at the three level of the diversity which you people all know why we collecting germ plasm because there is always demand uh, for the different purposes and that demand is unpredictable and that uh, but we need to prioritize that at the species level geographic regions level which i already told you that exist and clear need exist and uh, that comes from the breeders ho gaya symbol udhar dikhai de raha okay diversity that represents or sometimes missing or insufficiently represented sir, collected sir sorry to okay. interrupt you your slides are not moving sir still we are seeing the first slide only Oh, I must again stop sharing. Yes, sir. Okay. Share screen. Then basic advanced files. It is showing. Then I must show. Yeah, please come soon. Our bites now. This is my desktop. It is showing. This is my presentation. Uh, okay. Yeah. So should I stop this presentation? Yeah, mm -hmm. से बंद कर दूँ फिर इसको. Okay, now I have closed the. Okay, now again. Okay, so yes, 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 it is here. It is at the desktop. Okay, I char. See that is sir down sir lecture hotty jump plus yeah 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 okay double click okay that's why I kept it open <laughs> okay. 
Now it is visible. And so on. No, sir. Not yet. Why? It's, uh, no, only your window is visible, sir. My God, then. But... Sir, uh, copy the file to the desktop, please, and keep it open first. And then you. Uh, yeah, it was like that earlier. Sir, otherwise, you, if you can mail your PPT, we can share it from here. No, we have to, it uh, is to be converted into the, okay, I have kept it open. Yes, slide so. Okay. Now I'm going to the share screen. Then this one. It is basic advanced files optimized for video clip. Is it? Yeah, now it is coming, sir. So let us see whether it is moving. Please it's change the slide and see, sir. Yeah. It is changing. Yes, sir. Now? now it is moving, sir. Yeah. Okay. Please go ahead, sir. Okay, then coming to the importance of the germ plug, uh, we uh, yesterday already Dr. Pradeep and others in the training would have emphasized that, uh, but there is a very important thing that there are several varieties have been directly released. The germ plug we have collected and have been released as a variety. There are some examples like in mango. These are the mango, citrus, the sari, langra, chosa, like that, malda, the citrus. There are several species, several germ plasm or elite trees which have been collected and have been directly released as a variety with little selections or something like that. So more than 80 genetic stocks or trait specific accession have been identified from the collected germ plasm registered by the NBPGR also. Why we collect the germ plasm? Because there is a always threat, loss of genetic diversity, the erosion is always taking place and habitat loss is going on because of the anthropogenic activities, including the infrastructure development activities, expansion of roads, et cetera, et cetera encroachment in the forests, then uh, monoculture of hiding varieties, uh, that's also leading to the loss of the general plage. erosion is taking place, the, these are some of the natural calamities, disease also occurs, my this invasive action species also you can see in the pictures also how the things can are changing but uh, there are, are from where to collect in the context that in these these are some important fruit crops which i have given over here and some diversity rich areas have been identified for these crops which are very important in the country mango banana jackfruit jamun aula citrus these are our uh, crops which have have origin in the country and has good diversity and these are the areas have been given because of limitation of the time I will go past. These are the accessions have been collected from different areas in these important crops which I have highlighted there is that may be the picture the numbers may not be correct because the, we don't have the exact information but this is a it's, but the maximum collections are in mango banana and citrus. Just we need to emphasize, we should go for more collections. Coming to the wild relatives, there are some, there, these are some of the facts which Dr. Pradeep had also yesterday uh, told you uh, that agriculture began around 10,000 years ago when the first farmers started gathering seeds, it's wild plants. And they were, they are having a very broad genetic base. And uh, because of the domestication, we have improved them, but they possess the genes. Uh, because of their biogenetic background uh, for the disease and pest resistance, adaptability, biotic biotic stress also, Dr. Rudeep must yesterday inform. So these are very important, which are also forms part of the exploration and general plasma collection. Uh, and now the world over, the focus is on crop wild relatives because in the cultivated crops, good significant amount of the general plasma has already been collected. Okay, uh, this is a number of some of the 
wild species available in the country in the fruit crops like this man mango we have salvatica and the malaga sicimensis in musa we have several species in citrus also several rare species have been given so i will because of the limitation i will leave them so these are some of the numbers i have given over here then there are diversity rich areas in tropical subtropical fruits which i have given over here in the north east southern region these regions are important uh, important because we have to look for these species these are the mostly wild species and the under utilized or the minor fruit species i have given over here for this this northeastern region is we should look for citrus and uh, mangifera sylvatica musa gangetic plains cordia and umbilica etc like this it has been given some brand endemic rare species also we have given fruits have been given here coming to the nbpgr which is a nodal institute at the national level for management of plant genetic resources and the its activity starts first from the exploration and collection for which what are, what are the principles method i am talking to you then we characterize evaluate different four different traits an important part is conserve in the gene bank in the form of the gene bank dr vina will be explaining to you next in the next lecture we supply to the inventors import export of pgr like this is maintained database this is the another important part we carry out this activity involving the uh, crop based institutes uh, which are working on this like there are the subtropical horticulture institute for the mango etc then temperate fruit species there is cit srinagar then ihr is also looking after the crops of the north of the southern india and we have northeastern part also so they are we have institute for mosha we have for grapes we have for banana uh, Uh, we have for other some uh, citrus also there are crop based institutes we carry out in, uh, involving these activities involving the these nodal centers so their the role is to identify the breeding needs or the requirements then check for availability in the national gene bank or national region plot sites through correspondence with the gen plot exchange division of mbpgr or conservation division then if uh, the material is available make the intent for supply of the gen plot if not available then contact us and we jointly can make exploration or submit the for the exploration proposals which we can include in the five year plan or can take up immediately on urgent cases so but the nbpr the nodal institute for maintaining database also pgr uh, and this is important to avoid duplicate collection this database is important so for that we you need to submit the proposal well in advance because we prepared the national exploration plan uh, by the 15th and circulated by the 15th of march every year because first april from first april onward the every year the exploration activity starts for the next year according to the financial year of the country so the activity starts this from the in the month of january itself and before that also so that's we should receive the net well in advance coming to this chat lecture Uh, on exploration principles methods this is the exploration that requires three phases means the planning first for exploration mission these things will be explained in next lecture next slides collecting procedures recording informations then post collection handling of the material these will be the my lecture will be categorized into three parts coming to the planning so coming to the fruit species uh, which differs from other crops species for the reasons that they are adapted to the wide range of ecological conditions many are in the wild form semi domestic form they are perennial trees and under some of them are under domestication stage their plants could be in the form of farmers field or in the wild many of them are outcrossing that's why high level levels of intra specific variations is there as accordingly sampling strategy frequency will vary many do not flower every year like in mango they have periodicity then base of fruit to seed mass is often high handling processing the uh, techniques vary very accordingly decalcitrant <coughs> dr vina will be telling many seeds are decalcitrant that require specific conservation protocols then many in many cases elite material we, we have to collect the vegetative material require immediate transportation and uh, some are heights so specialized harvesting techniques are required so we collect for three purposes for immediate use that is breeding program and or elite material conservation for genetic for posterity the taxonomic phytosystematic studies 
the general purpose is to collect the maximum genetic representation of the population without damage to the population but in case of rescue collecting we can collect the material and dark material also another important thing is traits are highly heritable then phenotypic selection based on the fruit color shape taste leaf shape etc would be effective so that's that's gives us the opportunity to have the material of the truly uh, means the true to type material third purpose is to identify cross relatives crops which help strategizing the species for collection etc we conduct three type of explorations first one is the multi crop exploration mission that is region specific exploration and we collect almost all the pgr material species under the multi crop exploration that is region based another is crop species or trait specific missions we collect in which the only one or two crops are taken or the biotic stress biotic stress trait are targeted third one is the rescue missions which are conducted in the areas going to be taken over by the dams or the cyclones etc have come over there so we conduct the rescue missions this is the uh, parts where we have shown their rescue missions have been conducted in over the country and uh, international missions of course are not uh, be, being taken care, carried out now but in the past including several countries these international missions exploration have been conducted these are diversity rich areas so coming to the national exploration plan which we communicate for the for the entire nation in the month of in uh, by the 15th march so that includes the region means that the species crops like this this is for wild species of vigna for natural pradesh we give we take mostly maximum three dis three districts three two to three districts uh, if it is a multi crop or the something like, like like that the period is defined over here but the, we think period will come in next slide also who is the team leader who are the collaborator like that i have given the prepared communicated coming to the prioritized species prioritization is very essential because we in the pgr we are dealing more than 1500 species and horticulture is a very big very wide group which consists of several vegetables floriculture then fruits myda fruit so many species much more than the cultivated this agricultural field crops what we have so we must prioritize the crops and species coming so that is very important with respect to the wild relatives because in the wild relatives we have gene pool 1 2 and 3 So this is very important. What are should be the criteria to prioritize them? Economic importance, then immediate need, then threat level, conservation requirement, gene pool collecting. That, but that again depends upon the based on the resources. How much farm field we have, so that in like this we can conserve in the field gene bank. Like that, these are the things which we have to take. This is a picture which you are seeing here. Uh, so in the species distribution distribution 16 wild species of solanum in india then uh, these are the uh, total 969 accessions and 16 wild species of solanum because the science, some of the scientists are from vegetables are also attending this so these are the list of the species different figures we have shown over here so where they are distributed this is mapping georeferencing which are also help us in for, in finding which area find the gaps which area we should collect it and we should go for that so these things these also help in that very essential for that then coming to the acquiring information about the area which we have to which we have to uh, explore collect etc so these are the uh, which how can we gather the information that requires uh, we that requires before going for exploration or to a particular area we need to have the things like the floristic and botanical literature we need have to consult visit the local national area earlier exploration reports but we should know the biological characteristics of the targeted crops like the breeding system floridity level pollen efficiency what is the stand size etc seed dispersal mechanism that gives us the then viability and response to seed multiplication field gene bank these are the important things which we must know before venturing on a crop or a species for the exploration and collection like the insect bird pollinated species have more than diversity among populations so that we have to take more samples in case of cross pollinated crops so these are the the things database of the npgr website you can see 
which can provide you the information about the gaps, how it has been collected, but we have to, from where we have to target one. So these are different apps uh, available on that BPGR website. You can look at, uh, there might be some lecture also for this aspect. There are three types of survey, uh, two types of survey, but we conduct force grid survey is in, in, a, in unexplored areas, which is meant to capture overall variability, mostly around 50 kilometer distance. But then the then second one is fine grid survey. That is to build up more collections for a particular species from the identified pockets, which were earlier already explored. So around 15 kilometer area like that grids are made. So that uh, that we made. So revisit has to be are also required when material is not conjured or uh, because all the material what we collected do not go to the gene bank. Around 90% is going to the gene bank. So all do not qualify. And uh, in some cases, we have to go again to collect the sufficient material, some vegetatively material collected that are not necessary, that will survive. It happens. So revisions have to uh, to uh, have where we have poor ecological coverage also, or we are going for trait specific plus with revisions. Important thing is we require prior permission in protected areas, wildlife areas, national park, wildlife sanctuary. This is a throughout the country. This is very important. We have to follow. Coming to the, the this training part, uh, that uh, explorer must have good knowledge of PGR. He should be physically fit person, capable with standing difficult situations, and he should be a good driver also during the need. Coming to the plan, uh, planning part, collectors would make itinerary, means daily tour program, where they be, he would be visiting, he would be halting, etc., and he should well liaison with the collaborator well in advance for that uh, uh, tour program, etc., must be given in the well in advance, then that he, he should make itinerary like that, that uh, day wise, then departure, halt, route, distance, kilometer. Uh, that these are the things one has to plan. Then coming to the activities, establishing contacts is very essential with the grassroots level person like KVKs and others, local institutions where reserved accommodation well in advance and remind before departure. And uh, the team, I'm is very, I'm very much particular about the team should be two or three persons team because in the vehicle you should have a, a space uh, for if you require one person from the local or the farmer, you tell you have to give uh, take along with you in the vehicle. So there are only four seats available in the more generally vehicle. So you are already three person. There should be space for the fourth persons also in the vehicle because uh, one is driver and five seater vehicles are there. So three members maximum. Then 60 to 80 kilometer per day traveling, 10 kilometer on foot. These are the things which uh, daily routine we have to plan well in advance. These are equipments have been already communicated to you. Uh, very essential to carry with you. I already given in the booklet. After reaching at the okay, after reaching at the site point, you should contact to the your local local persons, local uh, representatives like KVK or others to whom, and to make the your itinerary discuss with them. Make the planning how you will be proceeding from that which place where there. Then that should be fine tuned. Then you must also visit the exhibitions also, uh, if happens, that gives you the good uh, fair level of the diversity exists in that area. If there is this uh, fair uh, or some uh, exhibitions are conducted by the department or are organized, this is a kind of the thing which I have seen in the Lehe, where I, when I was in the Lehe on exploration. So I found this, these things, temperate food diversity, by the lay of the Ladakh. This you must give, visit that gives you the diversity exist in that area. Like you should also go to keep plan to visiting the local market also. Uh, vegetable market, fruit market, or these things you should visit that gives you the fair chance of visiting, uh, seeing what the diversity exists in their area because all the material comes to these places. 
coming to the collecting part, then the PGR exists in the form, uh, species, subspecies level, varieties, all improved varieties, wild forms uh, that you can collect from orchards, home gardens, backyard, and botanical gardens, like that. Then what to collect? Then you require seed, fruits, vegetables, fuel in the meristem also, pollens also, for herbarium also. These are different uh, forms for what purposes you have to collect. Uh, means the genetic diversity augmentation is collection in the form of seeds or the sample population is preferred for immediate use. You require elite trees or the, uh, the signs also. And uh, like that, cyanur, stogur, baru. In case of recalcitrant species, then the fruits are collected. Uh, like that, these are the genetic diversity, sample of the populations of the selected tree species. That uh, these are the things which you have to follow. This is a glimpse of the PGR that exists. That is the part which we have to collect. When to collect? In which week? That is the most important part. Uh, we see we go for exploration around 15 days uh, 12 to 12 days is minimum ascension okay so that you get 10 days in the field to cover two districts like that so but which are those two weeks of that year or that particular part that you should be there right time and right place this is very important most important part if you are early or late you will be losing missing a lot of the material uh, so start exploration when the fruits are physiologically mature, say five to seven days before flower drop. In case of vegetative propagation species, twice you have to visit. First, you have to identify the or mark the trees for collection. Then uh, second time you go for sign or budwood collection. Okay, flowering season is best for herbarium, but important thing is avoid days of festivals and election. And in Northeast, the Sundays, the church day. From where to start collect the material, that's the center of origin offers, like in several crops, I indicated uh, fruit species in India having origin, and they are the best chance for the desired trace pest resistance controlled by dominant gene. Priority should be fragile seed ecosystems, uh, like coastal areas, swamps, etc., for adapted variables. Transition zones between different subspecies uh, gives you the chance of a lot of morphological variations, altitudinal, latitudinal changes, make variation, fruiting quality, size of fruits, active ingredients. So these are the things which you have to take care of in mind to capture the entire variability or different type of material. Uh, hot spots for particular pests should be looked at for resistant material, uh, abiotic stress tolerance, the environment under which uh, Fruit tree species grew can be taken as a yard stick. These are from where to start collecting. Start collecting from the drier tracks. This is a picture of the Rajasthan coming to the central part. So you start from the uh, because the batch. If you look at the fruits maturity uh, in mango, it starts from the south and reaches towards the north side. Even in the hilly areas, also plains to the high hills. But I am showing over there. Go to the reaches valleys. Because the maturity goes on or moves, transfers like that. Coming to the plan in the particular area, make a plan so that you go from this part and return from the covering another area. So that gives you the maximum uh, chance to cover the maximum possible areas. Okay. So, but certain areas like Janskar Valley, there you have no choice. You have to come back the same place, some same route, same road. Okay. Coming to the collecting, important in case of fruits is check for empty fruits, immature seeds. Okay. Then uh, how we have, in which part, how they have to transport it, what are the things required? These are the things which uh, we have to use. I'm skipping this. How much to collect is important for the self pollinated crops we use. We require 2000 seeds and for cross pollinated crops, we require 4000 seeds. This is the gene bank madam will be telling you. Apart from this, there is a requirement for characterization evaluation and related studies. Accordingly, the number more numbers would be required. For vegetative propagules, uh, we have to collect the signs and the budding grafting, the sample size, 
means how much number that depends upon the number of food stock you have but should not be less than 10 percentage so that at least eight crops survive then in case of cutting rooter suckers 15 to 20 uh, these cuttings 8 to 10 inch would be sufficient take supplementary sample for both seed vegetative propagules if you are taking the material like seed also or for vegetable also and but give the same collector number the important is the collector number should be the same to the both material vegetative material you have different type of materials like rooted suckers root cutting suit cuttings and uh, they are different uh, things which you have to methods which you have to deal with them like different sizes like soft wood cutting do not store well so we have you have to transport them immediately in an ornamental medicine leafy cuttings also smaller size hardwood like these are the some things which you have to uh, take care of by leaving these things the sampling coming to the sampling method sample should capture 95 percent genes the certainty of all alleles in the, at the random locus there so that at the frequency with greater than 0.5 that's 95 percent allele should be captured in the our samples for particular area random sampling we follow uh, by collecting single spike panicle fruit berry etc like for at least from 50 plants it's possible in the wheat maize etc rice etc but very difficult in case of the pumpkin you see are seeing how much pumpkin you can collect and you have to take from the farmer uh, the farmer would definitely may spare you only one pumpkin but what but that doesn't yield you give you the sufficient number of seed also so we also face a serious problem with respect to the vegetative these vegetables uh, the problem of the cross pollinated seed giant bank requires 4000 seeds to get the 4000 seeds how much pumpkin are required and how much to take the from where to, to take the sample this is a real problem so we had devised we have with dr veena had had meeting so agreed that at least 1000 seeds they will agree now they have agreed finally to keep in that those excuse such me sir Sir, we are yeah. running short of time, please. Um, yes, 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 yes. Collecting technique, you know very well. I know. Well, 30 is going. Yes. Different collecting techniques are there, which you have to look at. Then equipments are there, which you require. Then root stocks can be carried at the explosion area, grafted, the batch grafting you can see over here. Then uh, they are le leaving that. We have nest and national herbarium cultivated plants, which you can look at for that uh, conservation. Uh, contact after reaching the point, you have to take care of certain things. Uh, be very informal. Understand that you are one of them. Is people are best source for information means custodian farmers. Then uh, these are the things which you have to take care of. Uh, be polite with the ladies, respectful to them then drivers should never be involved in the task of collecting locating the material as you vehicle is required appropriate clothing then some several things which you have to do is so there are certain things to do which you require already communicated in the lecture you require forest guard also in the forest difficult areas disturbed areas and how to handle the material that fully mature seeds like that and the fruits, the calcitrant seed, they are different. But frequently inspect the material fruits while during the transportation or when you are every day, you are reaching over there. Really inspect the material in the room that before going to see your, how it is to be processed during exploration, how the herbariums are being made and carry out. So this is the passport data which we prepare which you have to fill up every detailed information to be recorded in the field outside which uh, leaving here then in situ in case of the fruit trees you can may go for in situ characterization also because uh, establishing developing them that PPFRA has already accepted this fact that in situ characterization for the registration is possible in the orchard at the site of the things which you can look at uh, yes for the fruit trees and perennial tree species post collection handling uh, several things post collection handling means there for conservation and to the seed multiplication characterization and extraction packaging deposition drying report writing etc 
This is the report which you have to write after the completion of the exploration. This I will take and sum or transuma two minutes, uh, two more yes, things. Sir. Uh, yeah, uh, IC number I am dealing with. Issuing the IC number, whatever the material you are collecting, you are giving sending to me as in the head exploration division for IC number. So these are the things. This is a collector number is a first identity of your material or your sample, which you have to give them. And it's always remains, even, even the IC number is issued, this is always remain with that. And we do recognize through this ones also. So these are the things you know very well, biological stresses, I will come in the next slides, and the things you face problem, many of you, uh, how to fill this information. So these are already given, you see the, uh, this is the website on the website downloads and uh, CID. This is the and the PGR website from where you can download this passport. This form can fill up and send to me for that. But there are tips are given below that in the each performer. And you can add the number of uh, uh, rows in that as per your need. Okay. So in case of the material developed at your research institute building line or something like that so you don't have village mandal district state etc so the location of the institute in the latitude longitude at of your farm where you have developed the building line or material can be filled over there here also you can give the details of the location of your institute or the farm here also so these are the things which you people find it difficult so these are the Sample method, habitat, so these are given in the tips also there. Coming to the biological status on which my colleagues at the MBPGR, they remind me, they are stuck on this matter too much. So this is also which you have to take care of wild, photo wild, BD, land race, breeding line. These things you have to fill up in the biological status. So this was all about the exploration and collection principles and method because of the limitation time, I have to speed up. So it's exactly around 12, half an hour. I could finish. So I skip and thank you, sir. how to stop sharing. You have done it. Okay, thank you. Thank you, sir, for that comprehensive lecture on the principles and methods in germplasm exploration. I hope the participants could clearly understand the gist of exploration, sampling methodology, types of collection missions, planning the collection missions, etc. Sir, we profusely thank you for joining us in this session. Can we yeah. have a small quiz on based on sir's lecture? Yes, yes definitely, definitely. Yes, sir. Sridhar, sir, please post the question link. Participants, That's please note that uh, we have a quiz based on this session. Uh, Sridhar, sir? No, yes, yeah. done. Yeah. Sridhar is also there. <laughs> Join your good team. Eh? Yes, sir. Dr. Veena has also joined. Our next speaker. Ah, Dr. Veena is already waiting in queue. <laughs> Participants, please start attending the question. If they have any question, let us go for that. Yeah. Yeah, As of now, we have not received any queries on the chat box, sir. If that means they have understood very well. Eh? <laughs> no, I think we can expect a few more questions later, sir, that we will be sharing with you. Okay. So thank you very much for this is a very important aspect. We should thank you, sir. We should thank you. No, see, that's a, this is very important from my side also because yeah, 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 yeah. we conduct exploration involving and issue IC number also. So this gives us the opportunity to explain our part, how we carry out uh, to tell them, okay, how we yeah. carry, how the things are to be proceed. But and to you, uh, IC no PGR activities. Yeah, IC number is being taken and by uh, the uh, one more thing I tell you, sir. Uh, if I send anything uh, to you, the, the response is very quick. Morning, I will send the next day morning, I will get yeah. the response from you. I yeah, really yeah. appreciate your uh, the quickness and all your uh, colleagues also equally res uh, responsive for all the yeah, our, uh, Dr. Veena is main, sir, is for that material which she is handling. Okay. So our response and final things depend Dr. Veena when she yeah, gives yeah, yeah. the final uh, okay, 
accepted by the gene bank then only we are able to give the so yes. i must thank her we both are thanking to her okay. how much the response quick response depends upon her so thank you very much for thank giving you, me this opportunity to explain about the activity yes. of this ndtgr and the which we are dealing so that we could reach to the scientists to explain them tell them so that the work gets smooth Yes. And function B function work. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, sir. May I leave now? Yeah. Thanks. So we have got almost uh, forty-seven responses for the multiple choice questions quiz. And uh, all of them answered. Yeah, now uh, well, it's fifty-two. Yeah, except the last question. Okay, yeah. that Dr. Veena, that was the last question. Two thousand, four thousand seats I asked. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much, sir. It was such a okay. nice, efficient uh, okay. session, sir. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. Now, sir, we can close the uh, MCQ, sir. Yes. Yeah. Thanks. Once we collect the germplasm, it's very crucial to conserve the, this valuable genetic material without losing their viability for future use. Yes, we have today with us one of the most experienced conservation specialists, Dr. Veena Gupta, madam, from NBPG in New Delhi, to enlighten us on the principles and methods, principles, methods, and prospects of seed conservation in horticultural crops. Let me introduce, madam. Dr. Veena Gupta is currently heading the division of germplasm conservation ICR NBPG in New Delhi and is actively engaged in the area of plant genetic resources conservation for the past 32 years. Madam's scientific contribution in the area of plant genetic resources are well appreciated. Madam had published more than 70 research papers and two books in her area of expertise. She has been endowed with many awards and fellows of the leading scientific societies of India. Dr. Veena has been bestowed with Dr. Sabut Sahu Lifetime Achievement Award for her outstanding contributions to the plant genetic resources conservation and management by evasion. Madam Veena has been elected as fellow of several scientific societies such as Indian Society of Seed Technology, Indian Society for Plant Genetic Resources, etc. Dr. Veena was trained about the IPR governing regulations during advanced training on genetic resources and intellectual property at Swedish International Developmental Corporation Agency, Sweden, and Agricultural Research Council of South Africa. Uh, she has been nominated as honorary member of Indian Industrial Hemp Association and Medicinal Plants Expert for DD Kisan channel of Delhi Durdarshan. As a professor for the postgraduate school IARI, Dr. Veena had guided two MSc students and six PhD students for their degrees in plant genetic resources. Ma'am, I would request you to kindly make your presentation on seed conservation of horticultural genetic resources. Ma'am, please. Thank you, ma'am, for such a nice introduction and uh, a very uh, warm good afternoon to all the trainees. And now I will be, uh, you have listened to Dr. Ahilawar about the collection of the germplasm of different horticultural crops, how they uh, collect it. And finally, it comes to us for the conservation of the germplasm. So I will start uh, sharing my presentation. Okay, can everybody uh, see this? Is it visible? Ma'am, we can see the slide, but it's not in the slideshow mode. Yeah, I'll, I'll change it. Okay. Slideshow me, Jani. Okay. Slideshow me, kyu nahi aara? Usme to aana chahiye isko. Ma'am, please open your uh, PPT in the window and keep screen sharing. Mm -hmm. Yes, screen sharing hai or is ko me slideshow mode me kar but uh, yeah, now it is there. Yeah, now it is coming. Man. Okay. Okay, then uh, again a warm welcome to all the trainees. I will be uh, t uh, telling you about the principles, methods, and prospects of seed conservation in the horticultural crops. Okay, so. Uh, to apprise you a little bit about the institution from where I belong, NBPGR is working actively in the service of nation for achieving sustainable food security and conserving the 
germplasm, plant genetic resources for sustainable agricultural production. So these are our uh, earlier all directors under whose guidance we have worked. And now NBPGR is a leading institute in the uh, country as well as at the global level for plant genetic resources management and conservation. So all you know that plant genetic resources are the backbone of agriculture. Uh, no crop improvement program or any uh, variety release program can be completed without the contribution of plant genetic resources. So the NBPGR is playing an active role through various activities. The first activity is the PGR acquisition through exploration or import, which uh, Dr. Ahlawat has already told you. Uh, then we have a quarantine division, which helps in the pest-free conservation of the germplasm in the National Gene Bank. We are, uh, we are conserving the gene, uh, germplasm in long-term conservation in the National Gene Bank at minus 20. And also the other uh, germplasm, which cannot be conserved as seeds in the field repositories at different national active germplasm sites. Then conservation activity is well supported by the characterization and evaluation of this germplasm for efficient utilization. And utilization is further enhanced by the database management so that all the information uh, which is generated through these activities is digitized in the form of various databases and uh, computer apps. Then also NBPGR is entrusted with the activity of DNA fingerprinting for IPR protection for the varieties and for the germplasm also. So the evolution of germ, uh, NBPGR in terms of infrastructure and activity, NBPGR was started as a small division of plant introduction uh, way back in 1976. And till 1985, the main activity was the exploration and collection. Then we have the dynamic leadership of Dr. R.S. Karuda, and the, a lot of infrastructure was developed through international collaborations as well as national collaborations. And we have developed the National Gene Bank, the Tissue Culture Facility, the Cryo Gene Bank Facility. From 96 to 2005, this under the NATP project, which was again a very effective project where lots of conservation, lot of exploration activities and finally, the conservation of germplasm was emphasized. And then in from 2006 to 16, we have many projects like NICRA, NAIP project, and now we are having a CRP project where large scale characterization of trait specific, uh, basically the trait specific evaluation and basic research along with PGR informatics was given emphasis. And today we have the highly modernized gene bank with the latest technology of refrigeration, then evaluation of potential crops. Today we are doing using the latest techniques like drone techniques, we are uh, collecting the data. And then as Dr. Ahlawat has told you in the previous lecture, land races and crop Y relatives are now the major targets for the future conservation collection and characterization. So NBPGA has a close, very uh, close network of 10 regional stations in different agroclimatic zones of India. And these stations are mainly uh, involved in the collection, conservation, and characterization of the crops of their respective areas so that the full gamut of biodiversity occurring in the uh, Indian subcontinent is conserved and taken care. So coming to the National Gene Bank Network, we, uh, this National Gene Bank Network at LCR and BPGR which is responsible for the conservation activity has three different uh, uh, three different uh, activities. One is the seed gene bank, which is the long term modules at minus eighteen degrees centigrade. Then we have medium term modules plus four to plus eight degrees centigrade. Then we have in vitro gene banks, six culture rooms which are maintained at twenty five plus minus two degrees centigrade. Cryobanks, where in liquid nitrogen, the germplasm is conserved. In addition to this, some of the field, uh, field gene banks we have, uh, basically in our or regional stations, and also at the national active germplasm sites, where, uh, which are 59 in number, and uh, they are also maintaining medium term module, as well as the field gene banks for the uh, perennial species. So, uh, 
as dr elawat has already told you germplasm conservation basically the conservation depends upon the reproductive biology of a particular species because we are dealing with a large number of plants uh, with a large number of biodiversity which have different storage behavior and reproductive biology so the seeds basically there are two different type of seeds orthodox and recalcitrant seeds orthodox seeds as you all know they can be dried up to a lower moisture of 5 to 7% without losing any seed viability so the seed conservation is the major activity at national gene bank which i am looking after then uh, there are recalcitrant type of species where you uh, if you dry the seeds like uh, coffee seeds or tea seeds or uh, jackfruit seeds if you dry them they lose their viability and hence uh, the viability is lost so they cannot be conserved in the gene bank so they for them cryo preservation is the best option then some of the vegetatively propagated species or clonally propagated species tissue culture facility is available at nbpgr and these two activities cryo preservation and in vitro will be covered by my uh, colleague dr anuradha agarwal in the later uh, lecture then field gene bank where perennial species like tree species uh, are conserved in the at the national active germplasm sites mainly for the horticultural crops then on farm conservation is dr elawat i think he he might have told about this also then apart from these four activities the one activity as per the cbd and F itpgrfa guidelines we have to go for the safety duplicates so the for the safety conservation of the gene bank collections like on the uh, uh, path of uh, this uh, solber gene bank we are also now planning to have a safety gene bank uh, in uh, himalayan region so these are the basic activities at the germplasm conservation now the gene bank as you know this is the second largest seed gene bank in the world the uh, npgr gene bank then world's largest multi crop in vitro gene bank because most of the countries uh, uh, globally in world they have single species uh, in vitro gene banks but we have a multi crop in vitro gene bank then our cryo bank is asia's largest cryo bank so this is uh, these are the some of the diversity uh, photographs which are conserved in the in these three uh, uh, parts of the gene bank so now coming to the uh, main topic that is the principles and uh, methods for seed gene bank conservation so at seed gene bank we have three different type of storage where we are conserving the germplasm and that this storage depends upon the uh, time or purpose of the germplasm or the seed for which purpose we are going to conserve one is the short term storage where the material is stored for 12 to 18 months and it is conserved at 18 to 20 degree centigrade rh is 45 to 50% and we can conserve it in either in the cloth bags paper bags or glass bottles they are mainly for the short term uh, and uh, they are uh, under the you can say the, they are also the active collections they can be dis for distribution also and also for the experimental purposes then the second type is the medium term storage which uh, the storage period is 5 to 10 years temperature 4 to 10 degrees rs 35 to 40 and the containers you can use these plastic bottles or even the cloth bags you can use paper bags metal cans uh, and glass bottles also you can use uh, the, these collections are called as the active collections and these can be Uh, these are mainly for the distribution or for the uh, other uh, purposes for the experiments then finally is the long term conservation long term conservation as the name suggests it is the uh, conservation for posterity so the storage period is beyond 50 years and temperature minus 18 to minus 20 and because this this is a very low temperature we don't have any uh, control on the rh so for the processing of samples for long term conservation you have to process your seed very precisely following the international guidelines for gene bank conservation very strictly so that the viability is not lost during the storage okay so now we will see how we process the samples and what is the methodology for processing for the long term conservation so this is the flow chart of all the activities which we are 
taking care of at the national gene bank so as you know there are two different sources from where we receive the material for conservation one is the exploration which you have just now uh, dr alawat has told and the other is the import samples from the exchange which comes from the uh, outside the country so whatever is the source of the material we have to have the precise verification of the documents so that the material can be traced back if in case of the emergency so for verification of documents if it is a germ plasm we need to have the passport data sheet the passport data sheet which dr alawat has shown i will also show you in the later slides then second is material which we are receiving are the release varieties so in case of release varieties we need the proposal the release variety proposal and the proceedings of the uh, meeting where this variety has been proposed for release so these are the two important documents which should be there with the proposal of release variety for for giving the ic number or for conservation in the national gene bank because now it is mandatory from the cvrc that whenever you are going to release a variety you have to submit a sample to the national gene bank and get the ic number and the acknowledgement certificate which is submitted to the cvrc then the third type of material is the registered material which is an activity which was given to nbpgr in 1996 and uh, this activity is just to give us of protection to the material which has been developed during the development of a variety and cannot be released as a variety so the breeders have uh, uh, their germplasm can be registered here in the uh, germplasm registration committee and the registration performa this activity is now 100% online and you have to fill that performa submit it and then the process starts here so after verification if all the documents are complete this material is given a dq number that is the domestic quarantine and in case of the imported material it is the iq number so iq number is given by the exchange division and dq number is given by the conservation division after this the material is entered in the ghu database where all the samples which uh, anybody sends it is entered and then they are checked for their duplicates in the national gene bank like if we have received this sample earlier also based on the passport data or not or on the basis of the collector number so if the sample is unique then this sample then we check for the seed quantity as dr ahlawar told 2000 seeds for the self pollinated 4000 for the cross pollinated and some of the difficult species 1000 seeds like in vegetable crops and in crop wild relatives and some of the endangered or rt species even uh, 500 seeds we can uh, uh, get we can conserve in the gene bank but they should be with high viability so if all these conditions are fulfilled by the sample then this sample is cleaned for any debris or infested or broken seeds after cleaning this seed is then sent to the plant quarantine division for checking any infestation or infection so after this if this sample is cleared from the plant quarantine division then it comes to the again to the ghu that is the germplasm handling unit and from here it is sent to the crop curator so we have 10 different crop curators based on the crop groups and then they test for the viability if the viability is above 85 seed quantity is uh, as per the standard the sample is accepted and registered in the national gene bank with an ic number which is given uh, through exploration division by the acmu agriculture uh, management uh, division and then it is the whole information is fed into the database and the sample is conserved in the national gene bank at any step if we uh, have any controversy or any uh, no is there then we uh, again go back to the don uh, donor or for more information or if the seed quantity is less then we ask them uh, we send the material for regeneration or multiplication and after getting it back then the whole process is again repeated and the samples are uh, conserved in the national gene bank so this is the basic major activities which are taking place at the national gene bank for conservation of the germplasm
So these are some of the slides that show how we process, like seed cleaning. We clean the because sometimes we get the seeds with lot of debris with all other material also because while collection you should take care that other seeds or the uh, the seeds should be collected will be in the purified form and they should be at the physiologically mature state because immature states they uh, the seeds will not germinate and the percentage germination will be less and the seed sample will be rejected so the whole process of your collection and your efforts go waste so it is it is uh, uh, advisable that at the very first step you should take care of all the precautions the do's and don'ts of collection as well as for the which are mandatory for the conservation then moisture testing of the sample because we are conserving the sample at minus 18 degree centigrade so the moisture has to be low up to 5% or 7%, 5 to 7% is the range, standard range. So for monitoring that, uh, International Seed Testing Association, ESTA, has devised methods for different crops. Like for ma majority of the crops, we take uh, high temperature oven method, that is 130 degrees centigrade at one hour for the moisture testing. If the seeds are very large, like acacia seeds or cassia seeds, we broke the seeds in smaller uh, pieces and then uh, test the moisture using the uh, uh, using the oven method but mainly for the oil seed crops where the uh, water is uh, the oil is present and it can hinder at uh, minus uh, at 130 degree centigrade so the moisture testing is done by low temperature oven method that is 103 degree centigrade for 17 hours then after the, the testing the moisture but seed viability testing that is again given by the ESTA. Some of the medicinal plants and uh, our indigenous crops, they have not been uh, covered under the ESTA uh, methodology. So we are devising germination protocols as well as seed dormancy protocols for these difficult species, basically the medicinal plants, the wild species, RET species, and crop wild relatives. And then they uh, the normal seedlings are counted for the percentage of germination. The methods, either it can be in the, uh, depending upon the size of the seed, it can be in the petri plates. If the seeds are large, you can use the in-between paper methods for the germination of the seeds, uh, germination of the seeds. Now, suppose the seed, they do not germinate, but they are also not dead. That means they are fresh, ungerminated seeds and maybe dormant. So, for checking the viability of such type of seeds, TTC method has been uh, devised by ESTA and we differentiate between the viable and dead tissue of the embryo on the basis of their relative respiration rate in the hydrated state. So TTC test is done, that is the tetrazoleum uh, test, which uh, gives a very beautiful red, pink to red color. And uh, on scoring this, we uh, check the viability of the seed samples. So uh, you can see that these, uh, these are the abnormal seedlings of uh, triticum estivum. So the seeds uh, germination scoring is done and these abnormal seedlings are discarded during the uh, counting for the seed viability because they will not give good germination in the field if these seeds are grown. And these are the viable seeds and non-viable seeds uh, using the TTC test. So you can see that the embryo part is very uh, beautifully stained so these seeds are viable, whereas when it is not stained or feebly stained or partly stained, these seeds are non-viable and will not give germination in the field. So this type of scoring is very essential uh, and one should have to have a, a perfect uh, uh, skills to score these seeds. Now, once the germination is done and moisture is tested, if the seeds are high moisture, then the drying is done. And these, this seed drying is done in a specially designed rooms. We have a seed dryer room, which is maintained at 15% RH and 15 degree centigrade temperature, where the material is kept in muslin cloth bags, which are moisture impervious. And these, um, they are kept for different uh, times, depending upon the type of the seeds, like oil seeds, they lose moisture very uh, uh, easily and in a short span, whereas some uh, seeds like maize, they need low, um, more time for the moisture to come down. After the moisture is up to the standard, then these seeds are packed because we are keeping it at minus 20. So they are capped in a specially designed aluminum foul pouches, which are made 
uh, with using uh, three layer uh, pouches are these outer polyester layer of 12 microns, middle aluminum uh, foil layer 12 microns, and then innermost is the polythene layer, which is 250 microns. And then these samples are hermetically sealed with the sealers, uh, removing all the air. So they are vacuum sealed in this type of uh, 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 in this type of uh, aluminum foil packets. And after this, the whole information about the sample, it is fed into our gene bank information management system, that is the GBMs. And here this information is set. Then the labels are taken out. Now we have the barcode labels for our samples. So all these barcode labels and this information is pasted on the samples. And then these samples, they found a location in the module as per the crops and are conserved in the gene bank. So once conserved, we uh, do not touch the samples. We do not take it out unless and until when monitoring is required. So monitoring normally we do after 10 years, but in some crops like in oil seed crops, after five year or uh, eight years also, we prescribe for the testing of monitoring. If the viability goes down below 85, then the seeds are sent for the regeneration to the respective uh, NAG sites, that is the National Active Germplasm site. The seeds are regenerated using all the uh, following all the protocols, standard protocols, and then they come again, and this, this whole process is conserved. So uh, the germplasm like this, which we have conserved in the National Gene Bank, which belongs to the horticultural crops, it is around 38,000 samples of these five different crop groups, vegetables, medicinal and aromatic plants, spices, ornamental fruits and nuts, they are conserved in the gene bank. And as you know, there are some exotic samples and indigenous samples also. Similarly, the release varieties and genetic stocks are also conserved in the national gene bank. So these are the guidelines, which I have told you earlier in the uh, while describing the different process. And then uh, the one which I have not told you that seeds should not be treated with any chemical. Like sometimes people treat them with the naphthalene balls or some uh, fungicide powder. So we do not accept seeds which are treated with any chemical because it can interfere during the long-term conservation. So untreated seeds are taken, all passport data, management data, characterization data, evaluation, mode of reproduction. If you have any data on these, you kindly supply it to us so that it can be properly fed into the gene bank database. So this is the passport data sheet, which Dr. Ahlawat has also told you, but I will particularly, he was also pointing out about the biological status. This is very important because sometimes we, uh, we when somebody requests the seed, they say that we need the land races. Some people uh, like ICR, sometimes inquiry comes that how many crop wild relatives are conserved, how many wild species are conserved. So all these uh, biological status are different. So you should be able to define while collecting or while sending the germplasm to gene bank that this species belongs to this type of like wild species, crop wild relative. These are two different things. And VD species are also different. Sometimes the cultivated species, they escape from the field and grow on the roadside. So they are not the cultivated species or they are not the wild species, but they are the VD types of the cultivated species. So this type of difference, it should be uh, taken care while you are sending the passport data, like land race or traditional cultivar or farmer's variety. These are three different things. Although there is a very uh, thin line of, uh, you can say, differentiation between all these three categories, but still you can identify these differences. So while like hybrids, inbreds, breeding lines, parental lines, registered germplasm, elite lines, uh, all these the release variety, release hybrid, state release, institute release, exotic varieties. And then if you don't know anything, you can give it uh, unknown uh, doubtful uh, germplasm as the others. So it should be taken care when you send the germplasm to the gene bank for conservation. So these are some of the diversity in cucurbitus species, which is conserved 118 genera, 825 species, and around 5,500 accessions we are conserving. Similarly, in Abel Moscas, uh, we have 3,800 accessions and 20 species from all over the country. Uh, solanaceous crops. So this is the present status of the gene bank. 
we have more than 4.5 lakh of accessions belonging to different crop uh, categories. Then distribution of germplasm, we are not only distributing or giving germplasm for the crop improvement program, our registered germplasm or any trade specific germplasm which is conserved, but we are also sharing the germplasm to the farmers on request. But the only thing is that very less quantity of seed is given to the, uh, for is shared from the National Gene Bank because we are conserving the seeds 2000 or 4000. So we give only 10 to 20 seeds, but the farmers or but whosoever is uh, requesting, they multiply the seeds and then they conserve. Like this farmer, uh, he was from Punjab, uh, Punjab land race. Uh, this farmer is from Haryana. So he was asking for this Muskan variety. We had given him 50 seeds. And now he has uh, made 50 kilos of seeds by repeated multiplication because he was interested in this type of land race. Then registration, I think most of you know, this was the activity which was started to give an authentic national documentation system and provide recognition to the associated germplasm with the development of variety and give us soft protection under the IPR scenario. So this is the all online process. This is the link you can go to our website and fill in the application. This is the dashboard which comes first. You submit your application, then it goes through the process. And finally, if it is recommended from the PGRC, you will, uh, you will be issued a certificate, which you can take a printout from your own desktop. So till date, we have uh, in different horticultural crops, we have 388 uh, different genetic stocks have been registered in different crops, vegetable, medicinal, ornamental, fruits, and tubers. So, and this whole, this information is documented. We are regularly publishing uh, the inventory of plant germplasm registration, which is available on the uh, website also in digitized form. Uh, these are some of the photographs which have been registered like in onion. So the, these are the traits, uh, like in cucumber, we have registered a germplasm, which has two female flowers per node. Normally there is one female flower. So we have two female flowers per node, earliness, and the fruit is a little bit, uh, small. Similarly, in case of fruit crops like mango, kalapadi, this was the, uh, I, I think this was the uh, wild species which was registered for uh, dwarf in stature than medium sized fruits with deep yellow color pulp, high TSS and good keeping quality. Similarly, in papaya we have in bear which is for stoneless bear, um, very little amount of uh, stone is present. In medicinal plants like spiked ginger, and Aesop gold for golden yellow leaf uh, color mutant. Then in opium poppy, which is rich in thebane, uh, uh, rich in thebane content, which is less than 10%. Then malaxis. Uh, similarly, in spices crop, in uh, black pepper, turmeric, uh, we have registered germplasm for different uh, uh, regis, uh, for different traits, like highly tolerant to leaf spot and leaf blotch, uh, this turmeric variety. Similarly, in case of ornamentals, basically these are for the flowers and the florets or the uh, 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 size of the head for which they have been registered. Uh, rose scented, then China aster. Then in tuber crops also, we have registered some of the strains. This is again in fruits. Or uh, uh, this is a request that if you have any germplasm which is uh, known for a trait, you can uh, come to us with your farmers. You can bring their sample and usko gene bank mein aap bejiye aur ye hum yahan par gene bank mein conserve karenge. And finally, thank you to all. I thank to my director and to my colleagues who have contributed uh, information for this compilation. And thanks for the organizers, uh, those who have allowed me uh, to share my work with all of you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, ma'am, for that instilling talk. We could clearly understand about the short, medium, and long-term storage and cryopreservation of seeds, the prerequisites for depositing the seeds for banking, the national gene banking in the National Gene Bank, processing of seed material, the monitoring of conserved germplasm and distribution of germplasm material to the farmers. Thank you, madam. Uh, can we have yeah, we have got already three queries in the chat box, ma'am. I'll read out. Uh, Dr. Okay. Ajit has asked, can we deposit in vitro cultures instead of seeds for registration? In vitro cultures. Yeah. Uh, yes, you can deposit in vitro cultures. 
but uh, the one plus point for that will be that you deposit that sample to the national active germplasm sites. Like for example, if you want to uh, deposit uh, any, um, you can say grape cultures to us. So we have a national active site for grapes. You have to deposit the cuttings or cyans or your uh, clonal propagated material to them also and to tissue culture facility also. They will consider only if they have a protocol developed for that. Okay, so if they don't have a protocol for conservation of a particular species, then it will be difficult for conserving them. Like in, uh, we had recently, we have received a request for the uh, water chestnut germplasm for uh, cryopreservation, but we have no uh, protocol for the cryopreservation of water chestnuts. So we requested them to deposit their material at uh, NRC Makana, get a certificate from them that we have established this uh, germplasm at uh, this uh, national active germplasm sites. And after that, they, we can issue them a uh, IC number or the certificate of deposition. So that is the procedure. Thank you, ma'am. We have another query. Is it possible to store uh, recalcitrant seeds through cryopreservation for long term? Yes, cryopreservation is for long term only. And you can send the recalcitrant seeds uh, uh, to our cryopreservation unit to Dr. Anuradha and uh, they will uh, certainly they will conserve those seeds. Uh, Ma'am, one more query is there. How about the ornamental plants like succulents and turf grass seeds or seeds, uh, whether material is available with you? For uh, succulent plants? Yes, ma'am. And turf no, grass? Succulent plants, yes, and succulent plants and flowers, like for example, for gerbera or for chrysanthemum or rose geranium, all these have been registered with NBPGR. But the germplasm is maintained at the National Active Germplasm Site, that is the DFR Pune, and the depositor. So if you need that germplasm, we have to request them. So the distribution of that registered germplasm will be done from the National Active Germplasm Sites. We are not maintaining it at NBPGR, but in the uh, network uh, mode at NAG sites. So uh, we can uh, get the material from them, and it can be made available to you. Okay, ma'am. Uh, Dr. Rashmi CK is asking that uh, she is working on some wild fruits. Is it possible to send the germplasm for gene conservation to NPPGR? Uh, wild fruits. Which yes. fruits? That depends on the type of the fruit. If it is uh, uh, tree species, uh, we can use uh, different technologies, different strategies also for its conservation. Suppose it is a, uh, you can say the seed yielding fruit like guava, we can conserve the seeds also, and we can conserve it in the cryogene bank also. We can conserve it in the field gene bank also. So it depends upon the type of the fruit which you are sending. Uh, Ma'am, one more query is there. Uh, Dr. Akshida is asking, uh, already released variety can be registered for any particular trait. Is it possible to no, register? Release variety, if it is released for one trait, suppose, a wheat variety is released for resistance to smut. So you cannot register it for the same trait. But if you have uh, established or if you have scored some other trait in that, then you can register. If it is a salt tolerant line, you can say. So for you can register it for salt tolerance, not for the smut resistance. Okay. So it should be a different trait. Okay, now it's clear, ma'am. Uh, Reshmi, ma'am, uh, we will have a separate session on the uh, registration of uh, germplasm, especially the perennial tree species and other flower crops. So we'll mm -hmm. have that session later. We can discuss there also. Uh, Veena, ma'am. Veena, ma'am. Yeah. Ro Rohini here, ma'am. Okay, yes. As always, thank you, ma'am, for that uh, very vibrant uh, presentation, ma'am, and also very uh, informative also. And uh, I would like to appreciate, ma'am, it's uh, like a real proud feeling that NBPGR is actually serving for the entire country. You are facilitating the registrations, getting IC numbers, everything. So uh, at this time, I would like to appreciate it, uh, all the activities, that wonderful activities, what the scientists are doing. Thank you so much, ma'am. Okay, thank you, Roini. Uh, we are also proud of our students like you, who are our ambassadors in different parts of the country for spreading this knowledge. 
Thank, thank you. you. Thank you thank very you. much. Thank you, you can see from the questions raised, there is uh, you know a lot of uh, interest raised by your presentation and uh, it was well taken by the uh, participants. And you can see there are uh, more than uh, uh, 135 online uh, now also. And uh, uh, I feel you know you've taken a lot of effort and it was a uh, you know, for seed conservation, you have covered all the areas and uh, I really appreciate the effort taken by you and uh, the way, you know, when we send any request to you or any uh, mail to you, we used to get a very quick reply and I really appreciate the way in which you are conducting yourself in the division and uh, uh, I talk to you, madam. Thank, thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. It is all because of uh, you active people who are sending germplasm to us. So we are working. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So thank you for your efforts also. We'll go for the poll. poll. Yeah. Uh, participants, we have a set of five more questions from uh, Madam's lecture. So uh, Sridhar, sir, please post the link for the question, sir. New one or old one, this one? No, it's happening. Okay. This one. okay. okay. Uh, very quick then. Already more than 50 responses. I think Madam's uh, lecture was uh, uh, was very vibrant. Ma'am, could you just see the questions and whether the answers are correctly The opted? green ones are the right ones. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Sir, please scroll down. See, the third one is uh, uh, people have not answered properly. Uh, the other questions. Third one, this XC2 conservation for long term at lower temperature. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So either go down. Is, uh, the yeah, last one. It's orthodox or all the B, B is the right answer, orthodox. Yeah, yeah last one, I, yeah. Yes, it's yeah. number of seeds. So your uh, percentage yes. was uh, very effective. That's what the uh, quiz shows. People have understood the concept of uh, ex situ conservation using seed storage. Okay, so thank you, we, thank you. Yeah, again, we congratulate you and uh, thanks for coming online and uh, giving a very, uh, very nice presentation. Thank you, madam. Thank you, sir. Thank, thank you, you so much, ma'am. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, participants, for that question listening. Uh, yesterday, we could hear from Dr. Pradeep on the importance of crop wild relatives in general. Today, Dr. L.K. Bharti sir is with us to share his experience on working with crop wild relatives specific to Momodica genus. Before going to the talk, let us see a brief profile of Dr. L.K. Bharti. Sir, uh, could you just... Stop sharing your Stop slide sharing for a while. I would like to show you uh, your brief profile. <laughs> People may not be knowing you like how we know you. Okay. Thank you, sir. Uh, Dr. Bharti is currently working at uh, Central Tuber Crops Research Institute, Ruvantram. Prior to his joining at CTCRI, sir was serving at IHR main, main Institute and its substations for a long period. Dr. Bharti has obtained PhD in Vegetable Science from IARI. He has tremendous work experience in breeding of underutilized cucubits, mainly in the bitter gourd group, and developed seven vegetable varieties. The teasel gourd variety, Arka Bharat, developed by him, has been performing well in the Kodagu, Uttar Karnataka, Dakshin Kannada districts of Karnataka, and many other states too. Dr. Bharti has more than 50 publications, including research articles and book chapters, and he has published a book with Springer on Momodica genus in Asia. Without much delay, let me invite Dr. Bharti, sir, to have his talk on Momodica wild species and relatives, sir. Start good morning. Sir, good morning, sir. Good morning. Go ahead. Am I audible? Hello? Audible, sir. You can. Continue. Okay. Thank you, sir. Uh, straight away, I'll go to my slide, sir. Uh, today, I will discuss about role of wild relatives in improvement of Momadika. So, the genus Momadika. Is a, okay. 
is a natural ascian genus. It comprises of around 45 species. Out of 45, seven species uh, are available in India. The species available in India can be grouped into three. Uh, group one, uh, the basic chromosome number is 11. It is uh, monoecious, non-tuberous, annual, and tuberculate fruits. This group comprises of Momadica carantia and Momadica balsamina. Then group two comprises of Momadica diaca, Sahyadrika, Sabangleta, and Cochin chinensis. Cochin chinensis. And basic chromosome number is 14. Then group three, it comprised only one Momadica symbol area. It is characterized by monoecious tuberous uh, perennial. With fruits are ribbed, and the basic chromosome number is nine. Here you can see the different characters of uh, different Momadica species. For example, seeds. Seeds um, only two, bitten and smooth. And the smooth seeds available only in Momadica symbol area. All other Momadica uh, species are bitten seeds. And uh, the monoecious species like Momadica carantia and Momadica balsamina has two, a few fibrous roots, but other all uh, other species are tuberous roots. Have tuberous roots. Like that, uh, we can distinguish uh, all, each and every species by the characters. These are the fruits of different species, Momadica balsamina, Momadica carantia. These are uh, tuberculate uh, fruits. And um, these four are dioecious, Momadica cochinchinensis, Momadica diaca, Momadica sciadrica, and Momadica subangulata have uh, spiny fruits. And, uh, Momadica symbol area, the fruits are ribbed. See, in uh, using wild species in crop improvement, first we have to study the crossability relationship among all the species. Based on the crossability relationship, I have, as I have told, three groups can be established. Group one consists of uh, Momadica carantia and Momadica balsamina, that is uh, monoecious. And uh, group two is Momadica diaca, Momadica sahyadrika, subangulata, and cochin chinensis diocese. And group three is Momadica symbol area. Momadica symbol area is completely not crossable with any other species of Momadica. Among the monoecious species of Momadica, um, which has the basic chromosome number of See, sorry. See, that mono, among the monoecious species, which has the basic chromosome number of 11, Momadica carantia, Momadica balsamina, these two are crossable unilateral. Momadica balsamina as female parent, we can cross, but the crossability is very less, and um, less than 50% fruit set is obtained, but the F1 uh, progeny is highly fertile. And between the, these are two varieties of uh, two botanical varieties of Momadica carantia, Momadica carantia variety carantia, and Momadica carantia variety muricata. The that, that uh, muricata is considered as the progenitor of Momadica carantia, the cultivated uh, variety. And these two are easily crossable, uh, more than 50%, and uh, F1 progeny is also highly fertile. And between monoecious species and dioecious species, also complete incompatibility exists. And among the Momodica species, sorry, diocese species, all are intercrossable, uh, but with uh, some are easily crossable and some are very difficult to cross. Between Momodica diaca and Sahyadrika, these two are easily crossable and more than 50% fruit set and high fertility in F1 hybrids are uh, obtained. Uh, between uh, this uh, Momodica subangulata is a tetraploid diocese species. It also can be crossed, uh, crossed with Momadica diaca and Momadica sahyadrika. These two are easily crossable with the tetraploid species, but F1 is uh, sterile. And uh, the pollen fertility is also, because as the F1 is uh, triploid, pollen fertility is very less, less than 10% between the, in the F1 hybrids between developed between subangulata diaca and subangulata sahyadrika. And the Momadica cochin chinensis, this is, in two ways, it is crossable only with Momadica subangulata and less than 50% fruit set. And pollen fertility uh, ranges from 12 to 18%. And the Momadica diaca also crossable with uh, Momadica cochin chinensis, Momadica sahyadrika also crossable, but in unidirectional. Only as a female parent, Momadica cochin chinensis as a female parent, you can cross with Momadica diaca as well as Momadica sahyadrika, but the crossability is very less 
and uh, colon fertility is also very, very less, 1.15%. Here it is 0.85%. See, between non-tuberous monosis and tuberous diocese species, uh, basic number uh, between uh, 11 and 14, we crossed. The F1 we obtained, but the fruits developed normally, but without seeds. Here you can see how the fruit size Whenever Momadiga Karantia and Momadiga Karantia, these two are there are two varieties of Momadiga Karantia. That is Karantia, this is Muricata. When it is crossed with when uh, dusted with Momadiga Diaca pollen, we got very good fruit size, but seeds are chaffy. Same way, Momadiga Karantia and Momadiga Renigera. This is Karantia variety Karantia, Karantia variety Muricata. When it uh, dusted with the Momadiga Renigera, Sabangleta subspecies Renigera, we got good fruit set. Like that, Momadika Cochin Chinensis also. Uh, between Momadika Balsamina and Momadika Cochin Chinensis also, we got good fruit, but all were that uh, seeds were chaffy. However, successful hybrid between Momadika Karantia and Momadika Diaca was reported, and the F1 was reported to have more resemblance to Momadika Karantia. But I had doubt, I have read this somewhere in the paper, this uh, I am making, that's why I made this sentence, but it is not crossable and F1 will not be fertile. See, well, the origin of a particular crop is very important to improve. In that way, we have uh, established that Momadika sabangleta, the semi-domesticate uh, species of Momadika, uh, as a segmental allopolyploid derived between Momadika diaca and Momadika cochinchinensis. Uh, it is uh, Momadika diaca cochinchinensis. Naturally, it is uh, hybridized and F1 and F1 is doubled, uh, spontaneous chromosome doubling. In this way, Momadika subangleta is developed. But earlier it was, uh, Momadika subangleta was known as autotetraploid derived from Momadika diaca. And uh, some report uh, says that it is allo tetraploid between Momadika diaca and Momadika cochin chinensis. We have established that it is a segment allo polyploid between Momadika diaca and Momadika cochin chinensis. See, interspecific hybridization is used to transfer the traits from wild to cultivated species. As you know, spine goat. Spine goat is a wild, purely wild species, and uh, diesel goat is a semi-domesticate uh, species. Uh, it is cultivated uh, in Assam, West Bengal, and Odisha. Uh, spine goat has uh, some uh, advantage of high culinary quality and naturally pollinated and high number of fruits per plant. But it has the disadvantage, that's why it is not cultivated, not um, brought under domestication, uh, as uh, low prop due to low propagation efficiency, short crop duration, and less yield, two to three kg per plant. The crop duration is very less, only for short period, three months it gives fruits and then it uh, goes for dormancy. In other, in the other hand, that uh, diesel gold, it has some disadvantage of less consumer preference and it requires assisted pollination. We have to pollinate and less number of fruits per plant. But the advantage is high propagation efficiency. Here you can see the even wiry root also produce a plant. The um, eye, eye buds are spread throughout the uh, tuber surface. So anywhere, any way you cut that it will give you a sprout. But in case of diaca, only from the top, you will get the new sprout. From the uh, tuber surface, you can't any. Uh, you will not get any plant. But in uh, diesel gourd, you will get I am um, I buds are spread throughout the tuber surface, so you get a um, very good propagation, multiplication. And uh, but uh, the another advantage is longer crop duration. For six months, you get fruits and higher yield, eight to ten kg per plant. Very easy to cultivate this Momadika subangulata. And the Momadika diaca is very difficult to cultivate. So to, to uh, join the favorable traits of uh, spine gourd and diesel gourd, we started a program at uh, Bhuvaneshwar and we could succeed and we have come out with a new uh, plant <clears throat> which has the favorable traits of spine gourd and diesel gourd. Then we have developed a fertile uh, backcross uh, fern progeny between Momadika diaca and Momadika subangulata. Initially, we crossed Momadika subangulata as a female parent and Momadika diaca as male parent. The F1 was uh, highly sterile at, as it was chiplied. And uh, through backcross, through backcross, we obtained a fertile progeny. 
and uh, but here also the fruit uh, fruits are not in good shape some and uh, deformed fruits but root traits root traits inherited from the uh, female parent momadika sabangleta uh, see uh, this is parent one momadika dayaka it has uh, then this is momadika sabangleta it has this uh, adventitious root tubers and f1 has the um, root traits of uh, momadika sabangleta bc1 f1 also has the root traits of Mamadika Sabang letter. So it is easy to multiply. Then another uh, F1 fertile hybrid. F1 hybrid we have uh, developed through ploidy manipulation. As I have told, Mamadika diaca is uh, diploid, Mamadika Sabang letter is a tetraploid. Through chromosome doubling, we have doubled the chromosome number of Mamadika diaca to N56. Then we have crossed with the natural tetraploid Mamadika Sabang letter. And we obtained a fertile hybrid that we named it as a Momadika sabaika. It is highly fertile and it combines the traits of uh, favorable traits of both the species. That is easy to cultivate, long duration, high culinary quality, and natural pollination. These are the morphological traits of that F1 hybrid developed between uh, Dayaka and uh, Renigera, Sabangleta subspecies Renigera. See here, flower color. Okay. Natural fruit set. See, Momadika renigera, it is 15 to 20 percent. In case of Momadika diaca, it is 90 to 95 percent. In Momadika sabaika, also, we got around 65 to 70 percent natural pollination. Flowering period seven months in uh, Sabangleta, three months in uh, diaca, and seven months in uh, sabaika. The dormancy period also very short in Momadika sabaika as it's uh, Momadika diaca. Sorry, uh, Momadika uh, Renigera. Momadika Renigera has a very short uh, dormancy of November to January, but Momadika Dayaka it has long dormancy between uh, October to April, and the Savaika also has a very short dormancy, um, November to January, three months only, and the returnability is also very good. That means once you plant um, for four five years, you can maintain the same crop. Uh, returnability is very poor in Momadika Dayaka. Momadika Dayaka, if you plant the tubers. Then it will that crop is returnable. If you plant the seedlings, then also it is returnable. But if you plant the cuttings, plants made from cuttings are not uh, suitable for cartoon cropping. Momadika diaca. A uh, yield also, yield also very high in Momadika renigera as well as Momadika sabaika. And these are the um, see you can see this is Mamadika sabangleta seed seeds uh, size and shape it is intermediate between both the parents and the flower size flower size is like uh, it's a female parent Mamadika renigera Mamadika renigera sabangleta renigera and flower color inherited from its uh, male parent Mamadika diaca and fruits also intermediate between the plants and the root traits it inherited uh, from uh, Mama, its uh, female parent Mamadika sabangleta. You can observe the bees. Hybrid between Sabangleta and Dayaka. This is a photo of Mamadika Sabaika. Uh, fruits are intermediate between uh, Dayaka and Sabangleta. Mamadika Sabaika. See, we have uh, attempted another interspecies hybrid between Momadika Dayaka and Momadika Cochin Chinensis. Uh, as I have told, Momadika Dayaka has uh, some advantage of high culinary quality natural pollination. Uh, like that sweet gourd, it is very less popular and the seeds are very big and hard, but a very and a very less number of fruits per plant, but it has uh, good returnability and longer crop duration and it is very robust. It can climb big, big trees. So uh, here also we try to combine the traits of uh, these two species, um, but we got F1, which produce uh, seedless fruits, but not in natural pollination. We have to dust with uh, either of um, pollen from either of the parent. Uh, the F1 resembles uh, plant uh, characters, resembles Momadika cochin chinensis, but fruits are uh, like it's Momadika diaca, and high fruit set when it is uh, dusted with Momadika cochin chinensis pollen. Uh, we got one fruit with viable uh, seeds in open pollination of this hybrid and the progeny was backlash to either of the parents and out of 100 backlash pollination, 100% we got with the spine goat pollen and the, the, the backlash progeny is male and female fertile. 
So in the line of Momadika Sabaika, hybrids between Momadika Sahayadrika and Momadika Sabangleta also can be developed because Momadika Sahayadrika is adaptable to high altitude region and it is grown wild as uh, intercrop in, uh, not intercrop, wild uh, in uh, coffee orchards of uh, high altitude region of uh, Kurg. So in the same way of uh, Sabaika, we can develop uh, Sahayadrika and Sabangleta hybrid. Sahayadrika is uh, deployed and the progenitor of Momadika Dayaka. So if we double the chromosome number of Sahayadrika, it can be crossed with Sabangleta and F1 hybrids can be obtained. Momadika balsamina is a wild species, uh, purely wild, and it is resistant to, reported to be resistant to ladybird beetle, red pumpkin beetle, and pumpkin uh, caterpillar. As the Momadika balsamina distribution is around the uh, in the desert areas, I assume that it may have the drought stress gene also. So it can be used uh, for improvement of Momadika carantia. It's a close relative in the Momadika genus. Then Momadika carantia variety mirigator, the progenitor of uh, cultivated uh, bitter card, is uh, resistant to, uh, reported to be resistant to downy mildew. This can be used for improvement of Momadika carantia bitter card. And Momadika diaca, it has um, some quality like tolerant to gall fly, root knot nematode. And Momadika sayadrika is, is highly tolerant to pumpkin caterpillar and root knot nematode. These traits, we can uh, use it for uh, to transfer the semi domesticated or cultivated species. And wild African species like Momadika fetida and Erostrata also can be used in the breeding program. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for that interesting and in informative talk. We could glimpse through wide hybridizations involving wild Momodica species, the evolution of Momodica subagulata, interspecific hybridization and development of uh, Momodica saboica. And uh, we could get some idea about the wild species of Momodica with some biotic and abiotic stress tolerance. Sir, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we'll wait for some time if we have any queries. <laughs> Yeah, Dr. Bharati, I congratulate you for a very nice lecture and I always you know your source of inspiration. And now my question is, uh, what else is possible now? You, some possibilities you are showing. Uh, what else is possible in these three species? I think uh, you have shown, uh, you know, to uh, the how uh, wild species can be uh, domesticated and uh, used as a breeding material and how to bring uh, hybrids from it and uh, make the farmer happy with the hybrids and uh, you know their uh, livelihood options are uh, improved and uh, some of them become uh, million uh, i mean if not millionaires uh, they have uh, uh, lakhs of rupees they have earned through the yes. products which you made so in my question is uh, what else is possible i think uh, uh, you already shown a lot of promise and i think uh, this is a unending saga you can uh, still uh, do a lot of things. So I would like to know from you, uh, what are the possibilities exist? Sir, uh, actually, bitter curd for the, um, from Mamadika balsamina, we can, as I have uh, listed out the traits of uh, Mamadika balsamina, we can transfer the tra those traits to Mamadika carantia. Yeah. Then uh, variety Murigata has wide variability and it is purely wild, uh, the Mamadika carantia war uh, Murigata. It is purely wild and a lot of variation exists. That also can be used in the breeding product program of bitter gut. You know, cultivated bitter gut, it is highly susceptible now. Downy mildew is a very serious disease in bitter gut. And the, the wild species of Momadika balsamna and Momadika carantia var muriceta can be used in the breeding of Momadika carantia. As well as, as I told, uh, you know, high altitude region, uh, that Momadika diaca may not perform well in the high altitude region. But Momadika Sahayadrika is adapted to the high altitude region. So Momadika, as in the line of Momadika Sabaika, we can develop a hybrid between Sahayadrika and uh, Sabangleta for high altitude regions of that uh, Karnataka. You know, very high, heavy demand is there. High demand is there in Karnataka for natural pollination. Now they are growing Momadika Sabangleta only in the um, Maharashtra and uh, as you listed that Karnataka districts. They are growing Momadika sabangleta. They are asking for natural pollinated varieties. So Momadika sabaika can be used in this program. Yeah. Uh, sure. Why breeders were reluctant to, uh, you know, use this uh, as a uh, source of uh, resistance, which you have already made? What may be the reason? 
because I, I could not see any breeding efforts towards that uh, direction. Sir, you know, uh, you know, Mamadika Balsamina and Mamadika Karanshi, though I told that it is uh, the F1 is highly fertile, hmm. but the crossability is very less, very difficult. Oh, Personally, okay. I experienced at okay. IRI thousands of crosses we made between Mamadika Balsamina and Mamadika Karanshiya, but one continuous effort is required to get the success. Lot then of another patience. case, there, lot sir? of patience required. Lot yes, of patience. a lot of patience required. Then Mamadika Karanshiya, War Murigata and War Karanshiya, war Karanshiya the problem is uh, F1, um, it has that fruit size, it has the way it um, bends towards the Mamadika Karanshiya, War Murigata. But we need a Karanshiya character. But yeah. uh, the resistance only from Mamadika Mirigeta. So it also requires a lot of back crossing and uh, uh, it yeah. takes a lot of time. Sir. Okay. Uh, but as, as I told uh, that Mamadika Sabaika, sorry, Mamadika Sahyadrika and Mamadika Sabangleta already we have developed a hybrid. I told the future line of work, but I did not tell. I developed a hybrid. It is in Chatelli, but uh, under, uh, it is in experiment only now. Yeah, now you take up the question. The hybrid will come out soon. Sir, we have uh, three questions posted in our uh, chat box. The first question is whether hand pollination is recommended in sweet god and spine god. A sweet god and spine god, no need for hand pollination. No need for hand pollination. No need. Okay, sweet god also, uh, spine god also, um, more than 90% natural fruit set. Okay. There is one more question, sir. Uh, hmm. Any marker, uh, any morphological or molecular marker hmm. is available for early identification of female lines of Momodica dioica before flowering? Actually, see this question. I many times I heard, but I say why? What you will do uh, by identifying very early? No, see molecular marker is there. Then what for why um, we have used that? Why? See within thirty days you will come to know that it, whether it is a male or female, and uh, it is propagated vegetatively. Seeds also okay. We can use it for propagation, but I uh, see dormancy is there. Uh, we advise three to four seedlings in a pit. Within 30 days, the male will come and uh, you can remove the plants. But marker is available to identify the male plant. Okay, sir. Uh, whether the planting material of Mamodica saboica is available? Yeah, it's available at the Bhuvaneshwar. Now we are there. Uh, okay, multiple. sir, we can contact the Bhuvaneshwar. Bhuvaneshwar substation, IHR regional mm -hmm. station Bhuvaneshwar. We can get yes. the planting material. Yes, next. Uh, uh, one I, more query. I, I last one. Mm -hmm. One more query is there, sir. How to propagate mm -hmm. the species Momodica symbalarica? Symbalaria. Symbalaria also vegetatively propagated. Um, tubers only. Seeds also you can use it. Okay. Thank you, sir. So the propagation uh, is through tubers? Uh, tubers. Okay. If there are no other queries, uh, I would thank once again Dr. Bharti, sir, for joining us and uh, sharing his experience in the Mamodica species. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you, madam. Thank you, sir. With this uh, lecture, Bharti sir's lecture, we are concluding the forenoon session of today's uh, session. Uh, we'll be breaking for lunch now, and we'll be resuming the sessions by 2 o'clock, and we'll have some more interesting lectures on uh, quarantine and virus indexing in HGRs, role of molecular markers in uh, HGR management, genomics and its application, and climate resilient technologies in horticulture. So uh, please try to join us on time. Uh, we'll be starting the session by two o'clock sharp. Thank you.
हेलो हेलो या यू कैन गो हेड डॉक्टर रेड्डी सर प्लीज मेक इट इन अ स्लाइड शो सर या योर ऑडिबल एंड विजिबल ओके थैंक यू या uh thank uh, thank you very much sushma for the nice introduction uh, let me go through the topic uh, the plant quarantine and virus infection procedures especially for agricultural genetic resources and if you see the the importance of horticulture one of the world's largest producer of horticulture crops occupy about 8% of gross crop area and india accounts for 34% of the gross domestic product and 17% of the all employment and 25 million people are employed in horticulture related industries the horticulture crop germplasm of more than 36000 are being conserved in different icr institutes in india covering nearly about 130 horticulture crops plant germplasm is an important natural resource and plays vital role in the sustainable development of horticulture and uh, today topic is the plant quarantine is otherwise now new term is the biosecurity the biosecurity is the transboundary movement of planting in plant material you can see the material can be seeds plants or uh, plant products and cuttings or tissue culture plants which move around the, the globe through sea ports or uh, air uh, land port and then uh, railways and uh, air cargoes and the the armful uh, organism doesn't have any boundaries there is only placement of their uh, on a plant surface or a seed or a propagating material they can move from uh, in all means of transport uh, what we use in the day to day activities and if you see the some of the historical developments in the movement how it is happened the first one is the late blight of potato irish famine which was uh, uh, came from uh, europe uh, and then wiped out the potato in the european uh, europe uh, in europe in india then grape spodium mildew also happened in uh, france and then partinum weed which is spread to worldwide and even in india and in a coffee berry borer insect which is from south america to the spread to the africa and also partly to india and then banana bunch it up which was our uh, australia to sri lanka from sri lanka to india it is spread this is how and the some of the latest introduction is the peanut stripe virus specially moved through germplasm only in the seed from ikris to ikrisat from world collections to ikrisat and then subsequently spread in india uh, through seed it has mainly come through the seed so these are the some of the few examples where the movement can happen and uh, if you see the plant quarantine uh, and are in the vis-a-vis plant biosecurity what is required is what are the regulations are there in the national as well as international level then how we can able to detect these things application of diagnostics and what are the phytosanitary treatments available to check or to utilize the material and then the capacity building and development how it can be uh, taken actions in principle using different systems in available in the nation if you see uh, the plant quarantine is defined as a, an all activities designed to prevent the introduction and the spread of quarantine pests to ensure their official control one is the introduction entry of any here pest refers do not uh, misconceived idea of insects only pest refers to diseases nematodes insects weeds which are all harmful are considered as a pest and the pest species can be a strain or a biotype or an animal or any pathogenic injurious to plant or plant products the quarantine pest definition is the pest of potential economic importance to the area 
endangered by thereby and not yet present there are present but not widely distributed and are absolutely under control condition that we call it as a uh, quarantine phase and the bios security new term introduced is the strategic term an integrated approach encompassing policy framework to analyze and manage the risks for food safety animal life health and uh, planet plant and uh, human health including environment it covers introduction and management of plant pests animal pests diseases and zoonoses genetically modified organisms and their products even invasive alien species and genotypes it is a holistic concept of direct relevance to the sustainable agriculture food safety and protection of the environment and if you consider these are the steps what are the international laws or framework which is there the first one is the uh, wto uh, wherein the wto is the world organization which is uh, facilitating the trade related activities to the world global level and in photos and uh, the plant connection uh, the international plant protection convention center which is there for re related to plants and then uh, Cortigo protocol for bio safety protecting biological diversity living organisms and uh, modified organisms and CBD is the new one is the convention on biological diversity protecting biology all three action the activities are interrelated and uh, they are all in uh, a conjunction with operate mainly for detection identification and prevention of entry of exotic and the spread of harmful pests and fundamental for the protection of any country's biodiversity sustainable trade and food pests and disease cause yield and quality of losses to crop making detection and identification a crucial facet of successful crop production and trade germplasm are the pathways for entry of pests pests of harmful to the same species are the different plants and act as a carrier through contamination or through movement the world trade organization which is established uh, with 181 countries with a gat as a general agreement for tariff and trade has three functions no discrimination predictability and free trade for uh, different countries and this all the countries are signatories currently at head aims to protect cultivated and wild plants by preventing the introduction and spread of pests the secretary of the ipcc is provided the funding by fao under united nations setup the phytosanitary measures agreement encompassing the five objectives one is the harmonization science base least trade restrictiveness recognition of equivalence and transparency and these are all controlled by three organizations in the world one is the food safety under codex elementaries second word for animal health oie plan uh, is the organization whereas for plant ippc is the organization which controls these activities we are concerned for the plant so we deal with how these uh, different activities are working and if you come into the the national system uh, what we call our uh, plant quarantine and uh, storage uh, which is located faridabad whereas in the worldwide now it is renamed as a national plant quarantine system each country's uh, quarantine system is designated as national plant quarantine system in our country this system existed way back 1914 that is the name is destructive insect pest act then amended through several notification from time to time and the plant plant quarantine order has been issued 2003 and it was uh, modifications were also appear as and when required and the latest one is the 2015 uh, few modifications and the new quarantine order which is going to come in 2022 most probably it is under revision and new quarantine will come in the 2022 and if you see our quarantine system there are 70 plant quarantine stations in the international airports seaports land customs stations 
modified points of entity are uh, for sea force four, 44 are there air force 23 land customs 24 and uh, there are uh, about 161 phytosanitary certificate issuing authorities and the import permit permit issuing authorities are 44 and uh, designated inspection authorities for uh, post quarantine inspection are 43 and the flow of material normally the bulk consignments are passed through NPP where plant quarantine system is existing. The plant protection division, directorate of plant protection and uh, quarantine and storage from Faridabad is the headquarters. Under that, there are uh, seven, uh, uh, now, not now seven, there are now nine uh, regional plant quarantine spaces existing. Bangalore is one among them. Earlier it was not there, now it is there. And these uh, nine stations under operation and planned quarantine system, this is for bulk imports. Whereas for germplasm movement at the small imports for research and uh, purpose, it is mainly regulated to, through Department of Agriculture and Research, wherein ICR is involved. And the main organization responsible for this is NBPGR. Under NBPGR, there is a plant quarantine division which is directly involved in these activities. Under this, there are two stations available, one in Delhi, the headquarters, and the regional station at Hyderabad. These are the two uh, uh, places only where the germplasm is handled for international movement. Or whatever material received, it is uh, handled here in these two places. About there are nine schedules available. Of course, this is not much important. It is it can go through how oh, can anybody can see in the plant uh, website of uh, plant quarantine in the India. And the international standards and phytosanitary measures is the very important based on this principle only, wherein measures are uh, taken uh, through IPPC. And IPPC has set up a convention which is this, the International Standard for Photocentric Measures, which is first adopted in 1993. And uh, as of March 2021, there are 44 adopted ISTMs, which are uh, 30 being revoked and 29 are uh, diagnostic protocols, 39 is photocentric treatment. And these international standards are mainly protecting sustainable agriculture and enhance global food security, protect the environment, forests and biodiversity, and facilitate economic and trade development. And if you see the what are the systems uh, in the photosanitary, the basically there are six principles. One is the import regulation, the export certification, surveillance, pest risk analysis, Pest eradication and pest free area declaration. These are the core activities in this uh, phytotrend systems. As I mentioned, international phytosanitary measures, uh, the, there are uh, 44, 37 are uh, for uh, ISPMS and 12 are diagnostic protocols, 21 for phytosanitary treatment protocols. The conceptual ones are the, these are the numbers. Whereas references for designated reference is the one ISPME 5, whereas umbrella standards are 27 and 28 uh, numbers. The specific ones are 15 and 33, which are for a specialized regulated acts. These are different acts. Of course, they need to see all this, which are uh, required, it may go through. And uh, the main international exchange of jump plus is the, our primary concern. The material so introduced cell after quarantine clearance and the national registration accessing will be made available to the Indian term. Some of the introduced material may also be examined through post quarantine, growing under control condition for a hidden pests or pathogens. The export of germplasm to any country also should be regulated through NBPG and ADLT. The material will be completely processed for quarantine check and the phytosanitary certification is issued. The quarantine process includes the examination of material, inspection, unwanted weeds and the pests and the insects, nematodes, weeds, all are checked through 
visual, microscopic, X-ray, radiography, and then soaking seed, and using uh, different laboratory assays. This is the regular procedure. See, when we import or export the germplasm, the first thing is the health checking, where we check for uh, pathogens under contaminated con under control conditions, and then the release the material to the uh, inventor. The indexing for viruses includes glow tests, evaluation of targeted by ELISA, PCR, electron microscope. The, the, there are four steps involved. One is the permit for importation. We have to get before you get uh, the material. And then germplasm export, and then post-entry inspection, and then germplasm delivery. These are the four steps that happens when any material is uh, taken. And the main regulation of uh, plant genetic resources are through NBPG or New Delhi only. The coordinates the nationally and for any movement, whether national movement or international movement, germplasm is controlled through NBPG. The Directorate of Plant Protection earlier, as I mentioned, is only meant for regulating bulk imports or exports, either sea, through sea, land or seaports, sea means of trading. If you see the regulations in phytosanitary measures in India, one is the phytosanitary certificate issuing authorities or the public authorities notified by the Minister of Agriculture and Government of India who are required to process necessary infrastructure and laboratory equipment to the test exportable commodities. There is a national standard for phytosanitary measures for some of the importing activities which have already been developed and approved by the Government of India and it is placed accordingly. And national standards also have been developed for accreditation of phytosanitary treatment providers because this has all been added, given to the private uh, uh, persons. So they have been accredited and they are only to be provide the service which are authorized by, by the Government of India. Fumigation operators, again fumigation treatments are done as per the ASPM 15 and NSP, National Sanitary and Phytosanitary Measure 12. Under these two rules, a fumigation has to be done for certain uh, commodities. Uh, this is also, again, fumigation is recognized and accredited for some operators. The registered force hot air treatment provides even uh, fumigation and hot air, both are similar uh, conditions they have been observed and in addition to the fumigation here, uh, hot air is done for wood packing. Packing material is one of the important uh, means of spreading some of the insect pests. So therefore, they also packing material treatment is also is done under NSPM 9. The certified hot water immersion treatment facility for mango fruits, it is for export. And registered providers for vapor heat treatment for fresh fruits and vegetables and certified ir irradiation treatment facilities for fresh fruits are also there for export purpose. Uh, let us coming to the, I will concern mostly for the plant viruses. In the viruses, the large number which are mainly comes to the planting material because they are being transmitted through seed, pollen, uh, mechanical and nematodes and planting material is very important. In nature, they are spread by different insect vectors and mealybugs and mites. 80% of them, them are spread through natural vectors, but 18% of them pass through seed and planting propagating material and 1.6% of them transmitted through contact and mechanical injuries. Uh, why do you need to detect the virus? Because these uh, viruses are the purpose is to manage the, reduce the economic loss and for a breeding purpose for developing resistant varieties and provide virus free planting material of vegetatively propagated uh, material and seeds free, free of seed transmitted virus. The testing is also necessary for phytosanitary regulations for import and export of planting material, which needs highly sensitivity and need a definite protocol to be followed. And if you see the diagnostic method, there are two types of method, direct methods and indirect methods. Uh, these are uh, generally used for general diagnosis of a uh, plant pathogen. 
but however these all are not applicable for quarantine purpose here we go by three ways of detecting these pathogens one is the biological means where we observe observe the growing of plants when it is grown indicating symptoms of development and inoculation and to indicator host are transmitting to test host where if they develop certain symptoms based on that we also diagnose the viruses and the physical examination see for fungus and bacteria we also observe under normal light microscope whereas bacteria some bacteria and viruses and uh, some uh, cloim limited uh, bacteria like phytoplasma and uh, non culturable bacteria we need to use electron microscope where we observe them and their uh, specific location and there is serology based antibody approach where the, there are several uh, earlier techniques but they won't not be used now the primarily used methods are the enzyme in linked absorbent assay elisa immunoblotting assay and uh, lateral flow immune assay which is a field applicable where the quick detection uh, is possible in this method the molecular methods includes based on nucleic acid whereas immune assays are based on protein whereas molecular assays are based on nucleic acid the nucleic acid based assays are molecular hybridization assay the polymerase chain assay and then isothermal amplification assays and crispr cas based assays at the microarrays and metagenomic or next generation sequence the microarrays and metagenomics all are useful for multiple pathogen detection whereas these techniques are useful for a single pathogen or single strain detection Uh, let us see when a, a planting material or germplasm comes into the country how it is first done for the first it is inspected for in, uh, insects by visual or illuminated magnifier and then x-ray radiography where they pass through and then seed transparency also visualized if there is any growth mold or uh, insect damage based on this uh, detections those lots may be rejected or identify the uh, particular specific pest accordingly action will be initiated if the entire lot is if any infection happens as per uh, quarantine procedure entire lot to be destroyed whereas in in uh, germplasm is being a precious one normally we, we normally we don't recommend to destroy entire lot we assess individually again whichever is free and then only it will be the separated salvaged and then it will be recirculated for germplasm otherwise if it is more than 50% or 60% is infested then entire germplasm may be destroyed and if you see the methods of fungi and bacteria again visual observation through stereo microscopy and also light microscopy then uh, incubation and uh, culture conditions then uh, observe the sporulation and see the spore patterns and if there is further required and again pcr uh, tests are performed based on the observations in the microscope and there are specific primers available for different fungi and bacteria which are used and it will accordingly the diagnosis is made and then the lots may be either accepted or rejected and if you see the nematodes again for the nematodes also the seeds uh, mainly seeds observed the galls any gall contamination if it is the planting uh, material which is cuttings it is coming uh, surface area washed and nematodes will be observed if the roots are there again they will be processed and uh, seed and then uh, check them the microscope the presence if it is the seeds alone in the external contamination is not observed they will be kept on blotting or water if the eggs are there on seed surface they hatch and then release and then that liquid it is again observed and then it is seen whether nematodes present or not Uh, let us come to the the main uh, viruses in the viruses unlike the other pathogens or insects 
uh, visually you cannot see, so therefore the methods will be uh, indicator hose by inoculating on a testing plant like uh, glutinosa, kinopodium as a test host and by graft inoculation or even by daughter or by transmitting to insects. We are able to detect those viruses then otherwise, but this method is a cumbersome and it is not specific. Only few cases we use the biological assay, but majority of them are tested through the physical method like electron microscopy. If we see the leaf tip preparation and observed in electron microscope, if we see the particle in the shape, based on the shape, we can only group them which virus, this virus belongs to which group. If it is a Basiliform, then you will say Badna virus, it is isometric Kukumu virus, and the filamentous particles, Spotty virus, and the rigid rods, Kabama virus, like that, we group it. And for the specific purpose, again, we go for different uh, serological and molecular. If it is a phytoplasma, then we need to take sections and then observe the uh, tissues under electron microscope. And the protein based uh, assays are the ELISA, where in specific antibodies are there, we use them and the sap extracted from these samples are uh, put in and then the labeled antibody is uh, added and if it is binding, you get a color and the color can be red, it is a liquid phase, so if you use alkaline phosphate, you get yellow color, if you use horse radish peroxide, you get brown color, so this is the color detection. Visually also you can see, or you can also take reading in the LSR reader, which gives the quantified amount of virus load present at the sample. And the slight modification is the quick detection is the, uh, instead of liquid formation, it is a solid formation. The principle is same, but we will be using, instead of LSR plate, we use nitrocellulose membrane. The extracted sap is blotted on the uh, membrane and the antibody labeled enzyme conflict when we add it develops color and the based on the color development if say purple color it is developed it is positive and it is green it is not infected that is how it is indicated if there is no dot is formed if you say it is not there in the virus and if it is a grow test plants also can crush sap dots and then we also detect a similar way that what we call it is a tissue print in mass. Uh, these are all the tests which are antibody. The lateral uh, flow or dipstick assay, wherein it is already the membrane is uh, blotted with the antibodies. The only you need to extract a sap, put it. If the virus is present, absent, then you don't get a band, only single band appear. Means your test is correct, but the two bands are there, then only it is shows infected because this band is meant for the test is performed correct or not. If the two bands, this is for virus specific band, if it is present then only it is considered as positive. If, we, if it is a cassette is like this and if it is a strip, you open the strip and dip in a liquid and then you can see the bands. That is how it is done very quickly. Whereas nucleic acid based diagnostics which were a, a piece of bit of nucleic acid is labeled with radioisotope or the non-radioisotope, if it is a radioisotope you get black dots and if it is non-radioactive depending on the fluorescing chemical it will color will change. Uh, so these are very commonly used earlier but nowadays probe we use only for uh, viroids because viroids being uh, other methods are not uh, sensitive. Uh, they use this probe for detecting this uh, purpose. And if you see the nucleic acid based methods again, uh, this is the hybridization principle and there are PCR which is now everybody know very common. Then isothermal amplification, it is the advancement from a PCR. Uh, how it is different we will discuss it subsequently and the CRISPR based assays and microarrays and metagenomics are next generation sequencing. And if you see PCR basic principle, we need to have a two sets of primers, the forward and reverse, and a set of nucleotides and then buffer and enzyme tag polymerase. You run for a cycle, you, it is amplified and uh, at the end you get 
large quantity, then you can visualize under gel, which is seen here. That is how the PCR works. Now, for detecting multiple viruses, we can use multiplex PCR, where you can use different sets, uh, size differences, which is able to detect. If you want to do only two tests, it is a duplex PCR. If you are using a single uh, 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 virus detection, it is a uniplex PCR. And there are several modifications, again, nested PCR, RT-PCR, or the immunocapture like that. Those are all based on the application type. The next thing is, uh, is the real-time PCR, which is a more of quantification and real-time detection, wherein there is no gel process will be there. It is only when you extract the uh, nucleic acid and uh, use the fluorescent probe, it will amplify in real-time within uh, 30 minutes to 45 minutes, it will show the amplification process. If the presence of virus or pathogen is there, it will amplify, the curve will start appearing and it will reach a maximum period. That is the quantity it is going to develop. So the, by seeing in the visually in the monitor, you can say yes, is infected or not infected. Whereas in normal PCR, you see the band, whereas here you don't run a gel, you don't see a band, you will see only the graph. And as I mentioned earlier, the virides are done by nucleic acid abrasion. Earlier it was phase, which is a difficult process, but now the other simpler method is the RT-PCR, the reverse transcription, because being a RNA, it will be converted to cDNA and then PCR detection. This is now commonly used and we also use this method for uh, import and export checking of uh, vegetable seeds, especially tomato, chili, capsicum and brinjal, which are uh, very much required for international movement, viral freeness. And the modification of Excuse PCR me, is... Sir? Sir, uh, we are running short of time. Please make the presentation a bit yeah, I'll wrap up. See, the modification is that these uh, tissues are all, uh, instead of using a PCR machine, simple water bath used for amplification purpose, which can help in, uh, in a one-hour process, you can able to detect and the colors can be visualized and it can be shown that if positive is the color one, negative means uh, there is a colorless or different color it will show. So that is the, uh, this one and the microarray is the one which is again for multiple discrete, uh, detection where pathogens are, uh, probes are embedded and when you hybridize, you get different colors. And the latest technique now, NGS is the one where we detect multiple pathogens uh, using uh, whole genome sequencing. We have done for now uh, tomato and uh, uh, chili wherein you get multiple uh, so though the symptoms uh, sometimes will show different, but you get the multiple pathogen detection. In a single sample, you can detect, and the amount of virus present also you can check. We regularly test the uh, export or import of the planting material, especially the tissue culture, uh, ornamental, and all other food crops which are uh, multiplied and uh, sent, both import and export. And these are the industry people who use our services and the seeds also again we test a lot of seeds which are uh, imported and exported for the purpose these are the industry people who use regularly we get these samples and the planting material salvaging is another important when germplasm comes uh, it will be checked through different processes disinfectation is done and then uh, as I mentioned earlier, if few seeds will be isolated and grown from that, the infection is again confirmed. If it is not dead, then that seed is used for germplasm, otherwise it will be destroyed. Whereas uh, the vegetative propagated uh, materials, we do tissue culturing uh, using the methods uh, like uh, uh, three approaches will be combined, tissue culture micropropagation, where meristem culture, thermotherapy, uh, chemotherapy, all will be applied or it's simultaneously applied and the shoot tube grafting. And the ones which are come in vitro plants, uh, the ones infected will be discarded, which are uh, free, will be selected. Then again indexed, if they are found free, then it is uh, multiplied and uh, it kept for stock. This is how the salvaging is done. Uh, the diagnostics always it depends on the purpose which we are using. There are different types of diagnostics, the DNA and RNA, uh, the, the molecular techniques and the protein-based techniques, but 
for a field detection, we use visible inspection immunostrip or tissue print uh, lamp tests. Whereas uh, lab confirmation, uh, electron microscopy ELISA, molecular assays, and uh, PCR test, and whole genome sequence. Regulatory actions like quarantine are where there is this definite test to be followed. These are ELISA and PCR by gene specific. But now NG is also is now used and now it is in work. They are going to introduce internationally NGS method as a method for regulatory part. These are the, some of the pathogens which are detected in imported germplasm, the uh, bacteria and virus and fungus. There are many were there uh, than uh, PGR and also we have done. The challenge mainly health, uh, seed health management requires well-integrated approach and there is a need for uh, strengthening pest surveillance, diagnostics, early warning systems and rapid response that we are able to protect our uh, plants at the same time we also distribute the safe movement of plant material. Uh, thank you. Uh, I thank uh, the uh, project uh, CR plan vaccines and diagnostics and ICR and the organizers of this training program for giving me this opportunity. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much for that elaborate lecture wherein you could mention the international regulatory framework in the quarantine, national system for planning quarantine, international standards of phytosanitary measures, the quarantine processes and phytosanitary measures in India. Also, the methods of virus detection in various ways. Thank you so much, sir, for joining us and sharing your wisdom with us. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, any? Uh, participants, please post any queries if there are. Okay. If uh, there is no other queries, uh, Reddy sir, thank you so much for joining us. Okay. We shall move to the next uh, topic. We all, we all know how important are the various markers in genetic resource characterization and crop improvement. Now we can listen to our beloved trading convener, Dr. Rohini, regarding the role of molecular markers in horticulture genetic resource management. Before starting the presentation, let me introduce the speaker very briefly. Uh, Dr. Rohini is an alumnus of IARI and she did her PG and PhD in plant genetic resources. She was conferred with Dr. KL Mehra Award by Indian Institute, Indian Society of Plant Genetic Resources in the year 2012 for being the best student in the discipline of plant genetic resources. At present, Dr. Rohini is working as a scientist in the division of flower and medicinal crops, taking care of two institute projects as PI and as co-PI in two external projects. Her major research areas are diversity analysis, molecular characterization, cryopreservation studies, and genetic improvement of medicinal plants. She has published uh, 13 research papers, eight book chapters, and 12 popular articles. Now I request Dr. Rohini to have her lecture. Thank you, Anishma, for that introduction. Uh, I welcome all the participants uh, to my lecture, which is on molecular markers in horticulture genetic resources management. <clears throat> so let us start with uh, biodiversity. Uh, biodiversity refers to the variety and variability of life on Earth. And biodiversity can be defined in terms of uh, three components, starting from the ecosystem diversity. That means the different number of different types of ecosystems which exist, followed by the species diversity, which is the variability between the species or the number of species which occurs and uh, followed by the genetic diversity or the, we can say that it is the diversity that is present within the species. And for plant genetic resources, the last one, that is the genetic diversity is the most important. Coming to horticultural genetic resources, by now everyone will be familiar with what are horticultural genetic resources and why it is important. So they are the materials of potential value which is which can be used for the present as well as the future generation. Why? Because they are the reservoirs of the 
uh, genes or the reservoirs of genetic diversity. So it is important uh, to conserve the horticultural gen genetic resources uh, for ultimate utilization. So what is genetic diversity? Genetic diversity is the Genetic diversity is the total number of genetic characters or total number of genes uh, that is present in a particular species. And uh, we know that genetic diversity is uh, a prerequisite for adaptation and evolution to happen. The species which is more diverse is said to be more genetically flexible to the natural forces of selection. And how to measure this genetic diversity? It can be measured both at the phenotypic level and genotypic level. And what is required for measuring? Markers. Markers are the uh, markers are the tools that are used for measuring the genetic diversity. So, what is a marker? As our usual pen marker, why it is used? It is used to highlight a particular uh, a particular sentence or a particular word that should stand different from others. So, in the same way, a genetic marker is also a tool that highlights a particular trait which is different between the individuals or that differentiates between the individuals. So we have morphological markers, we have biochemical markers, and we also have genetic markers. Morphological markers, as we all know, those are the markers which can be, uh, 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 by using which we can visually differentiate between the individuals. It can be the height, height of a particular plant, it can be the color of a particular uh, fruit or flower color. These are all the traits which can be differentiated visibly and so they are called as the morphological markers and uh, the limitation with morphological marker is that we know that uh, it is influenced by the environment and uh, the polymorphism is also restricted in the case of morphological markers second category is the biochemical markers they are mostly the enzymes they may be the isozymes allozymes or, or even the storage proteins and here the differentiation is made with respect to the a uh, difference in the migration of the proteins uh, during electrophoresis. And this character is highly heritable, so it is used as a marker. Uh, and we know that the proteins are the uh, gene product. So when there is a difference in the protein migration, we can understand that there is a variation in the gene also. And here uh, the limitation is that because it covers a small genome, uh, it, it doesn't detect a uh, very low level of variation. And uh, coming to the DNA markers, th these are the markers which detect the variation at the DNA level. And uh, these are the most robust markers because they are not subjected subject to environmental influences and they are unlimited in number. The only limitation or the only uh, disadvantage is that it is technically more demanding. And coming to the classification, this I think most of you will be aware. Uh, DNA markers are two types, PCR-based markers and non-PCR-based markers. So non-PCR, it's uh, already the first generation markers. Example, the uh, RFLPs, that is the restriction fragment length polymorphisms. and uh, PCR-based comes RAPDs, AFLP, SSRs, ISSRs. These are all the second and third generation markers. And this is the uh, classic uh, grouping of the markers as per their resolution power. So uh, the SNPs are the most uh, uh, robust markers which has got a high resolution power and followed by SSRs, RFLPs and RAPDs are the uh, first generation markers uh, which does not have a very strong discriminating power. So coming to the what are the characters of a good uh, DNA marker, it should be polymorphic. It should be polymorphic means it should be able to detect the uh, differences uh, between the individuals um, based on the genes or based on the alleles. And it should be reproducible in any laboratory experiment. And it should be co-dominant. Co-dominant means it should to differentiate the homozygotes and the heterozygotes and it should cover the genome densely mm. and it should be discriminating that is uh, it should be able to discriminate between even closely related individuals and it should not be subjected to environmental influences it should be neutral means it should not the marker as such should not have any effect on the genotype 
so this ssr uh, that is the i am not covering the other markers ssrs are the most uh, used markers nowadays so i am just going only to ssrs the ssrs are the simple sequence repeat they are uh, actually a short uh, segment of dna and the difference between the individuals is based on the number of repeats uh, the sequence how many times the sequence is repeating that uh, uh, that is how the polymorphism is detected in ssrs for example in p1 if you can see the sequence uh, ctt it is repeating six times in uh, first individual in the second genotype it is repeating eight times so it is this difference that is captured by the ssr marker so if you see on the gel there were these corresponds to two different alleles two different alleles are produced and uh, these ssr markers in pgr management it is mostly used for diversity analysis cult cultivar identification and also dna fingerprinting the limitation with this is that it requires a prior sequence information so it is it is species specific and this is yet the other group of markers which is very frequently used now or the most um, uh, means the third generation marker here the uh, polymorphism is detected in a single uh, nucleotide difference single nuclear in, if you can see in that picture uh, in that uh, first dna uh, first dna there is a difference in the uh, nucleotide g instead of g c has come and instead of c a has come so it is only the difference in a single nucleotide that's why it's called the single nucleotide polymorphism and these are biallelic means it detects uh, uh, it, the these markers uh, produces two different forms of alleles as compared to ssrs ssrs are multi allelic means they can detect uh, many alleles at a time and snp markers they have the inherent capacity of scanning a large number of loci and therefore they are considered as best markers for characterizing and conserving the gene bank materials this is a comparison of different markers uh, the morphological markers uh, it is the number of loci is limited protein markers also limited rflp is unlimited rapd unlimited ssrs are unlimited uh, coming to the inheritance protein rflp and ssrs are the co dominant markers what are the different measures so we know that genetic diversity is the main criteria which has to be kept in mind in all the plant genetic resource management activities so using these markers we are calculating the genetic diversity and what are the different measures of diversity uh, uh, it may it is one of the uh, measure is polymorphism percentage that is the number of loci which is showing polymorphism or more than one allele second measure is heterozygosity it is also uh, referred to as gene diversity uh, this is the most common measure and uh, it is the percentage of the heterozygotes heterozygotic individuals present so two uh, uh, two parameters are there ho it is referred to as ho and he ho is the observed heterozygotes and he is the effective uh, number of expected sorry expected number of heterozygotes and second next parameter is genetic distance it is the measure of the uh, that is the difference between two homologous sequences next parameter is na that is the number of alleles that is the total number of alleles which is detected at a particular locus it is also referred to as allelic diversity and next is uh, effective number of alleles that is the number of alleles which is present in a population if the population is at equilibrium or if all the alleles were at equal frequency so these are the different measures of genetic diversity when we uh, use the molecular markers for genotyping or for uh, analyzing our genotypes then uh, using um, uh, some softwares many softwares are there like uh, power marker genlx uh, pop gene different softwares are there if we if after scoring the data if we use that softwares all these parameters will be generated and based on these parameters we have to make the interpretation like how diverse is our population so in horticultural genetic resource management uh, two broad uh, two broad categories are there or two broad uh, 
uh, steps are there. First is germplasm conservation. So germplasm conservation, it includes collection, maintenance, and characterization. Second is germplasm utilization, which includes evaluation and genetic enhancement. So in all these steps, the main concern uh, or the main idea is maximization of the genetic diversity that is available or retention of the uh, diversity without losing it or in other terms, minimizing the risk of genetic drift that is going to happen. So finally, our aim is to get a population that is uh, genetically pure and well characterized that may be used by the breeders for their improvement programs. Now coming to the selection of markers. So many will be having doubt like which marker to be used. So we cannot tell that this particular marker is better than the other marker. It all depends on many factors. And uh, some of the factors are like why we are using the marker. What is the purpose of analysis? And what is the genetic profile of the germplasm which we, which we are going to analyze? Genetic profile means plant germplasm. They can be genetically, uh, I have made it into four uh, groups. Like it can be homo homozygous and homogeneous. Homozygous and homogeneous means homozygous, it refers to the uh, particular genotype. As in the figure, you can see the allele, the uh, first genotype, capital B, capital B. So here, both the alleles are same. So they are referred to as homozygous. And homogeneous means homogeneous refers to the population. So in that population, all the individuals will be having this capital B, capital B only. So example is the pure lines and the inbred lines. Second category is homozygous and heterogeneous. Uh, that means, again, the genotype will be homozygous, that is either dominant or recessive. But the population will be a mixture of both the dominant and recessive homozygotes. So here the examples are the um, tradition, uh, the varieties, whatever uh, we are, uh, we have in the self-pollinated or inbreeding crops. The third category is heterozygous and homogeneous. Here the individuals will be heterozygous. That means capital B, small b. But the population is non-segregating. All the individuals will be heterozygous only. And here the example is F1 hybrids and uh, a progeny of a vegetatively propagated crop. And fourth category is heterozygous and heterogeneous. This will be a completely heterozygous and genetically segregating group. And purpose of analysis, almost all the uh, markers are used for uh, different purposes, like for diversity analysis, for fingerprinting, for characterization, phylogenetic studies, for removing duplications, for establishing the hybridity, for parental analysis. All the markers have been used. Initially, when there were, uh, like it was the starting of the molecular markers, they, they were using mainly the biochemical and the RAPDs or RFLPs. But with time, now uh, it, most of these studies, they are using SSRs or SNPs. So these are the different uh, steps in which the molecular tools helps in managing the genetic resources in conservation, as I told, collection of germplasm, the quarantine of accessions in the taxonomic identification, characterization, identifying the duplicate accessions, assessing the genetic integrity of the conserved germplasm, and also it prioritizes many species for in situ conservation. And in coming to the germplasm utilization, that is the most important part where the molecular markers are being used. So for the evaluation, for development of core collections, for DNA fingerprinting, and for genetic enhancements. Uh, how uh, molecular markers are used in acquisition or collection of germplasm. I told that everything, the base is the uh, uh, measurement of the genetic diversity. So using molecular markers, once we assess the genetic diversity of a collection that is present with us, we can obviously identify what are the gaps or what is that it is missing in our collection. So it helps to identify the gaps so that our further exploration and collection can be directed towards that. And the second is, uh, if some unique germplasm we are finding with the molecular marker, and if it is underrepresented in the gene bank, if sufficient number of collections are not there, then we can plan for an exploration for collecting uh, that unique germplasm in more numbers. And also it helps to formulate the sampling strategies. Uh, I think in the morning class, Alavat sir has already told like how the sampling has to be done. So for uh, formulating the sampling strategies, also molecular marker diversity analysis is important. We will get an overall idea like how many individuals or how many populations we have sampled and we have got a particular 
uh, amount of diversity. So whether that is sufficient or we have to modify our sampling. So we, uh, the explorers or the collectors, they will get an idea. One example is given is uh, in the case of uh, Lycopersican species, they have sampled self-incompatible and self-compatible population. And when they have analyzed using the RFLP markers, they found that the diversity which was collected in the self-incompatible types were, was more as compared to self-compatible types. So the next exploration mission will be for collecting the self-incompatible types for having more diversity. Same way, uh, it will also give us an idea to determine the collection sites from where to collect, where the more where more diversity will be available. And in that process, we can also uh, prioritize those areas for in situ or on farm conservation. An example is given uh, for rock grape, that is Vitis uh, rupestris uh, species, in which they have analyzed the um, this particular uh, species population using SSR markers. And based on this, uh, they have collected from uh, different sites. And based on this, they found that uh, some seven sites can be used for or can be declared as in situ conservation sites. And this, uh, I will not go into the detail because already Dr. Krishna Reddy sir has covered like uh, for the quarantine of the imported accessions, uh, the PCR based or the DNA marker based methods have been are in practice. For the taxonomic identification, this is yet another very important area for the horticulture genetic resource management. Uh, re resource management, unless the uh, species is properly identified or its taxonomy is um, determined, we cannot further move to any other uh, practices. We cannot conserve it or we cannot utilize it. So the taxonomic identification is very important, and the molecular markers have played a very efficient role in many of the taxa which were. Difficult to, uh, difficult to identify by other methods like morphological methods. Uh, the classic example is citrus. Citrus is a genus which is having n number of species and morphologically it was uh, like very confusing which species or which cultivar comes under which species. So that taxonomy was actually revealed using the molecular markers. Same way, uh, because of uh, an improper identification, many uh, rare species have been ignored. Uh, uh, one such example is Cucurbita ochichobensis. This particular species was wrongly identified and finally it became endangered. Without protecting it, it became endangered. And this is the next application where uh, identification of duplicates. So it is said that almost uh, the uh, in a gene bank collection, more than 50% of the accessions are duplicate accessions. And this uh, doesn't contribute anything. Uh, and it is only the wastage of resources. We are maintaining, we are multiplying uh, these duplicates. So molecular markers also help in the identification of these duplicates, which can be removed and the other collection remaining collection can be effectively maintained or managed so examples are there in lettuce collection uh, they have found with ssr markers the duplicates similarly in the case of ginger germplasm uh, in the ginger conservatory they have used issr and ssr markers to remove the duplicates um, and this is a SSR based analysis, uh, which was done in the sweet cherry germplasm in different uh, uh, gene banks in Europe. And they found that uh, out of 314 accessions, only 180 were unique and the remaining were duplicates. Same way in the case of cassava germplasm from gene banks in Brazil, um, uh, almost uh, 25 to 30 percentage duplicate accessions were found. And this is uh, another important management step that is germplasm characterization. Characterization is essential. Uh, it is a basic step uh, uh, of uh, um, germplasm utilization. In characterization, we are uh, characterizing or we are describing the plant germplasm in terms of many heritable characters. And morphology-based characterization has so many limitations. So the molecular markers are used for uh, characterization. And this is another um, uh, area where maintenance of the genetic integrity of the accessions. So once the accession is conserved, we have to regenerate it at frequent intervals for checking the viability, whether it is viable. And it is, uh, it is there that with each cycle of uh, regeneration, there will be a loss of some genes or alleles. 
due to the effect of drift or selection. So uh, the molecular markers can be used to evaluate like uh, whether the regeneration is proper, whether the sample number of samples that is taken for regeneration is proper. And if more diversity is lost, we have to revise our sampling. Uh, sampling or the number of samples that has to be taken for regeneration. In the same way, in the case of in vitro and cryopreserved material also, it is important to measure the genetic stability. And there are many examples as quoted here uh, where the molecular markers are used. Germplasm evaluation is the most important uh, step where the germplasm, uh, the value of the germplasm is determined for its uh, utilization. And uh, here um, it, it reveals the most of the use, uh, useful agronomic or the yield traits in the process of germplasm evaluation. Here also the molecular markers are used for evaluating the germplasm in addition to the phenotypic evaluation. And as a general rule, it is said that the more dis, uh, when we evaluate, we will compare with the check or with the control. And it is said that uh, the more distinct the uh, genotype, marker genotype is from the check or the allied germplasm, uh, there is a greater likelihood that that particular accession will have a useful QTL which can uh, contribute to the uh, breeding of the allied line. So marker assisted germplasm or uh, screening uh, is done uh, apart from the phenotypical screening. Uh, so the markers, uh, there are three uh, different uh, categories. First, markers, they can be directly associated with the plant products, high value plant products, or the markers will be linked with the genes uh, which are responsible for certain traits like the resistance traits to biotic or abiotic stresses. Uh, and in the case of um, uh, perennial fruit crops or the ornamental crops, genetic markers are uh, crucial for screening the germplasm at an early stage for uh, some um, uh, desirable characters without waiting for a long period, the genetic markers can be used for screening even uh, at the seedling stage so that the further establishing of that particular, uh, means if any undesired um, or the um, uh, genotype which uh, doesn't contain our desirable trait, we need not maintain it further. So at that stage itself, we can remove it. And uh, many uh, important genes, uh, horticulturally important genes were tagged using molecular markers, uh, like fruit for fruit quality parameters, fruit yield potential, the genes uh, co corresponding to uh, major, uh, the, the resistant genes which are corresponding to diseases and pests. As an example, in cucumber, cucumis sativus, uh, 322 QTLs have been mapped for 42 quantitative traits. And among that, uh, 109 uh, QTLs were corresponding to the disease resistance gene. So this kind of tagging is done, which will be further useful for utilizing this germplasm in breeding programs. So this is yet another application that is development of core collection. So core collection is nothing, but it is a subset of the whole collection. It is difficult to manage a, a very large number of germplasm for facilitating easy management uh, from the whole, uh, whole set of germplasm. A, uh, a few accessions are uh, taken out and they are used to form a core set. Uh, and it is formed in such a way that uh, it doesn't disturb the genetic diversity what is present in the whole collection. And uh, it is said that uh, the core collection con consists, consists of 10 percentage of the whole collection, but it possess 70 percentage of the alleles which is present in the whole collection. So these core collections are already available in many horticultural crops like uh, anona and uh, in most of the vegetable crops, the core collections are available. And this is where uh, genetic, for the genetic enhancement, the markers are used. We uh, know that they are now nowadays it is mostly the marker assisted introgressions or marker assisted selections are going on in horticulture in horticultural crops, which is uh, advantageous because it speeds up the uh, breeding process uh, as compared to the traditional uh, breeding. The time taken is very less. And if we, we have any QTLs linked to a particular trait, uh, that will be easy to follow up in the progenies. 
and these are some other uh, uh, uses where like uh, the map based isolation of the genes uh, it can help in gen the genetic engineering also if we know the genes we can use it for genetic engineering in uh, horticultural species markers are also used to verify the hybridity of the progeny and uh, the uh, they are they also help in the selection of the parents uh, the use of markers they uh, help us to understand the genetic distance between species and uh, they will uh, help they will make us understand like whether these species are crossable if they are genetically close means it will be easy uh, easy to use them as parents in the breeding program and the dna fingerprinting is also another application of markers that is to maintain the purity of the genotype to avoid any genetic contamination so these are the some of the examples in uh, different uh, fruit crops vegetable uh, fruit crops where the markers are used and uh, like the applications uh, for what they have been used and the reference is also given in almost all crops commercially important crops uh, is there and this is uh, with regard to the vegetable crops and the flower crops so i would like to conclude my talk by saying that a planned use of molecular markers in innovative breeding schemes would increase the utilization of the genetic resources thank you so much thank you rohini ma'am uh, for covering the topics on types of markers recent advances in use of molecular markers in horticulture genetic resource management especially starting from the collection of germplasm taxonomic identification identification of duplications in the collection uh, use in characterization development of core collections etc thank you ma'am we have a query not the query he is asking a comment from your side it is for any variety release proposals fingerprinting is mandatory but in many of the horticulture crops robust mark molecular markers are not yet developed so what is your comment on this sir i think ravi shankar sir will be the better person to uh, talk on this okay sir for this query uh, we'll have uh, dr kv ravi shankar sir the expert <laughs> working encyclopedia in the diversity analysis and molecular markers so in the next session during that session we'll answer this question also uh, we will have a small poll for this session sridhar sir yeah already the uh, link is shared in the chat box all of
conserved in horticulture institute and about uh, 130 horticulture crops so what is that how to move okay uh, can we go beyond the morphological diversity which we observed and we measure usually we measure the number of fruits the number of leaves or the number of uh, branches and other things so we also maybe as a scientist or researchers we may be also interested in the genetic uh, basis of this diversity and also we'd like to know some part of evolutionary biology of that crop to understand how variation has come out in that particular because most of these species evolved into different geographical region so they have different selection pressures so this makes very interesting that evolutionary biology and also look at the genetic basis of the diversity and as a part of the crop improvement we also need to look at the gene discovery so how one can identify at the end of the day, now we also need to use our article genetic uh, genetic resources for crop improvement. So how one can uh, use our uh, germplasm or uh, our <coughs> diversity for the crop improvement? So that are the main things that we what we are planning to do is uh, use the genomic resources which uh, are available. So for example, we know that uh, as the domestication uh, happened from wild related to we have got the land races and now because of uh, advances in breeding, so we have varieties and hybrids. So as you move uh, up on the pyramid, you can see the genetic diversity has narrowed down. Now, if you look at the very genetic diversity, it has narrowed down mean, that means that the alleles present the allelic variation in the varieties or hybrids very low so but we have wild relatives since we are having different problems or the new new problems are coming because of change in the climate or change in the pathogen density or variability we need to have new new alleles to counter this biotic and abiotic stresses so what we did, we have narrowed down the genetic variation, but we are in in order to improve the agronomic performances. So in your wild relatives, you have different groups, different races, and everything. But in land races, you have narrowed down one or two groups, and in varieties, you have very few alleles. So what are the genomic resources? Genomic resources include both wild relatives and genomic mitochondrial chloroplast DNA. RNA, DNA markers, vectors, clones, and libraries, which we do, Lacidina library or tissue specific library. And you have different artificial chromosomes like back bacterial artificial chromosome, or yeast artificial chromosome, or packed artificial chromosome. These are the things. And finally, now we have uh, next generation sequencing. This is the ultimate. Now the, we have the whole genome sequence information both in terms of the chromosome, in terms of mitochondria and chloroplast. So this is the one which is giving a lot of advantages to the, our researchers to understand the, how the living beings or the or group of species are doing, or what are the variability, how the variability has created. Coming to the genomics, what we mean by genomics here. So genomics, uh, so we can, we can go back to the central dogma that is we have a DNA, RNA, and a protein. How we, all of you know that uh, that this is how genetic information is carried from one generation to another generation, or genetic information within the cell, how it is translated into protein. And uh, finally, we have the phenotypes. So in the DNA, we have genomics. Uh, actually, overall, everything is called genomics nowadays. But in the, when you use uh, DNA, we have structural genomics, functional genomics, epigenomics, that is the epistasis and other things, mitogenomics, variation in the different uh, uh, mutations and other things, uh, insertions and deletions, and pangenomics. You can look at the whole uh, genome sequence of group of uh, uh, individuals in the species that creates a pangenomics. And when you analyze the RNA, we have transcriptomics. When you analyze the protein, we have proteomics and we have analyzed chemicals, metabolomics nowadays. We are also analyzing the uh, 
the ions that is which makes uh, the phenotypes are different ionomics and finally by phenomics phenomics is also now we are using computer aided phenomics analysis coming to the genetic research as already a uh, previous speaker also told we have collections mini core collection mapping population which we develop using contrasting genotype and we have a number of elite varieties and we have mutant uh, population these are the genetic uh, resources which is available for most of the horticulture crops and what are the genomic resources are there so genomic resources basically we have reference genome we have reference genome for many of the crops like uh, we have for coffee we have for banana we have for the beans we have for the tomato chili and <coughs> whole genome sequence resequencing so they already there are 300 to 400 uh, genotypes have been resequenced in tomato and chili and functional omics here we are both we are looking at the transcriptome and also proteomics and we also have genotypic plot forms genotypic plot forms means them is microarray snp arrays are there for the uh, tomato and uh, uh, most of the field crops is there but in uh, horticulture crops right now we have for tomato and pan genome the pan genome as i earlier told is a, if you seek resequence some uh, good amount of good number of uh, genotypes in the particular species you can create the pan genome so this will help in uh, looking at the structural variation in the uh, particular species so how one can uh, use this uh, transgenic uh, sorry uh, genomic resources in uh, improving our uh, uh, crops one example we can have to, we can do genetic diversity analysis we can also do trait mapping so and also we can identify the candidate gene and also we can develop a diagnostic marker or markers linked to some particular trait and uh, we can use that in early generation selection see early generation selection is very important in case of most of the horticulture crops because they have long juvenile phase most of the uh, like fruit crops and they are heterozygous in nature they have to wait for uh, seven to eight years to see whether there is a mango what we have bred or <coughs> the uh, any other crops it will take minimum five years or custard apple any heterozygous fruit crops even some of the medicinal plants also it takes quite a long time because of high juvenile phase and also they are heterozygous the outcomes are highly unexpected so this uh, one can do early generation selection using uh, uh, marker so that will help to identify the positive clones or positive seedling so that we can have minimum number of uh, selections and uh, we can carry forward and marker assisted back crossing or marker assisted integration and now there is a new the uh, term called genomic selection we we can use uh, both uh, genotype data and phenotype data and we can get the genetic the body called uh, breeding values for that particular uh, segregating population or such thing so the, in nutshell we this is the decision supporting technologies the genomics basically helps the breeder or the helps the conservation uh, person to know like what to what he can conserve and how one can use that uh, technologies uh, for the aim of the project or uh, crop improvement so coming to the dna marker uh, i think we started the dna marker application uh, sometime in the early 80s so now we moved on to ssr genotyping is this still it is using then we had a dart so we moved to the pcr based marker to the snp based markers uh, because they are more precise and highly reproducible uh, dart genotyping cas assay or array assay that is micro array assay and nowadays now sequence based genotyping where we are doing uh, gbs uh, genotype by sequencing or whole genome resequencing rat sequencing dart sequencing or slfa sequence so what has happened over the years the the cost per you know, data it has come down you you get large number of uh, data for the but the flexibility also uh, to the certain extent it is reduced you get good number of data but we need to have uh, the funds also needs to be there to do sequence by gbs or array based but you get good pakka data 
so coming to the the how one can use that in uh, understanding the uh, variation or uh, the evolutionary basis of this diversity so this is uh, one of our study which we did for the indian mango cultivars so what we did we around we used some 300 plus uh, mango germ plasm and we wanted to see how what is the population how uh, the diversity is present in the mango population one can see the top one is data coming from the ssr marker and the, the bottom one is the data coming from snp marker so clearly one can see the north indian uh, mango cultivars are separated compared to the south and western uh, mango cultivar so there is a clear cut uh, differences and also we found that diversity in uh, southern indian cultivars more uh, compared to the north indian cultivars so uh, this is very strange because we know that the northeast is the the place where the mango is originated and uh, later it moved to the north india and uh, south so uh, southern region so why this uh, diverse uh, population has occurred so but uh, once we study the phenology of the mango you can see that uh, the mango flowering starts from the uh, kerala and it moves towards the south uh, moves towards the north sorry so one you, uh, you get uh, the first flowering in the, the kerala and karnataka and then andhra and maharashtra then the later the flowering occurs in the north uh, so usually may, uh, may you get the fruits in the may june in the south india and uh, june july in the north india so there is no chance of the pollen moving from south india to north india because the flowering comes very late and uh, there is no chance of uh, uh, because of highly recalcitrant uh, seeds or the animals may not may not be able to uh, uh, disperse these seeds to the longer distances so more, mostly the 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 whatever the germ plasm or genotypes is there in local so they 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 are only they they are germinated and only it will contribute to the local uh, evolution of the new genotypes or new varieties so and also we found there is a high affiliation between the varieties with in, uh, in relation to the geographical like for example southern indian uh, cultivars are highly related to, and northern indian cultivars are highly related to among themselves so that it, because the, these are the positive clones which are uh, identified the farmers and they are propagated through vegetatively so therefore so there is no chances of pollen moving from the south to north or north to south because they are the phenologically the they are uh, the they have different flowering time and even the fruiting times are different uh, fruit dispersal also very limited because of uh, highly recalcitrant seeds so this has caused the, the, some bottleneck for the um, random mating and we have a separate two population structure so this gives one idea how the diversity has a how diversity is evolving in the indian cultivars okay and coming to the other one like variability we found in the fruit colors like we have a dna and uh, with the transcriptome in the there is a uh, gene expression and then protein is synthesized and there is a metabolite will coming so that these are the places one can see the, the variability in the fruit color so coming to the variability we have uh, different uh, fruit colors uh, major are three types of colors like fruit color is green uh, most or some of the fruits like amrapalli is green and uh, manganpalli and uh, arka anamol are yellow in color and this is and uh, these are peel color and uh, some janardan person is red color so uh, we analyze what makes these uh, fruits this different color so we found that uh, carotenoids are major component which gives uh, yellow color in the yellow peeled mango fruits and anthocyanin are most uh, abundant pro uh, pigments in uh, red uh, fruited uh, mango ma red mango fruits so we also identify uh, looked at the gene expression of this biosynthesis of uh, anthocyanin and carotenoid we found that uh, carotenoid biosynthetic pathway is highly active in the yellow fruited color compared to the other two like uh, green and uh, uh, red fruits 
and in red fruits the anthocyanin biosynthetic pathway is highly active but here in the green fruits what is happening the chloroplast remains as such there is no degradation of chloroplast the chloroplast is very active and little amount of carotenoids and bio, uh, anthocyanin but then there is not much uh, activity of this carotenoids and uh, anthocyanin pathway compared to red and uh, yellow fruited color so this is how one can study the uh, uh, the evolution of diversity in, at the genomic level and also at biochemical level. So as I told, the next generation sequencing has revolutionized the understand, our understanding of biodiversity uh, in terms of uh, biosynthetic pathway and also it, it is giving marker-assisted breeding, marker, molecular marker development, gene expression analysis, and uh, it, we also identify the domestication events uh, and uh, yeah, these are all the, each one one can have a separate seminar what are the domestication events and mechanism of biological process and also look at the evolution and diversification and uh, and also look at the, gen the genome wide duplication events is very common in the plant that also one can study so coming to uh, the <coughs> apple whole genome sequencing of apple is available First, we thought uh, gene variation, allelic variation is the major uh, uh, driving force for the um, our diversity. But uh, the whole genome sequencing of apple will has shown to a totally different way. Here, the association of retrotransposon also causes uh, the variation. So this is another one. You can see in the right side uh, um, graph, there are structural variation, both uh, deletion and insertion in uh, uh, two different red and uh, uh, green uh, uh, apple so th there are like there are so much structural variation is there in terms of the uh, retrotransposon so one uh, good example is there there is a similarity in the the gene which uh, the transcription factor md moib it is involved in the anthocyanin pathway but in the green uh, fruited apple, so there is no retrotransposon. But in the red uh, fruited, uh, there is a retrotransposon insertion in the transcription activator site here. So this causing uh, the phenotype differences here. So there is a structural variation. You can see that even retrotransposon also uh, are responsible for the creating lot of variability in the uh, plant species apart from the allelic variation so coming to the t uh, one can see the like in the early 2000 we were basing mostly based on the morphology classification and diversity next we moved to transcriptome and uh, from 2011 to 2018 we are lo looking at the T plant transcriptome and uh, sequencing gene discovery database and construction. And uh, the plant phase three now uh, from the 2020 and once people are looking at the genotype uh, phenotype, the map the, for exact right, what is the genetic basis? Are the genes responsible? What are the retrotransposon responsible? What are the uh, transcription factor responsible? You have come to that stage now, the variability, what is the basis of the variability? and where we can tap those variability to improve the crop. Uh, so these are the different approaches we have in the genomics. Uh, for example, you have genotype by sequencing, as I already told you, whole genome resequencing, rat sequencing, BAC sequencing. This is the one which uh, most of the people are using now. Either you take the contrasting genotypes or contrasting things in the germplasm or in the mapping population and re sequence it and look for the, the SNP association with the particular trait statistically. So then you can, and also there are like uh, discovery of pathogen. You just look at the, we are looking for the resistant gene. You just uh, resequence the resistant gene family members and look for their differences and uh, marker institutes breeding have the uh, two three uh, things uh, one is we are ssr they are low coverage and now we have ngs that is the high coverage that is it kind of covers whole genome 
and we have different populations like for to use this marker your biparental population or your diversity panels or the trained mapping population will be there like if usually f1 is the mapping population uh, in most of the uh, horticulture uh, uh, medicinal fruits and fruit crops because the parents are heterozygous and we use the genome wide association or qtl mapping by that we can identify the uh, genes which are having large effect or small effect and also we can develop some marker what we do as the last speaker told we can use the marker resistant selection or marker resistant back crossing marker resisted recurring selection or genomic selection here genomic selection both genotype data that is whole genome sequence data and phenotype data are combined using statistically and you can use that as a elite breeding line or you can use that as a uh, pre breeding line or you can use that as one of the genetic resource for developing pre breeding line so some of the examples uh, as uh, now i'll tell you you have the you can identify the through qtl mapping regions which are responsible for heat tolerance here in tomato and also using uh, transcript now one can identify what are the regions which the genes which are highly expressed in the heat tolerance so you can correlate it or you can both collect both the data and identify the genes responsible for the heat tolerance similarly we do the gbs this is a one plot forum uh, this is a sample preparation library uh, you do assembly and basically finally you, you call for snp variation and you can do the diversity analysis and you can make this uh, diversity or snps uh, uh, whether they are significantly linked to the trait which we are measuring so another is genome wide association studies here genome wide association studies uh, one we do uh, the snp analysis and look at the population structure whether it is a single population or by by parental population or they have multiple population and then we associate phenotypic data and identify the qtls or gene here single marker analysis and also it is a highly useful especially in in case of germplasm collection so this is one way one can do mm, yeah. and also we can identify novel low say candidate genes this is the, in the cucumber i'm just running through because of paucity of time so these are all data coming from the germ plasm or diversity analysis and also here one this is the one study genetic genomics and breeding of rose species uh, here they are looking at different diversity uh, panel like f2 bc and uh, magic population nam etc they did the phenotyping and then the genotyping there are they using genomic selection how we can identify directly pre breeding lines and one can you once you identify the genes responsible for the either color or resistance you can do genetic engineering take out that uh, particular uh, gene either you do gene editing or you can do over express in the uh, transgenic uh, uh, through transgenic method now this is another one uh, one can see this is the the one is early ripening mutant and is the late ripening mutant somebody wants to know like, what are the uh, genes which are responsible for early ripening so one can do transcriptome analysis and you can do the heat map and identify the genes which are uh, responsible for early ripening here they found that uh, the auxins are the major uh, Uh, pathway which uh, is responsible for the early ripening so you can uh, identify the genes which are uh, uh, involved in the auxin biosynthesis and you can manipulate either through breeding or through uh, transgenic or through gene editing nowadays and this is a single cell transcriptome but uh, this is also used nowadays but uh, uh, it is upcoming one can do for example in if you are uh, Uh, very particular about uh, some tissue which you have uh, bio prospecting like sometimes you, you people are using the bark as one of the uh, ingredient uh, bark as one of the pharmaceutical important uh, material in the medicinal plant so one can do this uh, single cell uh, transcriptome assay and identify what are the genes which are synthesized in the cinnamon bark or some other uh, bark so to identify the which path is important there and uh, you, how we can manipulate it 
so this is already i told you genome assisted breeding so here uh, this is simple that you, you can identify in the germplasm they have done in brassica napus they took high uh, oil content and low oil content so there are some 10 genera which are high oil content and 10 genera which are low oil content they did uh, uh, transcriptome wide association studies so they identified the, the genes they have snp markers here you can see strongly associated with uh, positively associated with uh, oil content so then they go back and see what are the genes or what are the transcription factor what are the genomic regions which are associated with the high oil content from the germplasm so that those will give you the idea directly as i told you it is a single marker essay so they one can identify the genes which are responsible for the high oil content or the genomic region which are responsible for only thing we need to do is we need to do transcriptome assay for the low oil content and the high oil content using some uh, hundreds hundreds of individual then you can uh, do this so then how one can genomic uh, because they are most of the trites are uh, governed by multi uh, genes and also this is governed also it depends on the the environmental factors for example in conventional breeding to breed a apple or some uh, mango you take 25 to 20 years like you have to do crosses for year and evaluate for 20 to 25 years and uh, and again you have to propagate and uh, multi location trial it is, all takes longer time but in genomic selection less than 10 years so you guys we do early generation selection the crosses can be done in 4 years evaluation to 1 to 2 years and propagation once you identify with the uh, good confidence once you as in the uh, seedling stage you can directly go for propagation and you can multiply and farmers can grow so it will take less than 10 years so that is the uh, power of the genomic selection or genomics so this is the one slide last one on i will tell you that how diversity is useful for uh, identifying the genes which are responsible for domestication and also uh, <coughs> divergence for example what this is a simple study they have done 610 lines uh, they identified and they have done the gbs and they identified uh, uh, 20 lakhs 26 lakhs of snps in the one then also they have done transcriptome analysis and also they did the metabolomic analysis to to tell the in nutshell the domestication as there are five loci which are helping the domestication one of them is the sir so that is there increase in the fruit size and this is the locus the fw 11.3 fruit weight that is the locus which is uh, uh, responsible the selected during the domestication we all look it for the size and um, what the breeder did for example they wanted to bring uh, bring some uh, Uh, resistance low from the wild relatives uh, so that they have interacted with uh, some uh, wild uh, genera types or uh, pimpinelli forum or uh, uh, chilensis so these are the some so there is some linkage drag is there so there are tm2 or ty2 all they are coming from the the wild relatives so they when we have a big tomato and they have a resistant tomato but over the years we are also looking for the color uh, from red to pink slight pink is now people have wanted so here there is a selection for mib12 which is responsible for the uh, gene or the transcription factor so that gives a pink color so here in metabolites they are identified these are the 45 steroidal glycolides which are selected during the dom domestication in crop improvement or that is during the crop improvement way looking for the big uh, Uh, fruit at size there are eight metabolites are selected and during the resistance breeding we have there are 127 metabolites are integrated into the tomato so and for the divergence there are 120 metabolites so you can identify the gene responsible for the uh, domestication and gene responsible for the integration of the Uh, uh different uh, resistant genes and also divergence so in this study using transcriptome metabolome and varium one can identify the genes and also in, one can identify the metabolites which are what is happened during domestication and resistance breeding so this is a nice paper i think most of the, uh, all of you must read rewiring the 
fruit metabolism and tomato breeding and tomato. okay yeah as i told uh, that uh, i think last speaker also told uh, we, we have uh, maximum genetic diversity and then we uh, as we grow crop implement our diversity will uh, decrease but what we need to do is whatever uh, germplasm or uh, genotypes you have we need to do some pan genome so that we know the why there is a differences in the pan genome that is that the structural variant why there are so many we have thousand varieties of mango so we need to know like so what is the structural variant how the the, the uh, reeds or the variations are coming up in the domesticated mango and uh, also we have a lot of databases in the genomic research so one can see uh, look at the gene level or variation one of them is 10000 plant genome project which is coming from uh, beijing gening institute so they have big uh, platform to, uh, to uh, sequence most of the plants uh, commercially important economically important places so one can go through this and uh, these are the different uh, genomic databases banana mango citrus papaya durian so those who are conserving uh, uh, horticulture genomic research you should visit and see what are the they also have uh, the genome sequences for the many of the varieties and hybrids and uh, traditional varieties okay so one of the most important is solanaceous genome network so you can have most of the solanaceous uh, genomes are sequenced uh, accessions are available here so for, for penelli lycopersicoid melangina and uh, and also one can search what are the organism which is available there and what are the qtls available the markers available there for this species uh, one can make use of these tools yeah, and there are a uh, lot of analytical tools also there like blast uh, genome browser in silico pcr all those things are there one one has to visit uh, uh, these uh, databases and nowadays uh, the in vitro breeding has come that uh, that gene editing uh, maybe somebody else will be talking so using whatever the variations we found uh, in the nature one can edit that there are like uh, one paper uh, is called in vitro domestication of wild so they brought the uh, solanum penelli and edited the six places uh, the solanum penelli has a small fruit head and low number of flowers and low number of uh, fruits and small size fruit so in vitro domestication has occurred Uh, when you change the six uh, genes there is an increase in the fruit size number of branches improved number of flowers has improved so and also there is an increase in the nutrient content so that through gene editing somebody can do that so these are the power derived from the uh, variation or diversity we found in the nature so summarize what we have that we have genomics we have germplasm how one can use uh, both the tool that is uh, germplasm and genome we can look at the diversity and uh, also we can have we can I, as a scientist we need to know the how this diversity evolution has evolved and uh, we we can use that uh, data or the information conservation and uh, germplasm enhancement that uh, germplasm enhancement means we So basically, looking at diversity means we are improving the allelic uh, content or variation in that at the gene level, and we can identify some core collection, and uh, we can also use that in germplasm for the genome gene discovery. So, for example, as previous speaker told, we have a basic collection. We have so much redundancy or duplication is there. So, using the markers or using uh, next generation sequencing we can make it a primary collection or even core collection mini core collection then you look at the disease resistance stress tolerance high yield and nutrient use so this is all we can be done using either core collection or mini core collection because that has most of the alleles from wild so these are the some of the conclusion as i told you that genome wide selection and uh, uh, transcriptome wide association studies and uh, linkage disequilibrium or uh, population structure studies and integration of different omic approaches transcriptome or metabolomics and uh, uh, eqtl that is uh, uh, identifying uh, 
express QTLs with the uh, genome wide association study, one can study the domestication and uh, genes of impedance and also the selection pressure where the important metabolites or important genes have been selected by uh, human beings or breeders over the period of time. So these are all interesting study one can do in using uh, uh, genomics with the horticulture genomic resource, uh, horticulture genetic resource. Thank you. Any questions? Thank you, sir. Please post your queries in the chat box if any. So the earlier question. For uh, yeah, that is true that we don't have uh, reproducible uh, markers. Uh, the SSRs are most reproducible, but still uh, it varies uh, among the uh, the results varies among the labs and uh, one has to standardize the SSR for its uh, reproducibility that we have not done in articles genetic resources yeah that is true especially for the dna fingerprinting but uh, now the most robust and uh, highly reproducible snp markers are there so one can use that if you are looking for ipr issues and uh, if you want to have uh, IPR uh, rights over your some genotypes or germplasm or hybrid, so one can resort to the SNP that is highly reproducible. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just told you, I gave it on one. Uh, on, uh, where is that? Yeah. I, uh, I gave the example of T. Uh, yeah. See, we, we earlier we did did uh, morphological studies and then moved to the uh, huh? you can see yeah. Such, such possibilities uh, is going to be there because uh, we are dealing with uh, most uh, heterozygous plants, so it is still difficult. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, uh, Serials and uh, any of the field crops is, is very easy comparative to the our medicine and food crops. Uh, and uh, we are fortunate we have some tomato and uh, chili and pollination uh, crop. But other than uh, that, uh, that fruit and medicinal crops, we, we are long way to grow. Go and understand the genetics of uh, trites in uh, heterozygous plants is still in a very uh, uh, preliminary and stage. Yeah, okay. yeah, it helps in uh, identifying uh, intra. Bigger. See, nowadays, uh, the, uh, one thing is like we have. Uh, Two problems with uh, fruit crops and medicine. One is the uh, long juvenile phase and another the heterozygous nature and the incompatibility and the polyploidiness. Uh, most of the medicinal, we don't know even the ploidin level of the. So these are all the problems. But uh, we, we, you should not lose heart because now the gene editing has come. So that is the one tool. Uh, it is called uh, uh, transform our. Uh, Reading, it is like a lab reading nowadays. So you can edit and look for the phenotypes and 
the, still we there is an uh, what is the major problem is we have not uh, standardized the regeneration protocol for many of these crops that is the bottleneck now so editing tools are there may in uh, many crops for example in grapes and in banana they have shown as a proof of concept so gene editing the, they have done they increase the beta carotene in banana uh, that is all possibility is there like banana breeding is really tough like uh, but uh, recent paper shows that there is a ch chances using uh, gene editing you can increase the beta carotene but yeah we need to try that uh, gene editing uh, one and the second one we need to standardize the uh, physiculture protocol regeneration mm -hmm. protocol for many of these fruit trees you know, and uh, medicinal plants uh, that, uh, so that that way we can uh, improve our uh, genotypes. Or, uh, yeah. If uh, no other queries, thank you so much, sir, for that crisp and interesting lecture on genomics and horticulture genetic resources. So we could uh, get an idea on the various genomic resources, different branches of genomics, and uh, we could understand the, how genomic resources can be used in various aspects of genetic resource management like screening for various traits of economic importance genomics assisted breeding transcriptomic uh, transcriptome wide association studies etc thank you so much sir, for thank joining you. us today the last lecture uh, dear participants today's last lecture will be delivered by Dr. R.H. Lakshman, sir. Uh, Lakshman, sir, is currently the principal scientist in the Division of Basic Sciences, IIHR Bangalore. And he is the PI of uh, ICR-sponsored NICRA project at ICR IIHR. Sir is a doctorate from uh, Indian Institute of, sorry, IARI, New Delhi. And uh, sir has been involving in studies on production, physiology, and phenotyping of horticultural crops for high temperature, Deficit and excess moisture stress for tolerance for last 20 years. He has assessed the impact of elevated carbon dioxide on tomato, onion, and French beans. Identification of eggplant rootstocks for enhancing flood tolerance in tomato is yet another important contribution of Dr. Lakshman. He is an, also engaged in phenotyping of genotypes with tolerance to high temperature in tomato peas and French beans. Sir is also having more than 85 publications in reputed international and national journal, journals. With this uh, very brief introduction, I would request Dr. R.H. Lakshman to deliver his lecture on the topic, Climate Smart Technologies in Horticulture. Sir, Lakshman, sir. Dr. Anushma? Yes, sir. Am I audible? Yes, sir, you are audible. Yeah. Okay. So I thank uh, the organizers, Dr. Raj Sekaran and Dr. Anushma for giving me an opportunity to interact with the participants. Uh, respected Dr. Raj Sekaran, Dr. Anushma, my friend Dr. Ravi Shankar, and uh, all the participants. So today I will be discussing with you about the climate change. Hello? Uh, sir, your slides are visible, but not in the slideshow mode, sir. Sir, please make it in the slideshow mode, sir. Lakshman, sir? Yes, yes. Now, is it no, okay? Sir. No, sir. You, ah, now it is coming, sir. Yeah, right. Please so, try to change the slides, sir. If it is moving. Yeah. Yeah, it's moving. It's changed. Yeah. Right. Okay. So, dear participants, so I will be discussing about the climate change, the issue of climate change and then the likely impacts. And uh, Dr. Ravi Shankar has already discussed about the genotyping but corresponding corresponding phenotyping is missing in our 
corresponding phenotyping is not uh, commensurate with the genotyping efforts. So that also I will be discussing a little bit. And then uh, climate smart uh, technologies or adaptation uh, technologies, which can help in uh, uh, the uh, pro maintaining the pro productivity of horticulture crops. So as you know, uh, the climate change issue has been uh, being uh, discussed quite uh, often. And now, of course, the discussions are uh, uh, at a very high level uh, between the governments and uh, each country has to adjust with the, uh, the carbon dioxide or even the greenhouse gas release and then develop their development. So the, every country is a very uh, 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 conservative in committing uh, to the uh, reduction of greenhouse gases. So this whole uh, uh, long road of glo global climate change issues discussion started in 1972. And subsequently, you are all aware about the Earth Summit in uh, 1992, which is a landmark uh, summit. And subsequently, there have been many uh, conference of parties meetings uh, at, at various uh, locations. And uh, during these uh, discussions, they have arrived at certain uh, decisions which have helped in uh, reducing the greenhouse gas emissions. And uh, uh, COP21, that Paris Agreement, uh, was uh, very instrumental. And they just want to prevent the Earth's uh, uh, atmospheric uh, or the uh, average temperature increase below 2.2, 1 point, around to 1.5 degrees Celsius. So they somehow want to uh, limit it below the two degrees Celsius. And uh, the latest uh, sixth assessment report also very clearly says that the climate change, uh, recent changes in the climate are widespread, rapid, and they're in, uh, intensifying, and they are unprecedented in, uh, unprecedented in thousand uh, years. And it is undisputed, and this has happened mainly because of the activities, anthropogenic activities of the uh, uh, the population. And uh, of course, we have been seeing the widespread increase in the rainfall patterns, whether it is deficit or uh, increase in the rainfall. And they have also attributed this whole thing to the uh, greenhouse gas emission. So ultimately, it is affecting the whole reason or the every reason of the earth in multiple ways. And the changes we are experiencing will increase further uh, with the increase in the warming. So unless we take certain actions, so limiting the average uh, increase in the temperature to 1.5 degrees Celsius is going to be difficult. So whole uh, uh, effort, the world effort or the all the government's effort is towards restricting the average temperature to 1.5 degrees Celsius. But given the increase in the greenhouse gases, so that is tough, but a lot of negotiations are happening among the governments. So there are no going backs, whatever the changes are happening, there is no going back now and whatever the damage has taken place, we need to limit it. And the to limit this global warming, we need a very strong, rapid, and sustained reduction in uh, the greenhouse gases. And this would not only reduce the consequences of climate change, but also will improve the air quality. So you, you may be aware about the Delhi air quality. And uh, this sixth assessment report has been very clearly showing across the continents, uh, whether it is North America or Central America or Europe, so across the continents, we are seeing the increase in the incidence of uh, hot extremes. So we have seen around 41 uh, incidents of increase in temperatures. And the studies have also shown that heavy precipitation patterns are uh, increasing uh, in, uh, across the continents. Uh, they have observed around 19 incidents of heavy precipitation precipitation. And we are also seeing in our own country the extreme heavy precipitation patterns. And when there is a delayed monsoon, we are also seeing the 
uh, droughts. And uh, here again, uh, the agriculture droughts have been uh, increasing across the continents. And this is the future scenario. So the different uh, model driven uh, scenarios are indicating that if our lifestyle is going to be uh, with a lot of uh, consumerism, we are likely to hit even uh, five degrees Celsius increase in the global temperature by 2001. And of course, you are all aware the recently held COP26 meetings, uh, the various governments have committed to reduce the greenhouse gases and India also has committed. Uh, the main uh, feature is that we, uh, we want to increase the, uh, the non-conventional energy resources. And we also would like to reduce or become net zero by 2070. And these are the extreme events what we have been observing in Indian condition. In 1970, we could see only the number of warm days around two. And by 2005, we have seen increase in the uh, number of warm days by 20. And 57% of the Indian's farmlands are vulnerable to these extreme weather events. And uh, these are all because of the anthropogenic interventions. So that we have been observing the variability in rainfall, uh, the excess rainfall or the deficit rainfall. So that are going to affect the agriculture or horticulture to a great extent. And uh, even uh, in uh, 2019, we could see the uh, increase in uh, uh, precipitation patterns. So that has affected many areas. And uh, with this, uh, we can uh, say that the horticulture as such is not uh, uh, different. It, it also is going to be affected, but we have attained a tremendous growth in uh, horticulture sector. We are now, we have surpassed the production in terms of uh, agriculture production. And uh, it is around uh, 329.86 million tons. And uh, this having attained uh, the growth in uh, horticulture and uh, having the nutritional security, we cannot keep quiet under the changing climatic conditions. We have to develop the adaptation strategies so as to sustain the production and productivity of different horticulture crops. So the, in general, I just want to discuss what are the climate change impacts. So the climate change associated occurrence are related with the occurrence of abiotic stresses. So mainly the change in precipitation patterns lead to both the drought and uh, flood stresses and the global uh, temperature increase also affects the horticulture crops. Uh, they, they will have high temperature stress on crops and with the average increase in the air temperature, we also need additional uh, water to meet out the ad additional evaporative demand by the crops. So these stresses, whether it is drought or flooding or high temperature, they may occur individually or in combination. So they will coincide with different growth and developmental phases. And uh, of course, the, under climate change conditions, we are anticipating or the, we are observing the increase in the carbon dioxide concentration. This helps the C3 crops to a certain extent, but because of the drought conditions or excess moisture condition or high temperature condition, so it will be offset. Whatever the gains we are going to have will be offset. So we can, uh, combat the interactive effects of the high temperature, water stress, and CO2. And all these three interactions will determine to what extent the horticulture crops are affected. So for that, we need uh, various adaptation strategies. And of course, uh, it also depends on the site, uh, site where we are talking about, because there are some places where extreme events are uh, occurring with higher frequency. So it depends on the site and then the production system and the cropping uh, patterns. So these uh, issues can be addressed with three options. One is change the crop management that uh, various agronomic uh, techniques are available 
and have been developed so that farmers are using and then the second challenge is change the cultivar so we need to source the available germplasm so as to identify the tolerant sources and go for uh, development of tolerant uh, cultivars and of course we need to work out their suitability to different uh, grow ecological regions and then the third adapt adaptation option in general is to shift to different zones or change the crop because subsequently under climate change condition a particular reason is not uh, being uh, uh, congenial for a particular crop we need to look for the areas where we can identify the suitability of a different crop so having said that uh, we have been uh, discussing about the genotyping and uh, now the traditional phenotyping efforts are not commensurate with the genotyping efforts that's what i uh, told so we need high throughput phenotyping efforts so in this direction at ihr we have established the high throughput uh, phenotyping facility and uh, uh, the we have uh, imaged the tomato plants in the high throughput phenomics facility and this can reduce the burden and it can be uh, we can uh, screen around 250 germplasm at a time so you can see here we have established the relationship between the uh, fresh weight and then the digital biomass and even the uh, projected shoot area can also be captured of different uh, genotypes so with this we can identify which genotype is performing better under abiotic stress conditions so similarly uh, subsequently the digital biomass change during the water stress conditions uh, we have seen uh, the considerable reduction in the di digital biomass in some of the sensitive genotypes the tolerant genotypes could maintain the digital biomass to a certain extent with this technique we can identify the tolerant genotypes so this is uh, one of the facilities created under nicra project at ihr this is the high uh, uh, free air temperature enhancement facility so here we have screened uh, uh, tomato hybrids uh, we could identify the high temperature tolerant uh, lines uh, at 40 degrees celsius day and uh, 26 degrees celsius night and of course we have also done studies under uh, elevated co2 condition uh, for mango and uh, different onion cultivars were also uh, evaluated for water stress conditions so this is the uh, growth chamber facility where we can enhance the temperature so that we can uh, screen the uh, desired genotypes and this is also another facility the renaud shelter uh, facility where uh, water stress studies can be conducted and this is uh, one of the studies where we have uh, uh, seen the water use efficiency by weighing these uh, pots regularly and uh, of course the cumulative water added to these plants is uh, taken in total biomass produced for the plant so that we can work out the water use efficiency in the uh, renewed shelter and this is one of the techniques the latest techniques we are using this is a, a thermal imaging technique so when plants are undergoing water stress so we can see the increase in the average canopy temperature so through this there are some genotypes which are tolerant so their canopy temperature is not increased so with that we can identify which genotype is performing better under high temperature or even under water stress conditions. And uh, this is another technique we have used in case of uh, uh, banana and also we have used in case of tomato. So this is a TIR technique. Uh, here, what we do is we take the plantlets or the seedlings and they are exposed to induction temperature basically. So because if they have got the cellular tolerance, uh, they would be uh, uh having the tolerance so they will be induced to sustain the subsequent challenging temperature of 55 degrees celsius and then we will observe the recovery 
and the induced and challenge temperature induced uh, plants will be compared with the non induced plants so that we could observe in this experiment we could observe the percent reduction in growth over the control and uh, you can see here the lot of variability with respect to tir uh, in uh, different um, uh, banana genotypes so this is uh, another technique we have developed so this is called as uh, polytunnel so the pvc seat is uh, put over the plants and uh, here we can increase the temperature up to 40 plus uh, plus or minus 2 degrees celsius so with this we could uh, see how the different genotypes we have screened around 49 tomato genotypes under uh, polytunnel and we could also take various uh, physiological parameters to see with different uh, physiological parameters and uh, what uh, uh, traits, physiological traits are helping the tomato, particular tomato genotype to have tolerance to high temperature. So we could identify two hybrids which are having higher temperature, higher temperature tolerance. And uh, in another study, as I told you that in uh, a rainout shelter, uh, we could screen uh, different uh, chili genotypes and uh, we could also take out the roots from these uh, containers by just washing the roots. And uh, you can see here the difference uh, in performance under uh, control and 50% uh, stress. And uh, this particular genotype, IHR 4501, was identified as uh, tolerant genotypes with respect to when it was subjected to 50% field capacity as compared to 100% field capacity. And this is uh, another technique what we use, that is uh, gravimetric measurement of water use efficiency in banana. So the individual pots were weighed and the whatever the water lost during the previous day from the plant was replenished. So this way, every day the plants were weighed and then the amount of water lost was added so that we can keep the record of uh, the total water added to the plant. And at the end of the experiment, we can take the total biomass of the plant and we know how much water we have added. So we can also work out the water use efficiency. So we could observe the genotypic differences and then the genotypes with B genome, they were having a higher tolerance to deficit moisture stress. And of course, this is a, a same study uh, where uh, uh, we used different uh, genotypes with uh, different genomics, genomic uh, grouping, that is AA, BB, and ABB. And uh, we also had this structure where we can uh, break open this structure at uh, around uh, seven months of the crop. And we extracted these roots by washing. And uh, we could see the genotypes again here with uh, the B genome had uh, better root characteristics than A type. So overall, uh, the phenotyping efforts have helped us to identify the germplasm lines, which are tolerant to both excess moisture and deficit moisture and then high temperature. So when I was uh, talking about the adaptation strategies, uh, one is the cultural practices. Immediate adaptation strategies are cultural practices by the farmers. And uh, these developing uh, tolerant cultivars is useful during the long run. So these are all, uh, you know, you, you are aware about uh, these uh, adaptation strategies with respect to the cultural modifications, whether it may be raised bed planting to prevent the excess uh, water stagnation in the field, or we can even modify the fertilizer application and soil amendment so that we can use increase the nutrient use efficiency and uh, increase the soil fertility. And of course, you are all uh, aware about the in-situ in moisture conservation and then mulch mulching practices to reduce the evaporative loss so that we can increase the water use efficiency. And uh, 
of course uh, we can also establish the farm ponds to harvest the available uh, runoff water to give protective irrigation wherever we are practicing dryland horticulture and of course there are uh, various micro irrigation techniques available where we can conserve moisture and with available moisture we can produce more more crop per drop so india has got tremendous potential to adopt this uh, micro irrigation so far we have got only around uh, 8 million hectares under micro irrigation so we have the potential of around 69 million hectares for this micro irrigation so we have got great potential for this uh, for adopting this technology and uh, we we know that micro sprinkler irrigation helps in not only in uh, water saving but it also helps in reducing the temperature of the microclimate and there are uh, techniques like uh, partial root zone drying. So we, uh, it's a very uh, novel irrigation techniques. So part of the root zone is dried and uh, part of the root zone is uh, provided with irrigation so that whatever the water is required, the plant is met out and a kind of uh, stress is created so that the stomata uh, are regulated. And then uh, because of that, there is increase in the water use efficiency in the plants using this technique. So in papaya, 30% water deficit through PRD did not affect uh, the vegetative growth and uh, yield components. And in case of uh, grapes also, Thompson seedless, the subsurface irrigation has uh, increased the water use efficiency. And these all techniques will help in saving substantial amount of water and also help in realizing reasonable yields and this is another uh, technique developed at uh, ihr under nikra project so we have identified a uh, uh, brinjal rootstock which helps in enhancing the excess moisture condition in the field so you can see here uh, the grafted plants they are able to tolerate the excess moisture up to 6 days and whereas the ungrafted plants wilt within 24 hours. So this has helped the uh, helped in uh, sustaining the excess moisture stress uh, under field condition in tomato because tom tomato is very sensitive to excess moisture stress condition. And we have also taken up some studies on raised bed uh, cultivation. So this has also helped in uh, increasing the uh, yield under raised bed cultivation as compared to the flat bed uh, cultivation. Of course, now most of the farmers are resorting to raised bed cultivation in uh, most of the horticulture crops. And uh, uh, Dr. Selva Kumar from uh, in the NICRA project, he has also identified uh, the plant growth promoting uh, rhizobacteria, which can help the plants to sustain excess moisture. And we have seen uh, there is around 22% increase in yield in tomato under deficit moisture stress. So we can resort to addition to crop management practices. As I told you that we need to grow the tolerant crops or varieties. So already the institutes or the universities have released various tolerant cultivars. Like we can go for Kaupi, Arka Garima. There are very many cultivars which have been released. We can resort to growing Kaupi, Dolikos, and in case of tomato, we have Arka Vikas, Arka Megali, and even PKM, which can sustain the deficit moisture stress condition. And in case of chili also, we have a, a cultivar called Arka Lohit. And in case, of, in case of P, uh, IHR has released uh, three uh, high temperature tolerant uh, cultivars, Arka Chaitra, Arka Uttam, and Arka Tapas. And, uh, in case of fruit crops where we cannot go for improvement, like because they are perennial crops and it is very difficult to breed uh, the cultivars which are tolerant to abiotic stresses, so we can directly resort to using the roots, root stocks. So you are aware about the dogridge root stock. Almost now the grape cultivation is on 95% of the 
doggeridge root stock. And there are other options like 110 R and then uh, Salt Creek. And in case of uh, mango also, we have Kurukan and 13-1. And in case of uh, banana, the, the, the the Balbiciana group uh, genotypes have got higher tolerance to deficit moisture stress. The genotypes like Saba, Mondan, Karpuruvalli, they are also uh, tolerant to even uh, salt conditions. So the choice is ours. So we need to go for selection of uh, appropriate uh, fruit species and also the uh, genotypes which are suitable for uh, these abiotic stress condition. And we have burr pomegranate, fig, amla. So the, these can be considered as candidate crops under abiotic stress conditions. And uh, under NICRA, we have also uh, uh, resorted to climate resilient technologies. We could demonstrate successfully in a village in uh, Kadur Talo that resorting to drum cedar and also raised bed cultivation helped in uh, crop establishment, not only crop establishment, but in realizing higher yield conditions under excess moisture stress conditions. So the adaptation strategies, the action plan is not just at the field level. We need to have these uh, various uh, adaptation strategies at natural resources like uh, the soil, then uh, water and then vegetation. And we also at the crop level, we need to identify the better cropping systems and then management and then the farming system. And then uh, it's not only just the availability of these technologies, we also need to see the socioeconomic uh, aspects of the farmers, whether the farmer is able to adopt these technologies and then the availability of farm labor in uh, implementing this. So all these aspects will help in adopting to climate change with integrated approach so that we can realize better productivity and higher production under climate change scenarios. So NICRA is uh, doing a lot of work. It's uh, across the different uh, institutes, seven, uh, Core institutes are involved uh, in NICRA and then uh, associated institutes are also involved. So if you want uh, any additional information on climate change, you can uh, visit this NICRA website and get additional uh, information. So ultimately we need uh, development. So we cannot just uh, go back to our uh, forefathers uh, condition of agriculture. We need to support the available the growing population. So we need to balance the development with conservation of the environment. So thank you. If you have any questions, you please ask me. Over to you, uh, Dr. Yes, Anushma. Sir, thank you, sir, for that very interesting lecture. So we could clearly understand the changing climatic conditions, especially the precipitation pattern changes. Sir, you took us through the technologies like high throughput phenotyping, free air temperature enhancement facility, rhino shelter, TIR techniques, etc. That could boost the crop movement programs for abiotic stress tolerance, especially for high temperature tolerance and moisture stress. Uh, also, you could cover the topics on crop management practices also. Sir, uh, thank you so much for joining us. We have a query here, sir. Uh, yeah, yeah, I could read that. I could read that. Yeah. So he wants to know the impact of climate change on mango flowering. Yes, sir. Yeah, so uh, mango flowering is very tricky uh, because it needs kind of water stress to begin with. And then subsequently when uh, induction has to take place. We need uh, the low temperature around uh, 16, below 16 degrees Celsius. So if these two conditions are not met, so there will be uh, sporadic flowering or even sometimes there will be delayed flowering when, as and when they achieve these uh, conditions, that time it starts flowering. Hope I have answered his uh, question.
thank you sir uh, no other queries i think yes sir once okay. again thank you profusely for joining yes sir thank you yeah thank you very much uh, with uh, lakshman sir's lecture we are uh, coming to the end of uh, today's lectures yes sir uh, dear participants tomorrow we will be joining from uh, 9:30 morning we'll be having a set of uh, interesting lectures on geospatial technologies bioinformatics in vitro and cryopreservation techniques and uh, there will be a special lecture uh, by dr v ramnath rao sir on horticultural genetic resources conservation also uh, please be tuned for tomorrow's lectures thank you everyone we are closing the session now ಅದು ಇಲ್ಲ ಸರ್ ಇಲ್ಲ ಸರ್ ಅದು ಇಲ್ಲ ಸರ್ ಅದು ಇಲ್ಲ ಸರ್